Good afternoon. Welcome to our uh, 4 p.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the March 19th, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the Council members will move to the Courtyard Conference Room for the closed session. I would like to announce um, for those of you that are here for the items uh, on the 415 agenda, we have set up overflow at the Tony Hill Room in the Civic Auditorium if that becomes necessary. At this time, I'd like to invite up any member of the public who would like to speak hey. to any of the items listed on the closed session agenda. Uh, Mayor, sorry, Go can ahead. we do a quick sure. roll call? I skipped that part, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I totally did. Council members Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Thank you. Sorry. <coughs> Um, so our closed session, session item is a, a conference with labor negotiators. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item at this time? On items in the closed session generally, I'm concerned that the last time you did this session, right before you went in, City Attorney Condotti suddenly announced that the Ross Camp was on the session, but he had not mentioned this in the previous agenda, nor was the public informed about it. Council Member Crone made the point, you can't have the public talking about issues on the closed agenda, about the closed, at the open interval, if you don't know what they are. So my question to the council, to the city administrator, to the city attorney, to all of you is, is there anything on this council this time that you have not told the public about? Because the Ross camp was an issue of great importance to people both pro and con in this audience, and we didn't know that it was gonna be discussed in the closed session until the moment before you went into the closed session. Everything on that conversation should be struck because we didn't have any opportunity to comment on it. But in any case, I'd like to know beforehand now whether there are any little mistakes that have been made as well in this session. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other members of the public who would like to speak to our closed session agenda? About SEIU negotiations, that, that's what the closed session item is. May I? May I speak? Sure, you'll be given two minutes. We need a tent village away from town it's okay. a simple way to live, it's a ahead, cheap way to live. Let me May just, I continue? No, actually, this is, you will have an opportunity to address us at uh, 4.15 when we have our item coming before us on um, the uh, next steps for uh, I pretty homelessness. Much said, I pretty much said what I want to say. It's okay. a very simple Absolutely. solution. Well, this is Why not the time to do that. Thank you. Please take your seat. Okay, is there any uh, other member of the public who would like to address the council on our conference with labor negotiations? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting to the courtyard conference room where council will go into its closed session. Mayor, Mayor can we just get a clarification from our city attorney on why it was okay to go with the Ross camp into closed session last time? Sure. It was identified as a significant exposure to litigation on the posted agenda and the Brown Act also requires um, an announcement of the topic if um, there are circumstances that are known to members of the public and to the council that um, need to be discussed in closed session. So as far as I'm concerned, the notice and the manner in which it was presented to the council, while uh, certain people might not like it, was in uh, full compliance with the Brown Act. Okay. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. We'll go ahead. We will go ahead and adjourn it this time.
All right, good afternoon, everybody. If I could get your attention, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, welcome. All right, welcome to our 415, 425, March 19th, 2019 study session and meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Before we begin tonight, I would like to also remind those that are here that we have set up the Tony Hill Room in the Civic Auditorium for Overflow. So if we are at capacity in our chambers here, please do feel free to go to the Tony Hill Room at the Civic for Overflow. I also um, want to remind uh, the community of our uh, council norms in my role as the presiding officer to one, be respectful, to engage in open and honest communication, be honest and truthful, address difficult issues, seek areas of common ground, be open to different perspectives, give the benefit of the doubt, role model good leadership, and be considerate of each other's time. <clears throat> it's my job as uh, the facilitator of this meeting to ensure everybody has an opportunity to uh, participate in our democracy in a way that is safe and respected and to maintain uh, decorum. And what I will uh, do is go over our process and uh, the expectation for the community. We will start with our staff presentations then we'll take questions from uh, the council to staff, and then we'll open it up to public comment and return back to council for action and deliberation. So I ask that as we begin tonight's proceeding that uh, we maintain a respectful uh, behavior. If I observe uh, any type of speaking out in a way that doesn't exhibit that uh, expectation, I will give you a warning. And if it continues, I will ask that you leave. Um, and so at this time, we will move forward to our first item of general business, and that is the SEIU Local 521 MOU, and we have Lisa Murphy here. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. Lisa Murphy, your Human Resources Director. I'm very pleased to present to you for your approval the resolution adopting the tentative agreement with the SEIU Employees Local 521. Attached to your revised staff report that you should have at your dais is a summary of the tentative agreement, which in summary is a three-year agreement with COLA increase in the first year of 4%, a COLA increase in the second year of 3%, and a COLA increase in the third year of 3%, in addition to several other, other uh, economic items such as short-term disability, as well as multiple non-economic items. Any questions? I'm open to. Are there any questions from the staff at this time? I mean, from the council to the staff at this time. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Oh, do we have a question? Go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna make a motion. Oh, okay. Well, we're gonna go ahead and open it up to public comment. Is there any member of the community who would like to address us on this item? This is the SEIU uh, a ten a tentative agreement. Is there any member of the public who would like to address us at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll return back to the council for action. Councilmember Glover. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make, make a motion adopting the resolution of a tentative agreement with the Service Employees International Union or SEIU Local 521. Second. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Glover, second by Councilmember Crone. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay. So the next item is our response to homelessness update and direction. Good afternoon, uh, Susie and Tina, and please. Thank you, Mayor Watkins, good afternoon, and council members and members of the community joining us this afternoon. Here we are one week later, uh, back talking about this issue again. Um, so similar to prior meetings, we have uh, several agenda items to go through, and we also have several speakers. So presenting to you today, in addition to myself, will be Susie O'Hara, the assistant to the city manager. We'll have the city attorney, Tony Condotti, provide a legal overview. And we also have economic development director, Bonnie Lipscomb, helping with some of the, the siting locations. 
Uh, thank you very much. Also, Fire Chief Jason Hyduk will assist with a discussion of an update on where the gateway encampment currently is. So you can see from the agenda, we'll first review your last direction from the meeting a week ago, provide an update on where things stand with the gateway encampment, walk through the legal implications of the Martin versus Boise case. And we, we've known that there's been a lot of um, questions or not full clarity around what this decision means for us as well as jurisdictions across California and everywhere um, within the Ninth Circuit's um, jurisdiction. So we'll walk through that. And then the meat of the conversation will be item number four, and that's walking through the actionable items being presented to you this evening. I'm wrapping up with um, summary staff recommendations and requests for council direction. Okay, so first, just to recap the council's action at your last meeting a week ago, um, you have copies there and I, everyone can see it up on the screen. Um, we, so one in A, that is occurring, that is still on track again with the Salvation Army as the operator. On B, that is what will be the large substance of this, e this afternoon's discussion is, dis is talking about the small scale, no more than 50 bed um, pilot program to open by the deadline of April 17th. Item C and D are subsets of that transition away from the gateway encampment. Um, number two on here actually will be covered this evening, even though there is a, a date of April 9th. Um, items three, four, five, and six are happening and won't be discussed. So really the majority of the discussion is around one B. All right, Susie. All right. So, um, oh wow, that's strong, sorry. Um, so Fire Chief Hyduke and I will be providing a brief update on conditions at the Gateway Encampment. Um, for the last two meetings, I've talked in great detail about the level of outreach and engagement as well as camp conditions. I'm not gonna talk about that tonight or today. Um, what I just wanted to provide a brief update on from the staff's perspective from the city manager's office is we really have made strides in developing um, great coordination with the camp council. Um, this week, for instance, uh, we will be working with them on a significant debris removal that they are spearheading through um, coordination with the city. We will be bringing in tomorrow um, a number of um, <laughs> refuse containers and really working to facilitate the work that they wanna do around this. So last week, Megan and I met with the camp council. There was probably about 25, maybe 20 to 25 people there as well last Friday. <laughs> On, um, and that was uh, Fire Chief Hyduke as well. I'm really trying to engage with the council and set up a few different subcommittees that were focused on safety and really surveying the camp residents so we can have a better understanding of who's there and their needs. On those two fronts, uh, the folks that we met with last week have been in instrumental in really helping um, the city um, dialogue more effectively and understand their needs. So as I mentioned, tomorrow we're gonna to be helping with um, moving refuse out of the camp. The um, area that was noted last week, the kind of the triangular area at the top of the encampment adjacent to the levee has already been vacated. Those folks have moved into the greater footprint of the camp. So um, I fully expect um, a, a fair amount of coordination moving forward and quite pleased with that. So for those that are here, I just want to express my gratitude to the camp council and those that are liaison uh, in with the city on this. So in addition to the debris removal, we're also working on uh, disseminating a resident survey with assistance from the camp council. Last week we gave them a draft. We're gonna be meeting this week on really fine tuning that from the perspective of gathering enough information but not being too intrusive. And so I um, also want to express my appreciation for those that are here that are helping with us. And I will turn it over to the fire chief. <coughs> Mayor, council, uh, thank you, Susie. So we met last week, I think it was a very productive meeting. Um, and what we presented was not just what we wanted to do, but more importantly, the why behind it. Uh, the why behind the fire codes that are based on actual incidents that have occurred within our city, within our state, within our nation, within the world. It's our adopted fire code. And so we took the time not just to tell people do this, but really why and what the impact would be for them individually as well as collectively within the camp. 
And our goals are not to uh, impose a set of standards that are unreasonable or specific to this camp, but are uh, the expectation and the standards that we put on uh, anyone, regardless of um, what, uh, where you are in the city. And so for the fire safety standards, we're really looking at the ability to have clear access lanes, uh, no different than an exit pathway in a theater. Uh, so um, pe people have the ability not to try and navigate, um, uh, you know, a maze. Um, we also uh, were looking at having separation between the tents. Uh, we believe that the footprint within that camp will allow for um, some minimum safety standards to be imposed. And then we also discussed uh, the incident that we had uh, with the fire inside of the tent and the hazards of cooking inside uh, and not to have any open flame devices in there as well as uh, compressed gases. There's a number of propane bottles that are being used for uh, different uh, reasons. And within an enclosed space, not only is it a fire hazard, but it's also an asphyxiant. And so this is for their safety as well as, as the total camp. And we had really good feedback, I believe, from that. Um, we posted those signs up around there. I was down there this afternoon and they've already kind of started rearranging uh, some of the structures that are down there, removing some of the debris. And like Susie said, we'll be bringing in some um, containers to uh, complete that. And this is something that they're doing voluntarily after we had that meeting. So I'm pleased to say that we're making some progress. Um, and this is no different than the approach we would take with any business. Uh, we're not looking to close people down. We're looking to get education and compliance. Um, and so we're following the same tact that we would do with uh, any business uh, in the city or any resident within the city. Um, so I'm optimistic that by, by this weekend, um, things will be much better than they were last week. Uh, Web EOC um, is, I talked about it last week, it's that portal or that device uh, that we can put all of our information in one place. Um, we're still uh, working on getting it up and running and being perfect, but um, it's much better than it was last week. We're getting information from the county side, we're inputting information from the city side, so we can track what progress we've done. We can also see what accomplishments have occurred. Uh, vector control, uh, we had a number um, after Dr. Left and the county uh, vector control came out and they were concerned about the rodent population and the uh, transmission of disease within that population and also outside of that community. Uh, we uh, got bids from a number of different uh, companies that were willing to come in and we are in the process of uh, getting that PO uh, done through the city so that we can start that. So we will have um, active trapping of uh, rodents down there. A number of those will be uh, retained and given to the county so that they can test them for any diseases to make sure that um, if we don't have a problem, we can confirm that. If we do have a disease that's identified, we can work on that. So I would expect that that work would be uh, in place by this next coming weekend uh, for that. Are there any questions? Any questions from the council? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Hyduke. So then the next segment of the agenda we'll move on to is a presentation from the city attorney, Tony Condotti, talking through some of the legal constraints and legal <coughs> issues that have presented themselves anew with this encampment. Yes, um, thank you, Tina, and Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, we're going to talk about the Martin versus Boise case that's been bantered about um, a lot in the past several months since it was issued um, back in September of 2018. Um, when that case was issued, the police department uh, immediately ceased enforcing uh, our um, city camping ban ordinance, which is codified at Chapter 6.36 of the Municipal Code. Um, Martin versus Boise is a decision issued by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that involved a lawsuit <clears throat> that was brought by homeless individuals um, that sought a court declaration that Boise's ordinance uh, prohibiting camping on public property was unconstitutional and also seeking an injunction or court order that prohibited the city from enforcing its ordinance going into the future. Um, it's worth noting that the ordinance act in question in the Boise case was very similar, strikingly similar to the ordinance that's been on the books in the city of Santa Cruz since the mid 1960s. And so that's why it has an impact on the city um, both because uh, the city of Santa Cruz and California is located within the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is directly be below the United States Supreme Court encompasses several Western states, including Idaho. And so that's why the Boise case is applicable here. Um, in the Martin case, the Ninth Circuit relied heavily on a 
United States Supreme Court case from 1962 that struck down a California statute that classified narcotics addiction as a, uh, as a criminal offense. And that case, uh, which is entitled Robinson versus California, stands for the notion that the Eighth Amendment prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment that's in our Constitution prohibits the state from punishing an involuntary act or condition or condition if it is the unavoidable consequence of one's status or being. Um, in Martin, the Ninth Circuit applied that principle and find uh, and stated this principle compels the conclusion that the Eighth Amendment prohibits the imposition of criminal penalties for sitting, sleeping, or lying outside on public property for homeless individuals who cannot obtain shelter. Essentially, the court is indicating that we can't criminalize a person's conduct if, if that conduct is inherently uh, the product of their status, in this case, a homeless individuals sleeping on streets is the product of their homelessness. Um, <clears throat> so the Martin case makes this sweeping pronouncement, but then immediately offers some narrowing language that makes its application um, seem not so sweeping. Um, so it's, it's part of the frustrations of this profession is, is that courts issue decisions and then it's our job to try to interpret what they mean when applied to different sets of facts and different circumstances. Um, so the narrowing constructions were, the court says, we in, no way, we in no way dictate that the city must, uh, to the city that it must provide sufficient shelter for the homeless or allow anyone who wishes to sit, lie, or sleep on the streets any time at any time and at any, any place. The court goes on, our holding does not cover individuals who have access to adequate temporary shelter, whether because they have the means to pay for it or because it is realistically available to them for free, but who choose not to use it. Nor do we suggest that a jurisdiction with insufficient shelter can never criminalize the act of sleeping outside. Even where shelter is unavailable, an ordinance prohibiting sitting, lying, or sleeping outside at particular times or in particular locations might well be constitutionally permissible. So too might an ordinance barring the obstruction of public rights of way or the erection of certain structures. Uh, and whether uh, some other ordinance is consistent with the Eighth Amendment will depend on whether it punishes a person for lacking the means to live out the universal and unavoidable consequences of being human in the way the ordinance prescribes. So this doesn't mean we're obligated to allow homeless people to sleep on our streets or on public property uh, whenever or wherever they so choose. But unfortunately, Martin doesn't provide that much meaningful guidance on how or to what extent we can regulate these activities. So it's left, uh, we're left with the task of doing that. Um, and, that and that, like I said, is how our legal system works. A higher, a higher court issues a decision anticipating that lower courts will interpret it to different sets of facts and circumstances and that the law will be developed around the basic principles that are enunciated in the case. And um, the Martin case was only uh, decided in September of 18, so there's not a lot of case law interpreting it so far, but there is some guidance. And one case is a United States District Court case called Miral versus City of Oakland. In that case, um, the plaintiffs were homeless individuals who uh, established an encampment on city-owned property that they, that they entitled the Housing and Dignity Village. Um, they set up a camp and um, it was on vacant Oakland property in violation of Oakland's um, ordinances and regulations, uh, just in the same fashion that the Ross camp is. Um, the city decided that it wanted to shut the camp down and so it posted notices to vacate uh, the illegal campground indicating that the site would be cleared and closed. Um, this happened in October, late October of 2018 and the city's notice indicated that it would close the site on uh, November 10th of 2018. On November 9th, plaintiffs who were residents or occupants of the encampment filed a lawsuit in the United States District Court basically saying that the city's contemplated action was in violation of their Eighth Amendment rights as interpreted by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in Martin. And they sought um, a temporary restraining order and an, and an injunction 
to uh, prohibit the city from moving forward with the closure. Actually, the court granted the temporary restraining order that sort of preserved the status quo, clo the status quo for a few weeks and then I think on the 26th of November, the case was heard on their motion for preliminary injunction. Um, the claims that were made in the, in the morale case by the plaintiffs were that the city's attempt to remove them from the Housing and Dignity Village's location on public land was a violation of their Eighth Amendment rights uh, based on Martin, and also that the closure and the removal of their property would violate um, their due process rights under the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which is the, the due process clause. Um, interpreting, so in, in countering the plaintiff's claims, the city represented that any encampment closure uh, would be conducted in accordance with a set of standard operating procedures that the city had prepared and adopted for purposes of dealing with these types of situations, which along with providing certain notice requirements included also offering the occupants uh, shelter beds and resources um, both prior to and during the closure and an offer of assistance with moving their personal belongings before the, the closure or while the closure was happening. The court found that the plaintiffs were not faced with punishment for acts inherent to their unhoused status that they could not control, nor were they unable to obtain shelter outside of this encampment uh, based on the city's commitment in its papers and at the hearing to um, provide them with temporary uh, shelter assistance during the, uh, prior to and during the closure. Uh, and and um, basically the court said Martin doesn't establish a constitutional right to occupy public, public property indefinitely at plaintiff's option. So if you go back and look at the Martin case, it focused specifically on the available of temporary alternative shelter locations. Um, it doesn't stand for the proposition that um, the city's obligated to provide some permanent housing solution in order to close an illegally established encampment like the Ross camp. Um, the court found that the plaintiffs were not faced with punishment for acts inherent <coughs> to their unhoused status. I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. Um, and accordingly, the court found that the plaintiffs did not show a likelihood of success or raise serious questions as to the merits of their Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishment claim, which is the standard for injunctive relief. The court also rejected the 14th Amendment due process claim. Um, although a homeless individual's unab unabandoned possessions or property within the meaning of the 14th Amendment, um, and that means that the city has to comport with due process requirements when it takes action to either take that property or to remove it from their possession. Uh, that means that it has to provide notice uh, and give the property owners a chance to try to argue against the taking. So um, encountering the due process claim, the city uh, presented evidence to the court that the enclosure would be conducted in accordance with its SOP, which required posting a 72 hour notice of closure at multiple visible locations on the site um, storage of any property left at the site after closure, other than property that's deemed unsafe or hazardous, such as food, um, soil clothing, biohazard materials, that sort of thing. Um, posting a notice of collected property at the encampment, giving information to the occupants as to where the property is being held so that they could come and claim it at a later time, and an offer of assistance with moving belongings after the closure. Um, the court found that the city's SOP on its face provided adequate notice and opportunity for the plaintiffs to be heard before the property was seized. Um, so turning back to the prior discussion about the Ross camp, the morale case provides the city with a roadmap for effecting uh, a closure of that encampment in a manner that doesn't run afoul of the constitutional principles established in the Martin versus um, Boise case. So just very quickly, the, the legal requirements that the legal requirements that um, are being developed as the city's standard operating procedure 
uh, include notifying persons residing in the encampment that it's been declared uninhabitable and will be, um, that will be closed, including posting notice to vacate signage prominently at the encampment, offering shelter beds or alternative shelter locations and resources to individuals at the encampment prior to and during the closure, as well as an offer of assistance with moving and storage of personal belongings the extent possible documenting the identities of the occupants and documenting that notice has been provided in accordance with the SOP, allowing the occupants to receive, retrieve their personal belongings before vacating the site, uh, documenting the conditions, including photographs before cleanup, uh, disposing of belongings that are clearly trash or unsafe for long-term storage, collecting, bagging, and labeling personal property so that it can be reclaimed at a later date, Itemizing belongings collecting, collected include the location, date, and time of collection on an itemization form, posting notice at the site where, um, with including contact information for retrieval of the property, and then storage of the property for at least a 90-day period to enable um, people to claim their personal property. And lastly, uh, a cleanup of the site once it's been um, vacated to remove trash and debris and hazardous materials or bio biohazards. There's one final point that I'd like to add is that um, complying with these uh, constitutional standards is something that we're obligated to do under the law at the risk of exposing both city officials and city law enforcement officers to substantial uh, personal financial liability. So it's not a, it's not just a feel good thing that we're trying to do to make, to say that we're able to respect people's constitutional rights, but we're following a, um, a legally mandated um, procedure here. And I'm happy to answer any questions or respond to comments. We'll go ahead and pause to see if there's any questions from the council. Councilmember Kern. So it, it seems like there's a you know, catch 22 here, a rock and hard place. Um, how many, how much space do we have to provide do we do it, is there any, like, excuse me, any census count and then figure out, you know, if we don't provide, if there's 100 and whatever, 50 people, do we have to have beds identified or just places for people to go? That's one of those questions that I can't really answer definitively based on the, the facts that were presented in the Martin case and the way it was applied. We do know that certain individuals are not going to accept offers of shelter based on some very minimal standards that would would um, likely be established uh, for admission, including not using illegal narcotics on site and that sort of thing. Um, we're not obligated to provide a completely condition-free environment for people who don't want to adhere to basic um, rules for um, of behavior for, for a shelter. Um, but we do have to be able to document the number of people that were there and that shelter space was available for those who choose to avail themselves of it. Would it be safe to say that if so 80 people said, yes, I want to abide by the rules and, and get a shelter bed and we only had 70, what, what would we? What w uh, we'll, our plan is to locate sufficient alternative locations for, for the individuals that are out there. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Myers, then Councilmember Brown, and then Vice Mayor coming. To the extent that they choose to avail themselves of what is offered. Um, I was just curious about um, the temporary nature, sort of, is that temporary? Um, is, is there any guidance or any, any decisions on, on what temporary? For purposes of mm -hmm. abating closing an encampment, what we have to be able to demonstrate is that there is a reasonable alternative temporary location available on that occasion. We don't have to be able to demonstrate that it's a, that it's a shelter that will be available for any particular duration, but I would imagine, you know, 30 days, 45 days, something like that, at least to enable um, both the city to continue to work to identify alternative locations and to place people into available shelter services that we have um, and to enable the individuals to uh, seek alternative shelter options for them as well. 
Mr. Brown. Just to <coughs> clarify the <coughs> that the basis of the, um, the the plaintiff's claims being rejected was this was the basis was standard a, a review of standard operating procedure and as we know procedures and policies get, don't get followed sometimes so I'm just wondering um, and I understand your your research was related to the case law itself but in if staff and any of your looking into this has there been any um, is there any indication that I guess what I'm saying is that s simply having the procedure doesn't mean that it's followed, and I'm just wondering if there if there's any discussion around that, if anything in the in the um, proceedings of the case so discuss that, anything we should know, um, because that's a concern of mine. I do think it's instructive to just consider the procedural um, manner in which the case was brought forward, uh, in which. Uh, a lawsuit was filed before the city implemented the procedure that it had adopted, and the court based its decision on the city, the city's representation in the court papers that it filed, and in the and in the uh, argument that was printed, presented in the court hearings, uh, expressing the city's commitment to adhere to the to the procedures that it had uh, adopted and promulgated. So, um, I fully anticipate that. Um, any procedures that we establish for um, moving forward with the closure will need to be followed in order to protect the city from potential liability. Just a quick follow-up. So you're not aware of any follow-up complaints about procedure not being followed following this? In the Oakland case you're talking about? I'm not, but I'm also aware that the plaintiffs in that case had argued that the city had closed several campsites in, on prior occasions and said that the city had not adhered to those policies on those prior occasions. And the, the city's response, as I understand it, from just communicating with the attorneys who represented the city in that case was that um, the city had been developing and was in the process of implementing a new standard operating procedure that was the, the procedure that was applied in this case. And so the city said, you know, we're not saying we did everything perfectly in the past. These are the procedures that we f we're following now. Thank you. Um, so just for clarification purposes, um, what would the consequences be if, for example, we were to close the camp with no alternatives tomorrow or insufficient alternatives? <clears throat> so, I mean, as as Chief Mills will, will also tell you, um, the police department works under um, a set of adopted policies and procedures that are designed to ensure that its law enforcement activities are, are undertaken in a manner that's uh, consistent with established law. And the reason, one of the reasons why they do it in, a, in addition to the fact that you know, it's good public policy, but another reason they do it is that so long as they're following in good faith um, clearly established laws, or at least they're not um, uh, fail, failing to adhere to laws that are, that, are, that are clearly established that they can't do. I, I didn't say that very articulately. Um, if there's a law that's not clearly established, but they're uh, acting in good faith based on the belief that what they're doing is consistent with a person's civil rights, then they're entitled to um, qualified immunity to a certain level of protection from the courts if someone is injured or if there's damage to property or something of that nature that arises from law enforcement activities. So long as the police department's acting in good faith, they're entitled to a, a level of immunity from um, civil liability for that. If the law is clearly established and we don't follow it, not only does the city have liability exposure, we could face significant damages, but the individual officers who are out there trying to implement it um, face individual exposure to liability for their own personal assets. And so, you know, not adhering to a decision like Martin once, it's, once it comes out is not an option for us. Question? My other question, um, in the absence of having, an, for, so for right now, for example, um, the Ross Camp is kind of our alternative for not having camps established 
throughout different neighborhoods within Santa Cruz. If, is, is that? Sort of a de facto encampment in the city that likely would not be here, but for the legal landscape that we're now operating in today. So if that alternative wasn't available, what would, what would our enforcement measures be around people establishing in other parts of the city? So as I, as I mentioned as part of the presentation, the, the law does not require us to make shelter space available for the homeless. It simply doesn't require it. But if we want to enforce regulations that restrict areas where people can set up shop on public property and camp, um, we can't tell a person who's homeless that there's no place in the city where they can sleep legally. So that, so it doesn't uh, impose any mandate on the city to provide shelter space. It just restricts the law enforcement tools at our disposal um, against people who have no alternative but sleeping outdoors because of their homeless status. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just this kind of question for you, Tony, and then also for the fire chief. Is he still in here? Ah, um, with the new easements and clear paths and structures set up for fire safety that you were just mentioning in the camp, fire chief, um, how many tents does that suffice, or how, you know, how, how much space does that provide for tents at the Ross camp with the structures that you're uh, getting them to make it if it were to be organized and I don't have a really good answer for that just because of the setup of it. Uh, that space was not engineered for what it's being currently used at and there's some issues besides fire separation. Um, I could go back and look at that, the square footage and tell you that th this is what we would do. The problem with the fire code is it's really designed for uh, tents over 400 square feet. Mm. Um, it talks about the ability to uh, impose standards that you think are reasonable for uh, a tent um, that's underneath that because they're, they're made for transient occupation. They're not designed to be lived in, you know, for a month at a time or uh, further uh, just because of um, their design and what they're made out of. So I could go back and give you a better answer about what kind of uh, clear separation we would want um, and how many people or how many tents we could fit in there um, with the idea that those tents were all the same size right. um, and the same shape, that would be a much easier proposition. Um, what, what we've asked the camp that's currently there to do is uh, a bare minimum. Right. Um, it, it's, it's there to make things better than what we have currently, but it is not what I would lay out if we were starting from scratch. And based on your estimations, how many people are would, how many additional spaces, just to reiterate, would we need to open up in order to effectively remove all people that inhabit the camp currently? Well, we're hoping that the survey, uh, we can get a, uh, a definite number for that. The problem with uh, our existing structure that we have is that there's a nighttime population and a daytime population. They are not static from day to day. So uh, we've done some surveys in the morning uh, on different times and at those times, at that particular point in time, 60 to 70 percent of the tents were occupied. Um, I don't know if that has changed because we have not uh, gone out in the last week to look at that. Um, so that's just a number and you know it's like the point in time uh, count. It's right. a number that you get for that particular moment. I don't think that all the tents are inhabited all the time. Okay. Thank you. And then um, for City Attorney Kandati, uh, what is the legal ramifications of say we set a day that we're going to close the camp and we start to transition people out. What if new people transition into the camp uh, during that transition time? Would that reset the number to the amount of people that are currently physically in the camp before it is able to be removed or? Well, I, I think that part of our operational plan would be to ensure that new encampments aren't just set up as we're so I, I don't think we will allow people to just come in and start setting up camp while we are in the process of vacating others. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to have to, um, to, to monitor that and enforce that as we, as we um, implement the plan. So, but even with, say we, just say we open up enough shelter beds to close the Ross camp and transition everyone in, that still will leave us unable to enforce said uh, ordinances or regulations in other parts of the city because we have maxed out our shelter bed options and are back to square one. Um, that's that's a good point. Um, the the uh, dealing with the 
the situation that we have out at the Ross Camp does not change the legal landscape that we're in in terms of our ability to force enforce our camping ordinance um, against people who are who are homeless. So would you? It will enable us to address that nuisance situation that we have out there right now, um, but it doesn't provide us with a long-term viable strategy for um, restricting camping in different parts of the city on public property. Just one more, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so in your opinion, in order for us to be able to effectively enforce laws that govern sleeping and camping in public spaces, we would need to make a drastic increase in our shelter bed and temporary uh, bed availability in the city. That, that's one way of looking at it, but I think based on the narrowing construction that the court applied in, in the Ninth Circuit case, um, another way to look at it is if we are going to enforce um, an ordinance that prohibits camping on public property in a given instance, we have to be able to demonstrate in that instance that the person who is cited or who the enforcement action is brought against had an alternative. Thank you. Um, okay. uh, Mayor, may I add just one thing to that? <clears throat> so, um, so at the point in time that we're ready with new sheltering programs coming online at 1220 and um, with the program that we'll be discussing today, it's not just those two programs for which we will be looking at capacity, it's also the other programs that we have in the community. So at that time, um, we would be looking to the loft, we'd be looking to the VFW, we'd be looking to the Laurel Street program as well. So um, it's a little bit more complicated than what's online um, at the time of closure. And I'll just remind the community that we'll have an opportunity to hear from you, so please, if if possible, keep your comments to yourself, and when you have the opportunity to come speak to us, we'll allow for uh, you to be heard at that time. Okay, I know we have more presentation. Council Member Myers, you have a question? At any given point in time, do we have knowledge of who will be in a bed or not in a bed or in a shelter or not in a shelter, and when those decisions are made uh, so that we can track um, to some extent the availability at any given time during a during a process of yeah so one thing that we've talked about over the last couple meetings is the development that the web EOC model is open and one of the um, major new characteristics of that model is we will actually have a point in time census of available shelter beds day by day that we will be able to provide to um, folks that are doing outreach either at the gateway encampment or out in the community um, and those will be real time um, filled based on whoever is engaging and whoever might have an interest in moving into shelter. So that is a new um, kind of outcome of this process in coordination with the city and the county um, as it relates to, um, maybe I'm interpreting this wrong, but as it relates to um, figuring out exactly who's at the encampment at the time that we intend to move forward with a closure, that information will also be um, part of the web EOC in terms of documentation, so we'll be able to refer to that ongoing. And that will be for beds throughout Santa Cruz County. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Please continue. Okay, where are we? Okay, so this is me. Um, and I'll try to move forward uh, through this pretty quickly because uh, we've talked about this ad nauseum, but I did want to um, mention that as we have been going through this process and meeting week by week <coughs> with council on um, these two different programs, I want to talk about um, this process of information gathering and discovering discovery that has led staff to make a recommendation for this evening. So I wanted to give you just a brief overview of the distinction between a transitional encampment and a safe sleeping and storage program. So as you'll notice highlighted in green, um, those are really the key distinctions, who they are operated by, whether it's self-governed or fully operated by a nonprofit. So transitional encampments, there is an element of self-governance and um, really I think in, in effective community building on behalf of the residents of the encampments, that is an important piece of the picture that I think is important um, as we consider transitional encampments through the project charter. That's one of the critical pieces as to what I've understood to the success of those programs. Transitional encampments are open 24 seven, so folks have an uh, opportunity to be there during the day as well. When you think about that within the, um, the context of a safe sleeping and storage program, which 
um, you directed at the, our last meeting to really consider either of those from the perspective of the pilot. Um, the Safe Sleeping and Storage Program, generally speaking, is operated by either a nonprofit or a, a city government or county government jurisdiction. It's really a dust to dawn program in that uh, open at 9 p.m., closed at 6 a.m. For, for the point, um, the distinction between the two programs is really that. And then also, how does the program look and feel during the time that it's open? A transitional encampment that you might find um, on a public space or at a church or on private property throughout the community, that is something that is there 24 seven. There are structures, there are people coming in and out, um, whereas, a safe sleeping and storage program is only open at night. Um, in large part, structures are um, in individual structures are removed during the day. So what you would basically see during the day is um, space where there might be a storage container, there might be an office container, refuse collection, hygiene, porta potties, etc. But in large part. Um, apart from maybe operators that are coming in to clean and maintain the facility, um, you do not see folks that are um, using the shelter as clients there during the day. So that's the big distinction. Otherwise, as we're considering um, safe sleeping and storage sites and transitional encampments, generally speaking, the rules are very similar in terms of rules of conduct that people are expected to maintain. Um, one of the big distinctions, I think, between safe sleeping and transitional encampments Safe sleeping really does offer a very flexible day-by-day -day approach for whoever has, is interested in accessing it, are able to use it. So in having like thoughts about what optimal flexible model can we consider as we consider the needs out at the gateway encampment, it really has, um, I've had some crystallization around thoughts between these two programs that I kind of wanted to walk through. But it, it, as you'll see in the slide, Generally speaking, the programs are very similar in terms of storage off, uh, offered on site, infrastructure provided by the government agency that's part of the program, one point of entry and exit, and that usually is a manned gate um, that is um, being very um, well managed. And then in terms of barriers to entry, uh, you know, expectations around rules of conduct are pretty paramount, um, but we can get into the nuances about what that means in terms of some of the barriers that we've been talking about with regard to substance use disorder, et cetera. So with that in mind, I'm gonna set the table for Bonnie, who's gonna come up after me to talk about site selection. So between the last meeting and this meeting, we really have put some deep thought into, um, given the urgency of um, trying to close the gateway encampment within the context of Martin versus Boise and in partnership with the county through the giant action plan, what is the appropriate model given the site constraints that we have right now? And then also just giving this, given the sense that we're trying to move quickly to improve conditions for our, in our greater community, but also our residents of the gateway encampment. Mm -hmm. So with that, that in mind, I wanna talk a little bit about what was noted in the agenda report. We did have a meeting with uh, nonprofit operators in our faith-based community today at 12. <laughs> so just a few hours ago. About 25 people came, and it was really um, just opening dialogue with the city and um, partners about uh, the level of interest and capacity to not only cite this type of program, but operate, and questions about how to make them the most successful that we possibly can. Um, we had uh, a diverse cross-section of community members that came to the meeting, faith-based, nonprofit, um, advocates advocates, and activists in the homelessness community. Um, and f in large part, I think there is very strong interest in supporting the city and the county through this process, but also a very strong interest in um, developing um, a clear set of engagement and dialogue and really trying to help um, our community come together to um, look at options. So nobody raised their hand necessarily to cite a program outside of a city parcel. So um, I really did wanna have an opportunity to see if there was anybody who wanted to jump on board. That did not happen. Um, in terms of operator capacity, um, 
I think it's going to be challenging to find an operator who can stand up a program this quickly, and we can talk a little bit more about that as well. I want to mention that I think there's been some concern that the Pacific Northwest programs are not successful within the context of how they are affecting homelessness in general. Um, we, we talked about um, we talked about this two meetings ago, but I think we, given the pace of this, um, I think it's important to say it again. These, the intention of these programs is to create um, alternative and innovative sheltering models that fit into the continuum of care, not solve homelessness. I don't think the Pacific Northwest West communities, Seattle, Portland, Eugene, that we are talking about, are experiencing um, a relief around homelessness because they have these encampments open. They are simply a different model that meets the needs of a different cross-section of folks in the community. So I just wanted to be really clear that by virtue of comparing these programs to the Seattle program, for instance, we're not suggesting from staff's perspective that this is a silver bullet in solving homelessness. It is not. So um, the safe sleeping and um, safe sleeping program does offer, and I alluded to this a second ago, more flexibility in meeting a diverse cross-section of needs. Um, it also creates day-to-day -day opportunities for access, so somebody who might come on Tuesday cannot come on Wednesday, but then they can come back on Thursday. So that's something to think about as we think about comparing the two models. We can bring a safe sleeping and storage program on very quickly, um, and I can talk about how that might work. And also, as I mentioned with this morning's meeting, um, I do believe that our community needs a little bit of extra time in considering transitional encampments. I've done a lot of work in thinking about how they might fit into the community. We have engaged very deliberately with um, the Gateway Encampment residents mm -hmm. as to how a transitional encampment might meet their needs. I do think um, we need to engage with a greater cross-section of our community on this um, and really help um, with a process of creating dialogue about what this means in terms of impacts, not only to the clients and residents of the encampment, but also to the greater community and neighborhoods. So with that in mind, setting the table for the site selection, we are as staff recommending for the council to consider a safe sleeping and storage program at this time and not a transitional encampment, but really taking a deliberate pause and thinking about how can we best create success through the project charter process and bring um, our community together in dialogue. And this is across the entire stakeholder demographic that I talked about at the last meeting, from those with lived experience you know, to um, those business, you know, neighbors who might also be, and neighbors that might be affected by a program that we move forward with. Yeah, okay. I think I queued you up already, yeah. but a couple times. So um, with that all in mind, uh, Bonnie is gonna, uh, Lipscomb, our economic development director is gonna be walking through our site selection process. Great. Thanks, Susie, and um, good afternoon or evening, um, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, I'm going to recap a few of the, just the process that we went through in identifying the initial pass of, of looking at sites. And previously when we came before you, we were looking at it from the perspective, as Susie mentioned, of, of the possibility of potential transitional encampment sites and or safe sleeping programs. So um, as we go forward today, um, this will be focusing on uh, safe sleeping sites. Um, so just to recap um, the process that we went through, and, and first I just want to acknowledge um, just the tremendous amount of staff across the city um, that has been engaged in vetting sites, coming up with the parameters, um, looking um, closely at each site for suitability across infrastructure, making sure utilities, water, all of these things. It has been um, a real city lift. Um, so there are no fewer than eight apartments, including the city manager's office that's been involved, including public works, uh, water, uh, fire department, police, uh, parks and rec, and um, who am I leaving out, IT as well well and planning. So it has really been an all hands on deck. And I also need to acknowledge um, uh, David McCormick, who's our asset property manager, who's really done a tremendous amount of work um, going deep on each of the sites and making sure that it met the parameters um, that we've discussed as a whole city team. 
Um, so th within, and we really also focused within the city, um, Santa Cruz city limits, there are over 500 uh, parcels, um, including some sites that the city owns outside of the city, but we really felt like because of, uh, we control the land use within the city and also from accessibility. And as we're looking at safe sleeping sites, we thought pedestrian access was important. We really narrowed it down um, to, uh, you know, the initial look of, of 215 parcels within the city limits that are 5,000 square feet or larger. Thanks. And then we further evaluated these sites from the last week when we came before you, um, specifically for suitability for safe sleeping and storage sites. So the coming around 9 p.m. in the evening or so and staying um, until the morning. And then during the day, we looked at compatibility of uses, making sure that you know some minimal storage um, and sanitation facilities could stay on site, but the site would largely return to whatever its use is normally during the day. So in the process of looking at uh, the 215 parcels, you know, we had identified a number of sites, and this is a recap of, of last week. I think the one that we've added, there were 16 critical water facilities that we discussed in more detail last week that just aren't suitable for any, any, any type of occupation. Um, additionally, uh, DeMeo Lane was another site due to its remote access that just wasn't ideal for the, the type of use that, we're, that we are talking about. So from that, we narrowed it down to six sites. And um, primarily, we narrowed it down to those six sites within the core area. And we uh, discussed this briefly uh, last week, but specifically, we were looking at accessibility, proximity to transit, uh, both the metro bus stations and a, another map will show you the transit routes, um, utilities to the site, um, being able to have refuse service for pickup, um, overall security, safety, um, public services, uh, police access, uh, nearby social services, also within the core area, being the primary urban area, um, it's more limited habitat impacts than some of our out uh, outlying parks area that we are initially um, looking at. And then th the individuals um, remain part of the community and being part of the city core. And so the six sites we identified, um, the first um, site, uh, and I'll go through these in a little more uh, detail, but basically we took these six sites that we presented last week and we did, went back and did additional analysis. And we looked further um, after the first pass at the actual infrastructure we get, get to the site. So we looked really closely at that. We looked at access and proximity to the central core. We used, um, looked at usable space and just suitability overall for the intended use. And again, this time the lens was looking more specifically with a specific intention as a safe sleeping and storage site. Um, and then clear site control. We had two sites um, that we needed to go a little deeper on whether or not they were completely within our control. We had some use agreements. Um, we also had some, some title issues that we needed to clear up on one of the sites. And, and um, we'll go through that in a little more detail. So of those six sites, we, we through the further analysis, narrowed it down to three. And so I'll briefly just explain why we eliminated these three sites. Um, so the first site, the former reservoir site owned by the water department, it's not a good site uh, for safe sleeping. It's too remote for pedestrian access. As you can see, it's quite a bit of ways from uh, most of the social services in town um, and um, just from pedestrian access, it's pretty far to walk. Um, it's also, uh, it's an unimproved site and the drainage is fairly poor there and there's some adjacent conflicts. So that site was removed. Uh, the additional site we removed was lot three, I'm sorry, is site number three, which is lot 17. And I'll go through these and if you need have more questions about this. This is the site um, that we have, um, it's close to the Warriors Arena. It's actually adjacent to the Warriors Arena. It's a long diagonal site. You can't see it because the X covers it up, but um, it's a, a site that we have some state right of way issues. Um, and so we have unclear, it's unclear to us if what we have to deal with on the right of way for that site. It also is, we have refuse service for multiple um, users around the area that from loading and loading would have to go in through that, that we'd have to accommodate. And because the site's long and linear, it does complicate things. And then finally, we have a use agreement with the Warriors um, for ADA and handicap spaces uh, related to their, their uses, so it really limits it. Um, I think if you were looking at, you know, the safe sleeping area, in, in theory, we thought maybe that would work, but when we actually looked at the timing and the timing of the use of the arena, it, it actually still conflicts. So we removed that site. And then finally, we removed the wharf yard and this is one um, where 
uh, we're still trying to clear up the title on this site, um, but separately from that, so we don't have site control at this time. Uh, separately from that, it also has poor drainage. Um, it's, it's essential for wharf operations. We thought, you know, we'll look at it, it's a large site, maybe we could combine the uses on it, but um, in looking more closely and looking at actually the, <coughs> massive amount of materials and pilings that they have stored on the site to actually make that site available would be would be quite intensive and probably not ready. We couldn't make it ready in time for the intended purpose. For, so for that reasons, we removed these three sites from consideration, um, which gives us uh, three remaining sites and we'll go through those in a little more detail. So um, the three sites that are remaining, again, um, is lot number two, I'm sorry, I keep saying that, uh, site two, which is lot 24. Um, and just to orient you, this is the a section of the northern parking lot north of Depot Park behind Washington Street. And then um, site number four is East Cliff Drive, um, right off of East Cliff Drive. And then site number five is San Lorenzo Park. And I'll, we'll go a little more um, in depth in the next slides. So here's site two, lot 24. As you can see, this is just a portion of the city parking lot north of Depot Park. Um, I'm only showing you a photo of the portion that we're considering um, for the safe sleeping site. Um, it's roughly 52 spaces. We do have a, you know, a couple concerns. I'll, I'll go over through those in a second, but this is just so that you have a visual of the area we're talking about. Um, so here's the portion of the site. As you can see, the total lot um, north of Depot is about 125 spaces. And so the area we're looking at is about 52 spaces. Um, opportunities on site, we do have water on site. Um, it's accessible, it's near to services and public safety, it's paved and there's lighting on site. So it definitely has, has some benefits, some concerns. We do have uh, 70 uh, UCSC permits in the overall lot and in the whole 125 spaces. They're not uh, site specific, but they are to the lot. So we need to accommodate for that. That's largely um, during the day. We have uh, 18 par uh, park and ride permit holders as well. So we are still looking at whether or not we can use the entire area that you see outlined in yellow. There may be uh, 10 or so parking spaces that we need to accommodate, but we think with sort of a shared parking model, shared use model that we should be able to accommodate um, on this site. But uh, we also have just to orient you to the key and what we've done for each of the site is that, um, and it's a little hard to see on this map, but we have um, shown the water, stormwater, sewer, uh, the limits to the campsite, and including a 25 uh, foot setback. We did that for all sites, although some we may wanna consider using part of the setback. It's a requirement for near residential. There's, this isn't particularly a residential site, but we still wanted to show what a 25 foot and just for a scaling um, look like on here. Um, <coughs> There is some limited visibility to the site. There is some potential traffic impact that we would need to look at from Laurel Street during the evening hours till morning. We would be cutting off that access. This parking lot connects to the other one with the private housing development that connects to Laurel. And it is within a coastal zone. Um, this just shows you just, we wanted to make sure as we're looking at this site with this type of orientation that we could actually make it work as a safe sleeping site. So each of those white, um, areas you have is roughly 10 by 10. This again is only just for analysis. This isn't um, what the final uh, safe sleeping site would look like. We just wanted to see, can we actually fit what we're trying to accomplish? So we could fit uh, up to, and the, just the base area, 27 um, tent areas, there's up to an additional nine that we could accommodate that's laid out here, area for storage, um, sanitation, and a, and a food and common area. So that it is feasible to fit it on the site. The site was actually the most constrained, so we thought it was important just to make sure from an initial vetting that this would work. Okay, um, so moving on, so that's to the next site is site four. This is East Cliff Drive. And um, there's two potential uh, locations here. The site's uh, fairly large, and um, this is the lower area that's adjacent to East Coast, East Cliff Drive, and this is the central location. It's approximately 9,200 square feet. Um, the water um, meter has nearby access. Electric is available nearby. Um, it is a flood resistant site um, for the two areas that we've identified, and it's accessible and visible. So. The first site um, is the central location. 
Um, there are concerns, and I'll show you, and then we can go ahead and go to the next one. Um, and so this one is just another potential uh, layout of the area that we could have. Um, the main differences between the two is this one's a little more visible from East Cliff Drive. Um, they, they both are roughly the same site, uh, same site analysis. This is just more of a frontage location. There are some concerns. Um, there's no formal crossing, traffic cro uh, pedestrian crossing, so that is a concern that we were looking at on, on this one. Um, this site does drain to the river. Um, obviously, there's some community impacts with the adjacent uh, Ocean View Park, um, and it is within the coastal zone. And then the last site is um, San Lorenzo Benchlands, um, and it, it's important to just clarify that the area that we're looking at is the south portion of the Benchlands, south of the pedestrian bridge. Um, some of you uh, will, of course, recall that we've had an encampment in the past that was on the north, the north area. This is actually the, the south area that we were looking at for the potential safe sleeping area. And looking at the site analysis for this, it's roughly 8,800 square feet. Um, as I mentioned, this is, you can see um, the orientation of the top it is south of the pedestrian bridge, water nearby in the park, electric nearby in the park. It's near to services, it's accessible and visible. Um, some of the concerns, um, there are some wildlife impacts, obviously, um, this close to the river. And then also, um, as we'll talk about in a second, to um, the upper areas, the contingency site in the upper um, park area, um, we have some concerns um, between the river and the pond um, with kingfisher, blue heron, um, ducks and geese, um, just overall. Uh, we do think that the, some of the community impacts um, are lessened by being in the southern area versus the northern area, just because it's a smaller footprint. Um, but there are community impacts with major community events um, and celebrations that happen in the bench lands periodically. Um, flooding is also a concern, um, and we'll get into that in a second. And as you can see, the site tapers down as you go south. So it is a narrow site, um, but we do think it's, it's feasible. And we needed to look at if, um, because of the flooding, and we all know that the bench lands flood, what's the contingency site, um, since this is a day-to-day -day, um, looking, looking from the um, safe sleeping program. And so our alternative site would be in the upper area of the, uh, just of San Lorenzo Park. Um, and this area, as we look at, um, has some opportunities, the same as the other, are obviously the water electric, um, it's flood resistant, it's accessible, has some increased visibility. Um, however, it has some sincere, uh, serious concerns as well. Again, it drains to the river, um, the community impacts, and specifically the park impacts to the adjacent playground, um, lawn bowling, and just the whole pedestrian cycling um, intersection network that, that travels right through here. Um, so that's largely, um, just an overview of the three remaining sites. As I said, this has um, been a, a pretty intensive, um, all you know, across all all departments analysis, um, getting to these sites. And while I didn't say it at the beginning this time, I mean there are uh, you know drawbacks to every site. No site is the perfect site, um, but we do think that these three remaining sites have enough. Uh, balance in them for you to, to seriously consider and if, if you needed to choose a site that one of these three could work as a safe sleeping site. Um, so happy to answer any specific site specific questions. Councilmember Clifford. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you for that and for all the different departments working in overtime to make sure that we can move forward on this. <clears throat> I'm curious, uh, there was that great rendition or example of how many tents would fit in lot 24 or site two. Was that kind of estimation done on the other ones just because of the number of sites that will, or the number of beds that we need to open up being approximately an additional 50 or 60? Um, I think our charge was up to, was it 40? 50. 40 to 50, 50. people. And um, so we did do a very preliminary one um, for, for each of the other sites. And the other sites actually are larger than the first site. So we felt like just in, without going into, since we did not plan and lay out them for any sort of operational standpoint, we just wanted to see if they would fit. We focused on the first one that I showed you. The others are larger and the, it can accommodate more sites. But the first site actually could accommodate 50 with a combination of largely single, but even some uh, double occupancy. Mm, that's great, and then just one more. Um, so I went down and I spoke with the camp council. I have a standing 
the 30 o'clock Monday meeting with all of them just to talk about their perceptions. One of their concerns with some of the sites that were proposed was the, the idea or concept of privacy. They've received a lot of um, abuse from people driving by on the freeway and just the general decency of being able to wake up and walk to the bathroom without having people stare at you. So um, one of the sites that they were interested in exploring was up in the Poganip near the clubhouse, the, the retired clubhouse that's up there. I had a chance to speak with the fire chief today and uh, in his per, uh, point of view that it is feasible to have a safe sleeping zone up there of between 40 and 50 people at the most. Um, has that site been looked at? And if so, um, what's the process? Yeah, we looked at that site as part of the initial pass and the remote access and the difficulty of, of getting up there and providing the services and everything that we needed was one of the reasons we eliminated that one. Okay, thank you. Okay. Did you have a okay. question? Just wondering about lot is it 17 by the Warriors? Mm -hmm. um, um, isn't the season over on March 23rd? I don't know the exact season date, um, but we we have year-round use agreement with the Warriors for events and other purposes and events. So we don't we don't control as a city that calendar. The Warriors control that calendar. And have so we been the, looking at that site at all for a um, a parking area, RV parking area, because that's that's what I've been hearing about, but not not for tents. Not to my knowledge. No, we haven't been looking at it specifically for safe parking. Thank you. Follow up question? Yeah, just on that safe parking question, has there been any sites identified for potential safe parking? Because I notice um, that we're talking about encampments and transitional encampments, but there's also the individuals in cars. And I know that we're currently working on trying to find shelter space for people to move out of the Ross camp, but has there been any exploration of safe parking sites? So as it relates to the last council meeting, we do have direction to move forward with uh, making a recommendation for a safe parking lot, city owned lot to support the AFC program but also at the last meeting, it was directed to add safe parking into the project charter for transitional encampments. So as we kind of contemplate that process, we certainly will be um, also contemplating potential safe parking sites as well. Thank you. Did you have a question? Yes. I had a question with regards to lot 24. Um, are there any schools or daycare or anything? Actually, this goes for all the lots that are being recommended. Are there any concerns with them being in proximity to schools or daycares or anything that would, you know, um, be concerning with um, children being in proximity where a lot of children are active? I think one of the challenges of looking at the central core is that, I mean, you could say all of these sites are going to have some some impact to schools or, or daycare or preschool facilities. Um, these sites particularly being in city control and looking at the immediate adjacent uses, we felt were the best suited with those in mind, with those considerations in mind. But we can't say that any site um, is completely not impacted. But also keeping in mind that the safe sleeping is a uh, night to early morning program. And so that is also a distinction between safe sleeping and the transitional encampment, kind of that, um, uh, consideration as to the number of folks using that shelter model during the day that might impact neighboring uses is quite different for a safe sleeping program. Okay. Jonathan, do you have another question? Yeah. And one more question regarding all the sites. Um, with these safe sleep sleeping sites, is there any control and regulation of the, like, I guess my question is how would we be regulating the number of people that would be going into these sites? Because if there's no fencing or if there's no way to control people coming in, it can it could potentially overwhelm those sites if they're only, you know, for example, if lot 24 um, has space for 24, 30 people. Yeah, so actually they're fully controlled, uh, fully fenced and controlled. <laughs> so um, that is really the distinction. The, the fence stays up, but the infrastructure, um, the I would say the semi kind of permanent infrastructure, the storage, hygiene remains, but for safe sleeping and storage, the individual tents or if people are actually sleeping under cover outdoors, that take, that is removed each day. But the, lot, the, the programs are fully fenced, um, likely screened for privacy and then also controlled with a kind of one gate open access, you know, obviously considering our fire um, marshal requirements. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. With that, yeah, I'll turn it back to, to Susie and Tina. And um, I just want to say that, you know, we're at the point where we do feel like, you know, any of these three sites could be feasible, but we really need feedback from you um, to be able to do any additional analysis to the, ex to the extent that you can give us feedback or direction today. We would really appreciate that. Thank you, Bonnie. And so to that end, we have this draft slide set up that we can come back to later when you begin your discussion where we can live input council concerns or areas for further analysis and your direction on it so we can really go through and get that specific direction on siting. Okay, so now we're shifting to the uh, next element of the agenda, and this is talking about the shelter crisis declaration. And um, this slide looks familiar. I just updated it from the slide that was presented to you last week. But for those who haven't engaged so far, what a shelter crisis is, it's a vehicle under the California government code that allows municipalities to have a little more freedom to move expeditiously and have less than fully to code circumstances in order to respond to the shelter crisis that is ongoing in their communities. So with the finding that a significant number of persons are without the ability to obtain shelter, resulting in threat to their life and safety, this can be declared, and it does things that you can see in the second and third bullet, provides immunity from liability for ordinary negligence, and allows some suspension of state or local rules and statutes when necessary to expedite the use of public facilities for um, shelter. It also allows the council to adopt alternate state health and safety standards. Now for just a quick history on this, that there is a shelter crisis declaration already in effect for the city of Santa Cruz. The city council adopted one in January of 2018. That document was in the agenda packet for this item, just to refresh um, everyone's recollection on that. Um, and then we did propose, I believe, at the um, March 12th meeting, I'm, yeah. okay, for March 12th meeting, a revision to that. And the council um, chose not to act on that. And then between that last week and this week, we've revised it again. And, and so I will take some time to go through this because a red line was not posted with the agenda item. I know there were questions, but um, when working quickly, you don't always have time to you know think through everything. So I appreciate the council's forbearance and us working through it. And we also had the opportunity um, with having it publicly presented to, to get feedback from the community. So that was actually very helpful. So I will first pass around a hard copy for the, for the city council, could you pass that please? And then for the members of the community, I will, I have it saved. Tina, is this the one that's in our packet? Yes. Okay. Yes. But I'm sending around the red line. And so this red line is off of the revised version we presented at your last meeting. And so the red line shows what was stricken and what was added since it was presented. And we thought this would be important so everyone can see. So the major changes are in a few areas that, that you saw referenced on the slide. One is that we provided a few more whereas clauses just to tell the story a bit more fully around the city's circumstances and why these actions were being taken. This was language that was in that is in the original shelter crisis declaration that seemed like it would it would be helpful to have in there. So that's punctuated throughout this. For instance, this whereas clause here, just referencing the specific populations um, to that that make up our homeless community. Um, in this next whereas, you can also see there's some minor um, editing just for clarity. You know camp or lodge overnight, that could be confusing, so we just made it sleep. And so you have a few of these. Um, this whereas um, uh, references an idea in the original declaration about the city and the county working on this. You know, this has been a joint effort, is a joint effort, um, more than a joint effort, all the governments in the county trying to work on this very difficult problem for us. So that's some of the changes. You'll see those references throughout. And then, um, this whereas, so the one that was added here, whereas if the provisions of any state or local regulatory statute, regulation, or ordinance prescribing standards of health, of housing, health, or safety are so suspended, per this, this section authorizes the city to adopt substitute standards. So this was um, an area that was in the original declaration that didn't come out sharply in the revision. So we wanted to make sure that was in there. And um, that's a direct reference to the government code. And this is one of the allowances of shelter crisis. 
And then you can see the language stricken here under the CEQA and the California Coastal Act. We felt that um, that was being misconstrued somewhat, that there was just knocking down every <laughs> regulatory component of this. And, and that wasn't its intent. But again, we wanted to have a very flexible tool initially. But this created some concern and we said, it's not necessary. It's not absolutely necessary, so let's remove it because that was causing quite a few comments um, in the community. Um, the whereas here at the bottom, this references the Homelessness Coordinating Committee and the existence of a plan. So again, getting to some of that background, I discussed um, this as well. <coughs> And this, these are also, be it further resolved, clauses that were removed. These are also referencing CEQA and the California Coastal Act. So that's really the substance of, of the shelter crisis declaration revisions. And either myself or the city attorney can answer any questions you might have, if you have any at this time. I just have one quick question. Mm -hmm. The um, existing uh, resolution that the city council has on the books, uh, does that currently um, mirror what the county has? Because if I remember correctly, in uh, January of 2017, the uh, city and the county both adopted a very similar resolution. Uh, no, the way it worked is the city went first. Mm -hmm. So we went in January of 2018 because we were dealing with trying to set up our three-phase plan. And we thought this was an important tool to expedite that work. The county declared their shelter crisis in um, later in the year with respect to the HEAP and CASH funding. So that was the, the state grants that came down to our community of about $10.6 million. And in order to be eligible to access those monies, you had to have a shelter crisis declaration in effect. So we have one, so we have access to those monies. Um, Watsonville did the same. I don't recall the exact text of the counties. Okay. Um, I haven't looked at it in some time, so I can't comment if it's similar or dissimilar from ours. Um, but actually, there was one other thing I wanted to point out, and it, it's this one. It's this top, be it further resolved, right here. So this was an inclusion in the version we added this to the version you received on March 12th. And I just wanna take a moment to talk about what this is. And what this is, is again, we're moving very quickly and as we have a little more time to process and think about the intersection of this work, our existing codes and regulations and um, processes, wanted to be sure that we could move really expeditiously. So what this says is that in moving forward, any permits that are necessary would come straight to the city council to be heard. Whereas normally in the ordinary course of business, they may go, they may be referred to the planning commission or the parks and recreation commission or some other commission before it gets to you. So what this does is accelerates that regulatory timeline, again, being mindful of the crisis to get straight to the city council for that to be heard. And we thought this was important, again, trying to work on that April 17th deadline as well. Thank you, Council Member. Vice Mayor Cummings. How does this differ from what's um, in the current crisis declaration. How does this version? Um, the, the, this it does not section. include this language. So normally, so in the, um, in the previous declaration, if we wanted to establish a camp, it would have to go first to planning or to the Coastal Commission. It really depends on the land use or type. So it depends on what's the zoning, where the property is, what it's zoned for, what's its uses, et cetera. So we'd have to do that individualized assessment of the regula normal regulatory path for that. Um, when we did the 1220 River Street, a permit was prepared and I believe heard by the zoning administrator, an administrative hearing by the zoning administrator. So that, so we did issue a permit to ourselves for 1220 River Street and it'd be the same. So it really, d it's very site specific around the pathway and what would normally happen. And under this, we would, it would not need to go to a zoning administration or to any um, other. Under commission. this, it would come straight to this body. Councilmember Matthews. I had a question on the, um, uh, possible suspension of state or local statutes, regulations, et cetera. And it says, if they are so suspended, the government code authorizes the city to adopt substitute standards. And I just have a general question about how that might be done. And it does imply that there would be some standards. Absolutely, and I can also talk to, I, in this conversation it's interesting because sometimes we're very focused on the problem at hand, the challenge at hand, and that is moving and closing the gateway encampment and having an alternative. But this, this uh, 
shelter crisis declaration can also apply more broadly. So our sense of this is what we would do is if the city were to think there's a course of action where we wanted to um, implement this aspect or activate this aspect of it, we would look at that site and we would develop site-specific alternate health and safety codes that we feel we couldn't meet under our existing and we'd bring that back to you as part of the discussion. So that's how that would work. So rather than just blanket adopting substitute standards, really weighing where we are, what's happening, what are the facilities, why do they need, why do we need to have alternate um, public health and safety? And somewhat related, and I, I spoke to you previously about this near the end, the, be it further resolved that in light of the homeless shelter crisis described herein, so almost the last um, paragraph, I think. Um, it says um, the council hereby authorizes that any permits necessary for such facilities, um, and then it talks about bypassing the commissions, um, but it's not specific that um, any such facility would require a permit process. And that's something I wanna bring up in the course of, it just talks about any permits required, which implies maybe there are and maybe there aren't. So. Um, anyway, that's an issue I want to bring up later in the discussion. Well, if there aren't any further questions at this time, does that uh, conclude the presentation and we'll open it up to public comment? Almost. Almost. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and so just in summation, what direction we would be able to move forward with is um, directing the city manager to implement a small scale safe sleeping and storage program. That's the recommended program model as Susie discussed in depth to select a site. Um, and we've presented three and done a very careful initial vetting, although of course more work would need to be done. And then finally adopting the revised shelter crisis declaration. And we do feel that this action is important for, um, for at a minimum, that last component we talked about where permits would come straight to this body as opposed to going through various other levels of review just to have us be able to move as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Thank you. Okay, Council Member. I, I do have a question that I'd like for you to try to answer for the benefit of the public primarily because we've received a lot of communications about this particular action and I would like to just, I mean, I understand the, the differences between this resolution and the previous resolution that was adopted. I understand the um, implications, but if you could just summarize what the, adopting this shelter, this declaration of shelter crisis would allow the city council to do that's any different from what we have been doing. I think it would be helpful because I think that's really unclear for the public. Okay, because um, we have one existing. Exactly, um, we do. The one that's existing does cover a lot of bases. However, it makes specific reference to where we were in our plans and projects and expectations last year. So it references um, like transitional encampment re um, relative to where we were about a year ago. So that was a reason why we thought we need to generalize this instrument so it does have broader applicability if the council needs to exercise that. So that's one component. Um, Another component, it's also, if the voice is different, it's because the voice is different. Um, staff wrote the initial one and I, I authored that and I based that on what uh, was adopted in Santa Rosa. And then our city attorney drafted the revised one based upon another municipality, I believe city of San Diego. So if you're getting a legal tone, there's a legal tone and then there was the other tone. Um, and another difference with this is that last element about really clarifying the pathway for permit approval and having that be coming straight to your body um, and being able to still have a public hearing but move quickly. And I'll also say is that we didn't exercise the prior declaration. We had it on the books, but we found we were able to do everything within within the permitting, the health and safety, the temporary use nature of it. So we didn't really flex that tool. With this, we've also had more time to really think about options and alternatives. And so we thought it would be helpful to have something that had, had greater clarity in areas and was more generally cast. I hope that helps. Um, I can also pull up the old one if you'd like to see that. No, okay. okay. I just kind of wanted to get at the question of whether or not this is gonna give us some sweeping new ability to um, establish encampments, 
you know, I, mean, I think that's the, the general concern that I'm hearing expressed, and I want to be try to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. um, I do not believe so, no. I, I do think there might be community perception that's conflating the transitional encampment and safe parking ordinances that were tabled and the shelter declaration. So at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up for uh, public comment. Thank you for your presentation and work and quick turnaround. Um, I'd like to ask those who are interested um, in addressing the community uh, to please uh, raise your hands so that we have a sense of how many folks want to speak. Okay. I will go ahead and ask that you self-select to identify if you're interested in, in speaking for just one minute. If you're interested in addressing the council in just one minute, if you want to quickly express your opinions to us, I will go ahead and allow for you to uh, address us first. I will then um, open it up to a community presentation who has requested additional time and then back to the community for a full two minutes. So. If, if there's anybody who really wants to quickly, I see somebody with a young child, please feel free. You'll be given one minute, and any other folks who want to address the council with, uh, within the one minute time frame is welcome to address us first. Okay. So right here. Hi. Please, hi. Hi, um, I just signed up my daughter for preschool. We're on High Street. I'm very nervous about what's going on. I feel a little bit better hearing some of the Details like safe sleeping and not that the encampment is moving up there. I'm nervous about what could develop <laughs> from safe sleeping to an encampment. I'm worried about lawlessness. I feel for the legal restraints that you guys are under, but I'm very concerned. I don't feel safe in the parks with my child. I don't feel safe um, in some areas. The preschool teacher told me that her car was stolen right off of High Street, that there are drug and encampment problems up there. They steal tents from them. Um, it's a big problem I feel for you guys. I don't know how to solve it, but I'm just saying I'm concerned and I'm worried and these people can't protect themselves. So it's up to all of us to do that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa Freebaron, local registered nurse. I'm here to um, address Dr. Leff's recent comments at your last city council meeting. The public has a right to know that the city and county have been running a unsanctioned, um, no accountability, harm reduction, needle giveaway on the levy, needles and Narcan no, by non-medical personnel. And this has been happening since November, since that camp cropped up. We don't have a shelter crisis, we have a drug crisis in this town. <laughs> and, and I am... And I am really disappointed in all of you. You've been notified. I've asked to meet with various members of this body and been denied. Yet you will sit and pander to drug addicts at Camp Ross and give them a platform to keep using drugs. And it's very upsetting that you would even, even open up our parks again. Two of your sites, the only sites you can come up with are two parks that were destroyed. We've already been here. Camp Ross okay. is your example you. of a transitional camp that's Thank you. not going to work. Okay, your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give just one second before you begin. If you could allow the speaker who is addressing us to finish their comments, then they can have their full one minute. Um, and then if you feel the need to um, applaud after, please do so. But allow them to speak uninterrupted. Go ahead. Good evening. I, I also have a daughter um, in preschool on High Street and had, had heard that well, that was potentially one of the sites. And I'm, I'm pleased to see that it's not. But as I was standing here tonight and reading lots of comments online, which is probably a very bad idea, um, you know, everyone's talking about NIMBY, NIMBY, and, and I agree, and I was thinking, you know, great, my daughter doesn't have a problem, but what about somebody else's daughter, or what about somebody else's son? And so given the, um, the sites that were suggested, and the council is all here, I wonder, and I'd like to hear from each of the counselors if possible, would you all uh, agree to a pledge that whichever site that you select, you'd make sure that it's within some, with outside of some minimum distance from, from children under the age of high schoolers, half a mile, a quarter mile, I don't know, you guys define the distance, but you come up with some minimum distance that you say, if, if these are children that are under the high school age, we will guarantee that we're not gonna associate this homeless problem you know, around children that young. We, are you agreeable to that? Go ahead, you can go ahead and pause the time. This is the chance for us to hear from you, so we'll go ahead and listen and take your input, but we're not um, at a position to respond at this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Hello, I'm natealex.kennedy at gmail.com, 3469888. What I gotta say is what we need is professional, legal, legitimate campgrounds with uh, like they put the fencing around the post office and then they finally got real professional fences put in. We should have fences like that. We can put them in parks, uh, Harvey West, Grant Street, San Lorenzo, but we should have a police trailer right out front that would also house a property manager that would allow people to pay rent. And we could have outdoor kitchens, we could have showers, we could have uh, restrooms, even ones built up there so they're not just porta potties. But uh, we gotta do something. And if, if you're gonna fail to set up legal, legitimate professional camps, then we need to start just letting people pitch their tent right on Pacific Avenue or wherever else, if we dev, if we offer no alternative. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, my name is Carol Reed. I live downtown on Myrtle Street. Um, I just wanna say that you've selected sites. I've heard one person in here talk about public comment. I believe it was you and maybe one other short thing. You're going through a fast process and I'm not hearing public comment. I live downtown, my car's broken into, glass is on the street, I walk by people shooting drugs. It is a drug problem and the whole county needs to be involved. We have sympathy, but it's a drug problem too. It's not just a homeless problem. Hello, I'm Tamara Smith. I live near the um, Delaware Street area that was being considered and that's how I got my attention. I'm not an NIMBY though. I don't want anyone to have to deal with an ill-organized encampment that's going to impact their way of living. It's not fair for businesses, so it shouldn't be behind Camp Ross. It's not fair on natural bridges where it's a, a sensitive environment and it's not good around kids or um, you know, I would say, as the other fellow did through high school, um, but they're people, I'm compassionate. Some of them have drug problems. They need drug counseling, they don't need needles. Some of them are students at the university that don't have a place to live. They need to have safe parking. Hopefully at the university would make sense. And there are just so many myriad different problems. I'd like to say that the Santa Barbara model, where I, used, I grew up, I think Santa Barbara's doing a good job. I would look at it, I'd read The Independent, and I wish you guys all the best. It's a super hard problem. We've gotta do it right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Farley, and I'm here just um, hopefully to sway against the East Cliff location. I think it's not a good idea. I've been living there for 22 years, right? near where the, um, you cross over the bridge to the boardwalk. Go ahead and pause it. Okay. Oh, thank you. And I live near the area where the boardwalk meets East Cliff, so it's kind of there, and I can't even tell you how many problems there are around the neighborhood with theft, with garbage, with walking down and being scared. I mean, it's just unbelievable in the fact that there are so many kids in the neighborhood now, and having it be so close to that, really against it. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin Rothwell. I'm a 35 year Santa Cruz resident. I urge the city and the council to have a look at the basement of the Locust Street parking garage as a possible site for a, um, the, um, safe sleeping site and also a safe parking site and a storage site. It solves a lot of the problems that you've been talking about and um, I think it's a suitable site. Take a look. Steve Rohr, I was the guy that got upset last week. I was concerned about the children being exposed. So it looks like you folks have tried to mitigate that the best you could. I appreciate that. Um, like that little child that was brought up here, they don't have any representation. I'm not against homeless folks. I've taken them into my house. I'm not gonna tell you about all the uh, personal charitable things I've done, but my God, we've gotta use common sense. Also, number two, 
we've got limited resources. How are we going to control the migration of people that aren't from this area coming here to have a homeless handout, needles, whatever? We've got to be able to control. If there's people in this area that have got, become homeless, let's help them. But my God, we can't control you know, people migrating from Eugene or where, anywhere else. So we've got to think about you know, limited resources. Also. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. My name's Evan Soroki. I'm in support of any and all those sites. I say yes to my backyard to any and everyone. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Daniel, and I live off of East Cliff and help manage apartments. I'm wondering how the uh, city is going to deal with the drug, gang, and registered sex offender problems that's going to affect the families there even more than it does already, and how they intend to deal with the mobilization of the community to, in protest of it and the impact it's going to have on the Santa Cruz boardwalk when they see what's going on in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm the owner of the business that is on Washington Street, where you plan to put the sleeping area right in the back of my shop. And I'm just appalled. Um, it's saddening. The parking lot is full every weekend from beachgoers. It's a very high use area. There's tons and tons of apartments in city neighborhoods all around right behind me. It's unbelievable that you've chosen this spot. Please reconsider. It seems like where it used to be down behind the county courthouse made sense. All the officials in that building can look at it and see what you guys have created and <laughs> keep it there until you figure it out. Please don't put it next to my business. It will destroy my shop. I will have to. Uh, hi, my name is Julia McDermott. Um, I appreciate all of you for tackling this problem. Um, I want to just put a human element on it. Um, my son was a drug addict downtown for 12 years and would have died if a judge in this county had not gotten so sick of his vagrancy that he put him in a lockdown program with drug treatment, and that is what got him sober. He's 14 years sober today. What they're doing, what they're doing down on that levee, passing out needles when Emmeline is less than a five minute walk where th those addicts can walk over there and get medical attention and wrap around care, it is completely uncalled for. Every addict I know, and I know a lot of them from dealing with this issue, my dad was 35 years sober, numerous family members, 15, 20 years sober. Handing out needles when there are children around and you have a mixed population of drug addicts and truly homeless, struggling people, they need to be okay. separated, <laughs> seriously. Hello, um, my name is Mark, a longtime resident of Santa Cruz and a homeowner parent. Um, I have a lot to say, but only a minute. I want to go on the record that I'm opposed to everything discussed today. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I don't see any solutions and with no disrespect. I know that's a hard job. It's a hard problem, but you're talking about what problems are we trying to solve here? Avoiding a lawsuit? It sounds like you have to have the same number of beds to that you're taking away to do that, but we're talking about shelters that uh, house maybe 50 people, but the one picture that had the number of beds was like 27, the River Street um, camp that we had was like half vac uh, vacant, I mean, because people didn't wanna share tents, is that gonna happen here? And so what problems are you solving? And it certainly isn't the problem of my children walking down the beach yesterday, Sunday, and wondering, well, Daddy, why is that guy laying in a pile of barf with a needle in his arm. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark. Um, I'm a longtime resident of um, East Cliff area where site four is, um, I just wanna speak spe specifically to that area. Um, 
you know, I have no answers for homelessness, but that area, there's no parking. There's already campers on Jesse Street right there all the time. It's already a very hazardous area for pedestrians with the traffic there. As it was stated, there's no good pedestrian crossing there, as well as walking along the street as it goes along the river is very hazardous with people, bikers on that, on that piece of sidewalk and um, skateboarders and just all, all, already it's a very dangerous area. So uh, I just don't see that as a viable area. Thanks. Good evening, City Council. My name is Curtis Relaford. I have a solution for these people. This is a bubble. Santa Cruz is a bubble. If these folks had been in the ghetto where I'm from, hey, you just got the drugs coming now. Wait till the guns come. Wait till the criminals come. It's on their way. If you don't take it from somebody who has been there, 33 years clean and sober. I know what drugs is. I know how to deal with them drug addicts. I was down there all day today preaching at them. These folks are depressed. Depression leads into destruction. And they don't care about your kids. They don't care about your business. Dude, it's enough of us in here to take one at a time under your wing, lead them to a drug center lead them to a facility that would take care of them. All it takes is patience. Good evening, council members. Um, I'm a mom. I'm a third generation Santa Cruz resident. My daughters are fourth generation. I appreciate the common sense that's been used to not have it uh, put up by Westlake Elementary School, where one of my daughters still goes. It's in this day and age with Megan's Law in effect in California, it doesn't make sense on having it even thought of as being so close to an elementary school or where they have a pre-K uh, to fifth grade. My other concern is the waterways. I'm a surfer. I come from a, a generation of Santa Cruz surfers. Um, having our children at the beaches with needles and uh, whether they're loaded or not, with stepping on a needle is a huge concern for the parents in Santa Cruz who pay a lot of money for their kids to be doing junior guards and be down on the beaches. And to have the waterways Thank you. possibly fund them out is not a good thing. Hi, my name is Seth Van Horn, and I'm a father here that lives in Santa Cruz. I have a two-year-old son. I addressed this board last year for issues in my neighborhood, and I'm back up here again because things haven't really changed. I live on 329 Spruce Street, and I there is a lot of drug cartel that comes from over the hill and from the Bay Area that comes down. And the, the residents literally live in their cars seven days a week, dealing drugs out of their cars. The vigilant neighbors we call all the time. The police just don't have the force to respond in time to meet them. It's just going to bring a lot more traffic. Your camp did nothing to do anything on our end of Pacific Avenue. It's just going to bring a bigger problem to this drug cartel that's on our street. We frequent Neary Lagoon every single week with our kid, and that thing is going to get destroyed if you put a camp over near that place. What we need is to handle the drug problem and give resources for these people to clean up their lives and get off the street. Otherwise, we can't expect them to do that. We can't just give them places to live and clean needles. We need to bring a force in of money resource from, from the state or help from outside police force that can give us more men on the field like the FBI or something. <laughs> Hi, my name's Alicia Cole, and this is Isabella. I want to point out the fact that one thing that everybody's missing, homeless people are people just like the rest of you. What we are is we're people without homes. Uh, we can't afford it, you know, for whatever reasons, we have barriers. That doesn't make us immediately untrustworthy. That doesn't make us scary. That doesn't make us not worth getting paid in cash that we suddenly need gift cards. Um, I'm not scary to be around children. Children are not scared of being around me. We're talking about people without homes. We're not talking about scary people. And it's really depressing and disheartening to hear the way homeless people are described by some of our community. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Suzanne McLean. I'm from the Association of Faith Community. Thanks for all your hard work and deliberation on this. I think one of the points that's being missed by the community is that the idea of a safe, what are we calling it, safe sleeping, sleeping or the transitional camp is not what's happened at Ross. It's gonna have a structure, it's gonna have security, it's gonna have a lot more of those uh, things that help us to feel safe and not afraid. And I just wanted to make the point that I hear that, that I hear that and keep going. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else who'd like to address the council for one minute um, and then we'll go ahead and have our group presentation then reopen it up for two minutes. So you'll have, if you're interested in one minute, please feel free. Hi, my name is Suzanne and I live actually directly across uh, from where the pro site is. I'm mother of two and I walk to work back and forth every day. Um, I have deep concerns about the proposed site and I wish that you would reconsider an other as well instead. Um, I, I have seen, I understand, I, I appreciate that the face of homelessness is very different, um, but I think it's very legitimate concerns that a lot of people have in terms of their businesses, in terms of all the different activities that would be going on. I have concerns about taking my kids out at night. Um, I mean, I'm concerned about walking by myself as it is in that area. And I think this is just gonna exacerbate all those issues a lot more. And I really, really wish that you'd reconsider church parking lots. There's lots of other options that you could use and make this a safe place, especially for families that are homeless, because I realize that's one of the most outstanding issues. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, city council. I think about this problem a lot too. Um, I'm over on the East Cliff Way. I've rented apartments. Two of my 26 apartments I've rented to homeless people that, that were good people. Uh, one of them lived in the woods far out Highway 9 when it ended because he was afraid to leave in the homeless camp. He said he couldn't even sleep in the rain uh, with a tent for fear that somebody beat him up and take his stuff. And I couldn't bear that. I gave him a place. He's a great worker, a great person. There are good homeless people. But I can tell you on East Cliff, there's needles on the street. My husband goes along and cleans them up. He got pricked by the needle. He had to take uh, terrible shots for a year to make sure he didn't have anything bad. And uh, the community there has more uh, taken over and taken the community back from the drug users. They'll tell drug users to move on. We've got more people with the houses with single family homes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I have several things to say. First of all, we're dealing with three different crises here, a mental health services crisis, um, a drug addiction crisis, and an affordable housing homeless crisis. And as long as you're lumping all those people together, no matter what you try to do, it will fail. And that I also think what a great working model would be set up much like the state parks where people are on a sliding scale. Pay. If they're on disability, they pay a little bit. If they're not, they can work a few hours. But where they can come and go and feel like they have a place, maybe even their lot space is their address so they can apply for a job. Um, but as long as we're treating everybody, because I suffer from chronic homelessness. I brought my children here. They were born in Santa Cruz. And um, I don't have any criminal history. I don't do any drugs. So um, we really need to see some supportive services. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeffrey Stonehill and just wanted to say um, I got here in 1970. Very briefly, living in the Dakota apartments across from San Lorenzo Park, it was a monster uh, up until a few months ago. People yelling all night long, uh, three in the morning, four in the morning. You wouldn't know about cars coming up at two in the morning, three in the morning, going to the park, slamming their doors, shouting loudly, getting back in their cars. Skateboards coming down at two, three, four, five in the morning to do whatever business they have in the park. Several tents with over 
over 40 bicycles doing bicycle business in the park, people screaming all night, I love heroin. Um, people defecating right in the middle of the park. Um, I'm asking, why don't you put the garbage in the can? It's one foot from you. It's my park, it's my land, I can do whatever I want. Uh, people screaming and yelling all night long. Most of the people there are in their 70s and 80s, uh, a poor situation. But uh, anyhow, I wish you luck on, on all this. Good evening, I'll try and make my comments brief. My name is Bradley Olin, I'm a parent of two young daughters. I live on the Upper West Side, and I believe that there's a disconnect happening. With respect to the conversation about safe sleeping spaces, I think the public, at least in this room and the, the community we know, doesn't fully understand the ramifications of that kind of arrangement versus what's going on at Camp Ross. And I think there needs to be a broader education that happens where we understand what's going on and how these camps will be run because let's face it, those three sites that are left are all next to public spaces where children play. And yeah, maybe they're not playing at nine o'clock at night, but right now from what I've heard, I don't know how those overnight camps are going to be run. All I've got in my head is Camp Ross. And so even if you say it's going to be regulated, we don't know what that means as the public and we're all really spooked about it. So I think if you're gonna propose park sites and you're gonna put it where there are lots of kids and families around, you've gotta bring us all into the fold and get us on board by helping us be comfortable with the safety. Thanks. Mike, Mike Timpanaro, uh, Prada, I live in the west side. Um, so um, I know Portland has kind of an interesting program to help with the homelessness. Um, they have a, an incentive program for homeowners to put uh, additional dwelling units on their property. And if you offered something like that, I'd certainly consider it to help solve the problem. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and have our uh, presenta presentation uh, from uh, Santa Cruz Neighbors. I'll go ahead and... Were you still, were we still, I, are we still up for one, is anybody still up for one minute? Okay, uh, presentation from Santa Cruz Neighbors, if not, okay, go ahead, for one minute. Hi, my name is Sunny, and I sleep in that encampment. I just helped a female elder who didn't have no place but got kicked out, and I had a bed right next to me. I opened it out, I loaned it out, and she was safe with her dog as well. I cleaned up the encampment around my areas, including some other tents that I sleep right next to. I do the work wherever I go on riding the bike. I'm picking up the needles on these bike trails. And all these little complaints with these bikers, they're not stopping to pick up those needles with their safety. I'm hearing complaints, but they're not doing anything by their mouths. Put your, put your mouths over there and help us out. Clean up the campment. If you want to volunteer, please, we need a little bit of help because some people don't know how to get up. And about a drug issue, every city is a drug issue. So I, I believe that concludes the one, folks that are interested in one minute, we'll go ahead and have uh, the uh, presentation that requested additional time. I'll go ahead and invite Deb Elston up to go ahead and present at this time. And you'll have four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Watkins, council members, staff, and to the neighbors for writing the emails and showing up. I could probably talk an hour up here, but I'll keep it to my time. When you hear about an idea, you need to ask yourself, does this continue to enable those on the street or does it truly help them make the changes in their life's situation? As you are taking action to help those that are homeless in our community, I believe with a strong county parter partnership, we will be able to help those who want help. The city doesn't have to do this alone. Let's not confuse ourselves on addiction or homelessness. Neighbors throughout the city have been completely left out of your initial deliberations. Some council members have been to neighborhood meetings, most have not. Neighbors must be at the table. They have ideas. 
You absolutely need to listen to neighbors before you bring proposals forward. It may take more time in the beginning, but this has proven to be more beneficial than getting the backlash of reactions that you have created. Neighbors throughout the city are truly frustrated with your current chaotic process. You cannot use programs that continue to enable destructive behaviors and hurt the people in need as much as the community around them. There needs to be accountability on all sides, people who need help and those people who are trying to help. Our community cannot be drugged down to lower standards. We already have neighbors moving, businesses closing over this issue. Policies that don't cost anything need to be put in place to help set expectations in our community and responsibilities on all sides. Santa Cruz Neighbors throughout the 18 years has been engaged in countywide partnerships, executive boards, networks, and discussing this extremely complex homeless issue in our community. This is not my first rodeo here. Personally, after the past 10 years of homeless research, befriending homeless, and looking for solutions, I've even advocated for individuals getting the help they need. I went back to look at Dr. Robert Marbutt, who is a homeless advocate, an expert that consults with communities nationwide. His guiding principles are, one, move to a culture of transformation. Two, co-locate and virtual e-integration as many of the services possible. Three, you must have a master case management system. Four, reward positive behavior. Five, consequences for negative behavior. Six, external activities must be redirected or, or stopped. Seven, panhandling enables homeless and must be stopped. Many of these policies are started and need to continue. Maybe we should adopt a policy of compassion. This policy needs to include everyone in our community, families raising children, businesses that contribute to our economic stability, our community wanting safety, safety and, a con and a thriving quality of life, and yes, our homeless bettering their own lives. This policy of compassion, I'm almost done. This you can go ahead, I, gotta, I keep it pretty consistent with the time. You're welcome to submit your, your comments and we'll go ahead and- Last and sentence. I can't, I'm sorry, I'm very consistent with that for everybody. I wish I could, but I wanna make sure that there's really um, an equity of voice. So I'm pretty consistent on that standard. So we'll go ahead and submit that and we'll read that. Okay, thank you. So at this time, at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up to any member of the public who would like to address the council for two minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Mark Gutierrez from uh, the Del Viega neighborhood. Um, first off, I, I think this council is full of people who are compassionate and are really trying to find a solution to a problem. I think the issue is, is that right now there's some conflation between solution. Go ahead and pause it. We'll go ahead and pause and sure. just make sure that you have your time and so So I think there's, there's an issue in that there's a conflation between solution and action. Um, I think that some of these proposals that are made by someone, the council, are definitely actions, but I don't know if they're solutions. Um, in particular, I think these actions also have a cost associated with them. Despite the assurances from this council, anytime any government body issues emergency declaration to bypass any um, of the procedures or proposals that are in place to safeguard individuals and shift power from people to government, it causes people to worry. Um, in addition, I think that there's some conflation about the populations of, of, of the homeless. I think on one hand, there's a population of individuals who are, have a hard time making ends meet, who might be the working poor, um, who just need a hand up to be able to improve their lives and they have a desire to do so. The other population is the population as described by the doctor from last city council meeting, or through addiction or through some other issue are not quite at that point in life where they're willing to make that change. 
I wonder about some of the programs or proposals offered by the city council and which of those population is being helped. And so I ask the city council, before you vote on anything, to please consider, am I voting for actions or am I voting for solutions? Am I voting for a policy that actually empowers people or hinders that? Or am I voting for a solution that just creates space for people to exist or actually help them to improve their lives? Thank you. I'd like to invite the next speaker. And just so you know, you'll have two minutes. Good evening uh, to the City Council. I'm uh, Howard Nelson, 35-year resident and voter of Santa Cruz. I want to uh, bring to your attention and submit for the record a uh, document from the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness from May 2018. I don't know if it's in the record. I sent it as an email attachment, but I don't know if you enter, you know, open attachments. This uh, addresses many of the proposed solutions that we're talking about tonight and says that while they're well-intentioned and compassionate, they may be misdirected and have unintended consequences. They say creating sanctioned encampments and safe zones or other similar settings have proven to have little impact on chronic homelessness. You need to have stable places they can live with support. Creating safe zone environments are costly in money, personnel, and effort, and it's better spent on permanent housing and support. And safe zones are difficult to manage and maintain. Upkeep, security, sanitation are all needed on a continuous basis. What they do say is if you decide to proceed with this, these temporary safe zones, once established, you gotta know they're gonna be difficult to close. They should be a plan for how these people are only temporary and they're moved on to permanent housing and other supports. You need to regularly access the, what your, you know, your outcomes, are you improving things? And they say to contact the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, any city or county agency, they'll give you help. They're there. And I'd like to just submit this for the record. Yeah. I'd like to invite the next speaker. Hello, thank you council members. Um, my name is Amy, I'm a West Side homeowner and parent. As a parent, I share a lot of the same fears as other parents who have kids running around downtown and on the beaches. And at the same time, I was here when the first, I believe, sleeping ban, and I can't remember if it was a sitting ban happened, and I remember thinking, where are these people gonna go? They gotta go somewhere. I mean, are we gonna push them off of Westcliff? What is going to happen to people? So what I appreciate here is I understand that this is a temporary solution to try to move the people at the Ross camp to some place that has more supervision, more services, more control, and to be able to provide um, services to people in a, in a more um, organized fashion, let's say. And I really support that. I don't support closing the Ross camp without an alternative for these people to go to. And when I see the Ross camp, I'm both saddened and I also feel like there's some community there for people. I think that when people wanna get off drugs, it's very difficult for them to try to get on their feet when they're constantly having to look for shelter, clothing, protection, food. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are so basic that you need to have, even if it's in jail, in order to start to get off drugs too. And I understand that most of the people there actually don't know what the population there is. I did send an email to the council saying, I think we need to do more canvassing of that population to ask who's ready to move to transitional shelter, who's using drugs and alcohol and wants to get off, who's using drugs and alcohol and doesn't want to get off, so that we know who this population is and what they specifically need. And that will tell us how many people can go into this safe sleeping environment. And I'm also concerned about the safe sleeping environment because during the day, where do people go? I mean, I get to go home and take a nap when I'm tired. So that'll end my, you can check my email. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Keith uh, McHenry, and I've been um, sharing food with people on the streets for 39 years. 
and um, have family members homeless. So I'm somewhat familiar with the issue. Um, I do appreciate what some of the uh, people were saying about bringing the neighbors to actually create the structure for each of these transition camps. I think that's very valuable. It would be, it's, a very, it's crazy just to put camps in a neighborhood where people uh, have no input into how they're organized. But at the same time, I, th uh, I support these three staff recommendations basically, but we must look also at the fact that um, the number of people forced to live on the streets is increasing dramatically month by month. And if something goes awry with the Trump economics, you know, dream or whatever the heck it is that he's trying to put a, on everybody, um, the, uh, we could see three or four times more homeless people on our streets than we are now. Within the time before uh, uh, the Mayor Watkins is out of, has become uh, the next vice mayor, whatever it is that happens to you when you no longer a mayor. And, um, and so we have to kind of like focus on this thing. So I used to get like three or four people a month maybe tell me they just became homeless, where's the shelter? It went to six people a month at the beginning of the month asking where the shelter is or six families. Um, now it's like that, at the beginning of the month, they tell you about how they lost their car, got towed by the police, they now live on the streets. Many of them are women in their like 40s, 50s, and 60s. We had a family that just came to us because their car was stolen on vacation here, and now they're homeless and have no possible way to get off the street here. They can't reach their family to get money to get back, can't hook her up with, uh, with um, Chris to get a free bus ticket yet because she's out of commission currently. And that we have... We Thank need you. to really Thank get you. solutions. Thank okay. you. Some of you, you know me. I, I'm Richard Lewis. Collaboration and partnership are words. Um, our United Way CEO speaks of, instead of giving money to the nonprofit network, of coming to Santa Cruz with action. So I coach you to be in dialogue to see just what that means here in Santa Cruz. If a Barlin Bailey Circus was coming to our county and our city, those of you who haven't researched Carry the Vision, carrythevision.org, I propose collectively Carry the Vision slash Santa Cruz with the leader over the hill where the county of, of uh, over there worked with SEIU, created land, SEIU had uh, tents in, a, in their parking lot, they work together. So carry the vision by design is, could be like women rise for peace, as you remember, women rise for the homeless. <laughs> Create the kind of initiative where we begin to listen. The power isn't in talking heads, the power is in the people who come here week in, week out, Amen. you know? and not only parents, but nonprofits. And I'll be sharing with some of you new collaboration software coming out by the bad guys, Facebook, <laughs> where, where you can begin to have your passion come together with the people who you know, building bridges, 15 million. So I'm homeless, oh, 82 years old, but I'm happy. I appreciate all of you I don't know if anybody knows the work that people are putting on just to sit there. And if you ask your dad, who is Richard, I'm, I'm, no, I'm on the right table. I wanna leave. Thank you. I, I thank, thank you. you Richard, right. Thank you, Richard. Hello, Carol Paul Hamus again, how are you? Um, I was a school teacher and school administrator for 35 years, so school safety for me is paramount to almost anything else. And I especially wanna thank uh, Mayor Watkins' last meeting and Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings for mentioning school safety uh, because it's, it's really critical. So um, I'm kind of a numbers girl and I had a lot of time on my hands. So by four o'clock, there were 964 public correspondence pages submitted to you guys. I'm sure you didn't have a chance to read them all. They were pretty hefty. Out of the 964, two people were neutral, 
Seven were pro and 955 were opposed, primarily to the transitional neighborhood camping, uh, which I'm really thrilled to hear is being tabled for the moment. I tried to summarize, because I did read a lot of the letters, what the worries were, and a lot of them were about suspending the rules around uh, environment, community, schools, et cetera, that a declaration of shelter crisis emergency would uh, permit. So. Many of the uh, letters called to amend the shelter declaration to say that there be some kind of a buffer zone around uh, childcare schools uh, for school safety purposes and that there not be any transitional camps permitted um, on parks, beaches, and public streets without public review, which would allow the community to express and you know, talk about their concerns. So I wanted to bring that forth. I wanna thank you for your work on this and see you next time. <laughs> Hi, I'm Garrett. I, uh, the, the, the essence of what I wanted to say is that more services will always equal more homeless. It's, uh, it, it, this is a dumping ground for the county's homeless. We have all the services here. That's why they're here. They come for the services, they anchor to the services and they're not going anywhere. You add more services, uh, it might help with some people, but others will take their place. And anyway, I wanted to read this. Uh, using the 2017 Annual Homeless Assessment Report to Congress, Santa Cruz has 650% more homeless, 470% more shelter than our share of California's homeless and shelter averages by population. The city of Santa Cruz hosts almost all the county, state, and federal social services for the homeless in the county, save for very few in Watsonville. Add in the 40 plus NGOs, many on the government take providing services, plenty of Mexican heroin and meth, a culture and official sanction of tolerance, AKA lack of morals, enforcement of law, too brief revolving door of justice. And here we are flooded to the public breaking point with homeless heroin, meth addiction, crime, safety, health, and blight issues. Criminal homeless need to be given the choice of jail or jail with treatment, release and probationary supervision. It's a drug and mental health problem mostly, a too many just here problem that the rest of the citizen contributors don't deserve in these numbers. How many homeless services are in Aptos, Capitola, Socotel, Scotts Valley? Zero. How many homeless? 40. Not, uh, no one even bothered to count in Socotel or Aptos. It would be a waste of time. Any adding of homeless services invites and anchors more homeless here. It is the major cause of the concentration created over time by the government of the extreme too many homeless problems. Every next homeless service added should be outside the city limits, no exceptions, including the NGOs who come begging for funds to provide yet more service. Thank you, and please, if you don't, you can leave your uh, Hi, council members, I'm Paul Hodge. I'm a 40-year resident of Santa Cruz and a landowner. I think I have a, Concern about the location of the camp. I know we've got to do the camp and I know it's temporary, but I have a concern about the location of a camp, of the sleeping camps in a residential area where people are also sleeping. I like the idea of a camp in an area where people are not sleeping or residing near that camp at the same hours that the camp is active. So that's something to think about. I also like the temporary nature of it, that you're putting a six months on it, and I think it'd be good if you consider making it mandatory that you review it at the six months, not just automatically roll it over. That way you could look at the, any issues or bugs in the system. And um, finally, it would be good if once the camp is established that there would be able to be some kind of a triage, people that could go in and work with the people that have a drug addiction problem, which is, not a crime, it's a, an addiction problem, and work with the families and the individuals that can't afford the housing and help them get into some kind of housing programs so that there'd be some more one-on-one -on -one inside the camp. And I uh, commend you for taking on such a big problem because maybe we could be exemplary for the rest of the country in how we deal with our homeless crisis because we're not the only ones, so thank you. Hmm. <clears throat> 
Susan Worth, SoCal. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna be 70 April 3rd, matter of days, and I too would be homeless if my dad hadn't died and helped me with a trust. Uh, I live in a trailer in Soquel, and it's a 1972 trailer. Parts of it are uh, biodegrading rather quickly and flooding underneath and some other problems, dry rot. But um, at least I'm, I'm surviving. And it's because I was a waitress for almost 20 years. A lot of these people were waitresses. They made, I made $2 an hour. That went into my social security. That's why it's so low. And it gave me an interesting attitude about men. But nonetheless, um, <laughs> here I am. And I, I went to Penny U. I go to Penny U a lot on Monday with Paul Lee, who's 92 years old. And he's one of the people that set up the Pogo Nip. What is it, 640 acres, something like that. Anyway, a lot of acres, I'm bad with numbers. Uh, he set up the Pogo Nip 40 years ago. It celebrated its 40th anniversary just recently. And he says, we need to build some permanent housing right in the Pogo Nip. That's what he says, for people. He cares about people. A lot of people in this community do. We can't, we can't, keep just pushing these people around and making them feel like crap. They're already so depressed, just like Curtis said. I, I overheard him talking as I came up. <clears throat> these people are depressed, they've got issues. We need to help them in every way we possibly can. Please, now, thank you. Hi, City Council. Uh, my name is Pedro Castillo. I live in Baker Street. I want to thank you for the uh, help you guys have given us uh, for our neighborhood. And also, I want to thank you for all the work that you're doing. I know there's a real uh, hard issue. Um, there's a lot of people coming and coming. Uh, you know, move, uh, move and coming, don't move and coming. You know, it's all this going back and forth. Uh, I just hope that you guys do the, the best decision. And uh, um, I know it's a complex issue and, and it's hard to find a model that can work for uh, everything. Um, last thing Sunday, the uh, uh, Santa Cruz neighbors uh, sent out an email of a um, report that was done in homeless in Seattle. Um, and then, I mean, it was devastating to see the problem they have there. But also in the report, uh, it showed the, a model that Rhode Island is doing. Um, some people mentioned about you know the the uh, the um, tr uh, uh, medication treatment. So I think that there's there are other other things that can be looked at. So I was going to um, encourage you for and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Marina Eyer, and um, I have two two things. Um, I would love for our city council to have a, a long-term goal, a 10-year goal of how are we gonna get permanent housing for these people in need? Maybe a goal of 100 permanent subsidized housing with um, facilities, things available to them that we can slowly, slowly work on the homelessness problem. I feel like right now we are enabling drugs and we are just adding to the drug problem. We're giving needles, we're not giving housing. And right now, Santa Cruz, I was looking it up in one of the lists as of late, Santa Cruz is listed as the 22nd most dangerous city in California. Can we please make it a goal of our city council to make it one of the top 20 safest cities in California? It's such a wonderful city with so much heart and also to be a forerunner of caring for those in need instead of being a drug zone and asking for trans and, and just making it so easy for transients to come here to enable this drug addiction that oftentimes leads to death. I understand there's three de there were three deaths in the camp. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how they were caused, but if they were caused by overdose, I, I don't know. If, but if the city is handing out these needles, is the city gonna start to be liable for this? 
and or if children are stepping on needles that the city's handing out and they are sick, is the city gonna be liable? We're talking about all the liability and rights of these homeless, but what about our citizens and keeping them safe? My car was broken into last week. My carport had $1,500 um, things stolen. The person who stole it, the perpetrator stole our neighbor's car. He was found a week later, strung out, um, passed out in front of, sorry, I can't finish, but. You, you're welcome you. if you have comments, you're welcome to leave them. The drug exchange program with the needles is saving lives, period. Don't flood the neighborhoods, retrain, retain the Ross camp. Lynn Renshaw has proposed a solution in a generic email returned by many critics of the Ross camp. In it, she suggests the city meet the minimum, minimum, come on. Any person, if they're left out in the cold, then it's a failure pro program. You have to give shelter to everyone. If one person, who would it be? Who are you, how are you gonna change it? <laughs> Take the time to team with the county to use the $10 million, the heap of money grant and encourage the county to do their fair share. She in the form letter she uh, generated proposes amending the proposal so that shelters cannot be placed in parks, beaches, streets, and sidewalks without first requiring public and environmental review. <coughs> and how much are these permits going to cost? so that the public exemptions will require fully maintained, professionally staffed and secure shelter facilities. Perhaps so, but where will the folks that are shelterless be if they're driven out from the Ross camp? Which ones are going to survive and which ones are gonna die? And you're welcome if you'd like to leave your comments. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, I'm Greg Benson. I'm uh, a registered voter, resident of Santa Cruz, and I, uh, my home's in the Ross Camp, and I live in Reality, um, which is a place that people ought to uh, visit occasionally. And um, I do understand all sides of this. 20-sided coin, and um, it's not a pretty situation, but again, it's reality. And um, I do appreciate, I had some other things to say, but I spoke with uh, Fire Chief Hyduck, and um, reality happens, people are human. Um, I appreciate what uh, first responders, police, um, I, I appreciate when uh, city staff comes out, <coughs> meets with us, <coughs> um, city council members that I've talked to and those who I haven't. Um, and uh, <coughs> this is not easy, but we're not gonna go away too quickly, unfortunately. Um, it's an existential thing. We're not here just to uh, have a place to rest, a place to sleep we want to live and perhaps even eventually thrive, you know, and uh, self-actualize. And, um, and yeah, man, work. I've worked lots all over the world. And, um, but right now I'm in Santa Cruz and I would have just left, but when we're told to leave somewhere, um, I'm gonna stick around and uh, show what we do, <clears throat> those of us who have skills. But um, I do appreciate everything. Also, I want to, to say, hey, clean needles save lives, um, but uh, heroin sucks. Heroin sucks. Bye. I did on that last remark. Um, I've spent a lot of time reading about this issue. Oh, thank you. 
spent a lot of time reading about this issue because I just wanted to educate myself. I was starting to feel guilty about the whole thing. You know, here I am saying we should make these changes to better me, but I want to better everybody. So I kind of went through lots of articles and lots of videos. And one of the biggest takeaways that I got on it was that it's not simply a homeless problem, it's a chronically homeless problem. And almost everything that I read about, it has to do with drug addiction. Those are the people that are chronically homeless for the most part. Um, and unless we get them help, this isn't gonna change. So, um, and I don't think we're ever gonna fix the problem. I think it can be managed, but I don't think we'll ever get rid of it completely. So my proposal is, since you guys always want solutions, um, reopen bench lands so you can have everybody in one spot, Secondly is to think long term. And one place, I forget where it was, they actually had a lockdown facility for drug addicts that helped to get them clean, monitored them when they got out, helped them you know, achieve success in life, um, and otherwise they have to go to jail. And then the third thing is to give the police the ability to enforce the laws, because right now they're not enforcing the laws. So we don't feel safe if they were out there patrolling and doing their jobs, we would feel safer, but they can't. Their hands are tied because you're telling them not to arrest people. Don't even bother citing them because they just rip it up. Um, also, let's see. The, the site you have on Washington is directly adjacent to the soccer field, just so you know, lots of kids. Um, and one more thing, please stop freaking us out with your ill-conceived ideas because it stresses everybody I know out, including myself. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Council Elise Casby. I've spent the last 10 solid years investigating homeless in all different cities and different places. I want to say, please go forward with these very moderate solutions that serve to assist poor people in our community. Homeless people are poor people who lack housing and have little money to pay for housing. I am extremely dismayed and discouraged by the neighbors' descriptions of homeless people because these are lurid descriptions, mean descriptions, and yes, bigoted descriptions, but most of all, they are uninformed descriptions. These people with their lurid descriptions, their bigoted and uninformed descriptions are all self-described experts. Yes, do they know that 9% of the homeless people, according to Wikipedia several years ago, are victims of domestic violence, and that there are virtually no available transitional shelters for these women? If these people are so full of compassion, why have they not cared enough to build low-income housing for the 70% of Santa Cruz residents who are born here and or grew up here, who became homeless here because of escalating rents, lack of affordable housing, housing and low-income housing. These figures are from the September 2014 Association of Communities uh, and Smart Solutions Conference, county and city, city officials, Don Lane, and many other homeless advocates. Please check the 2014-2015 Grand Jury Final Report, Recipe for Failure, et cetera, et cetera. If these people who care so much with their hate-filled descriptions of people experiencing homeless, why for the past 30 years have these same people, these neighbors, not cared more about massive war budgets, increasing weapons trades around the world in the millions, and the creation of cluster bombs that children pick up because they look like toys, I have heard, a fraction of which could go into solving our homeless and mental health issues. These neighbors are not caring. These neighbors have come out in force tonight because they are bigoted and they want to make sure that we keep the status quo. I'll go ahead and remind the community that as everybody speaks, they have their time without interruption. Go ahead, you'll have to. I appreciate one of the previous speaker's comments about lumping the many and varied problems being experienced by our homeless population altogether. Every one of those people has a story and not knowing the details is what prevents us from helping them address their particular challenges. Unfortunately, Council's recent focus on enacting emergency declarations sought in order to speed through policy changes that avoid public review and the typical vetting that occurs under established procedures is troubling. The idea that housing, mental health, and addiction challenges are actually emergent by any definition ignores the past four decades of questionable decision-making here in our community. 
Having said that, I think most reasonable people would agree that for those individuals struggling to be housed, circumstances in Santa Cruz could hardly be worse. And while these individuals are struggling, so too are the vast majority of our community population that have to live with the constant theft, disoriented behavior, environmental degradation, disease vectors, and occasional violence, not to mention the not an inconsiderable cost of hosting, maintaining, protecting, and supervising the housing challenged. In my opinion, shelters, safe sleeping sites, and or encampments should never be seen as an acceptable end state no matter the circumstances of those who occupy them. They should similarly never be self-governing nor anonymous. They should be focused on triage only and our efforts as a community should be focused on what comes after the shelter. And that means more permanent housing, lots of it, and many different types, including supportive communities and means-tested deed-restricted homes. We all need to be clear this problem is decades old and will not be solved quickly. We shouldn't be trying to enact ill-conceived solutions based on a loosely defined set of objectives. Let's make Make shelters of any kind unnecessary. Thank you. Josh Stevens here. I am just here to say whatever you guys do, you, you, you got to act fast because this problem's just getting out of hand. And I'm not even talking about the campsites. I'm not even talking about like all these issues that everyone else is uh, talking about. I'm talking about the basic facts that is housing. It's housing. It's the huge equation of this problem here and like, for example, my one of my neighbors, they don't, um, they basically have to decide, oh, what bill do we pay, do we scrap together this month? What bill do we scrap together next month? And it's just like that paycheck to paycheck life. And then boom, one of the housemates gets out on disability because, uh, and then all of a sudden, it's just, it's a struggle here. It's a struggle to make it out here. And, that's the, he, just don't lose focus of that matter. In fact, I understand that that is the platform in which some of our city leaders have ran on. So I look forward to seeing what gets done in that regards. And I really hope that something gets done before, um, our, before we lose community, because that's, what, that's the main part of this all, why we're here today, to build our community. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kenny. Um, I was thinking about shelter. When I think of shelter, I mean, got a roof over the top. And uh, so after the earthquake, the city of Santa Cruz put up uh, tents, and I think they were in the parking lots. And uh, so my thought would be like the Kaiser Arena, that structure if we made some small ones, you could put them in a parking lot. Like um, at uh, Front and Laurel, it would look just like the arena. How many people? It'd be about the size of this building. You could get 30, 40 people in there to sleep. Now, I know a lot of people don't want government to get in their face. So we got $10 million to use. We could experiment with some kind of structure where they don't have to sleep in a tent. The other part is I've gone into those bathrooms and they got the little urinal right here and then the lady's got to sit right, right next to that thing. Why don't we build a building where people could go in and not look at what is in there, you know? We could help them out. I don't think you guys can do it right away, but I think we would look at actually getting a building. Now that might bring more people in, so be it. Yeah. Hey, thanks for listening to me, I appreciate it. I'll just, I'd like to get a sense of how many more members of the community would like to address us on this issue. Okay. Okay, so you'll be our last speaker. Okay, go ahead. Yes, 
Uh, thanks, City Council, for your time and attention to this. Um, my name is Mike Iyer. I've been here in Santa Cruz for about 10 years. We came to Santa Cruz um, because we love everything about Santa Cruz, obviously, like most of us, the, the ocean, uh, the mountains, um, the community. And <clears throat> I have a lot of compassion uh, for, for solving this issue, and it's a difficult one that we're not going to solve tonight, obviously. I just want to point out, as several other people have pointed out, that I, I feel like it's really difficult to attack the homelessness because as we all know there, and I'm not putting everyone into this group, I promise, I know that every story, every story is different, but there is a lot of drug use. I think that we can all agree to that. And I think that we also typically say illegal drug use or illegal drugs, and I have a difficult time explaining to my children why drugs are illegal, but then they're not illegal, I guess. Or I mean, they're confused because we're, we don't enforce illegal drug use. And I feel like until we tackle that problem, we're not gonna be in a position to tackle the homeless problem because if we build a lot, a lot more homeless camps, I think that we all understand that there's a lot of people that'll come to this area because it's a great area and we have lax policies on drug use and we'll get a lot of people that'll come to this area that'll want to that'll be drug users. And so if we can't crack down on, the, on, on enforcing drug use, illegal drug use, I remind you, I don't know how we can attack this problem of homelessness. We're just gonna perpetuate it, in my opinion. Um, I'd love to see us do everything we can to continue to make this city great. And I really want us to find a solution that works for everyone, but I also just really want us to focus on the component of this. Is, I know it's just a, a portion, a percentage of it, but that is illegal drug use. And really think about if we can, we can put a, a attention there and efforts there to, to make this a central part of this discussion. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Ross Newport. I know quite a few of actually, you actually. I work at Community Printers. Um, I work over at Community Printers. Uh, we've had a lot of homeless people hanging out around the shop. Two weeks ago, a guy came in at seven o'clock into the back room of the shop and stole my $3,000 bike. Two years ago, I went into the hospital, got really sick, uh, was told I had to change my life. I got that bike and I've loved it. Every day I've ridden that bike. I've started to get better from, uh, uh, from having it. There were security camera footage, so I was able to see pictures of the person who stole it, went on to Mugshot Santa Cruz, identified who the guy was, talked to the police about it, and they're pursuing him right now, uh, but was able to determine that he's cited a lot at the homeless camp by Ross. I printed up a flyer, $500 reward for my bike, uh, and started walking around the camp. You walk around with a flyer for a $500 reward, you get a lot of attention there. So I talked to a lot of people, I went around and realized that not only is the guy who stole my bike living there, but that there's multiple chop shops that are there. Multiple people running criminal enterprises on a site that is essentially sanctioned by the city. Uh, I ended up finding the guy. Okay, go ahead and continue, you, without interruption, go ahead. All right. I ended up finding the guy at the camp wearing my jacket. I confronted him about it. He took off the jacket, gave it back to me, told me that in order to get my bike back, he needed $60. I said there was no way I was getting the $60 to get my bike. He walked in back into the camp over toward the area where the chop shops are, which is in the far end, kind of by the River Street and freeway intersection, and um, came back about 10 minutes later your time is up. Your time is up. Okay. And you're you, you welcome to email you, the counts. Yeah. Well, yes. Thank you. Your yeah. And your time is up now. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker. Good evening. Congratulations on your seat. I wanted to be a California State Assemblywoman back in when I was 30 years old, uh, but CPS made sure that I. My family was destroyed and there's a lot of children coming out of foster care that are homeless. But uh, what this gentleman said back here, drug addiction and alcoholism doesn't run just in the homeless community. It runs 
in the rich families as well as the middle class and poor families. So it's a problem and it's a problem everywhere. Um, I, I was listening to KSCO radio and there was a gentleman on by the name of Steve Plage or something. He mentioned that this county got $10 million. Okay. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And it should not just go into your salaries and pocketbooks and the pocketbooks, the salaries of the mental health building, as well as the um, uh, homeless shelters to, to pay them. That's enough money where this county could find a building. There's so many, do you know how many buildings out here are empty because businesses have left and closed down? And every, I drive, I do food delivery for a living. So as I drive around the city, I see all these empty buildings. And so I don't understand why this, you y'all can't try to find a building to use it for the homeless. And the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, um, so as I drive around and do my food delivery business, I've been noticing the Santa Cruz police and the Santa Cruz sheriffs harassing and and um, <laughs> giving the homeless people tickets. Now, they know darn well that your they can't pay your these tickets and they'll eventually up. end Thank up in you. jail. Your time is up. And okay. so, your they, time you know, they do that so they can okay, get paid. Your, your time is up. Your <laughs> next speaker. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and have the two uh, folks here in the front and then uh, one more uh, speaker, and those will be our last three speakers. So after you, go ahead. Mayor Watkins, council members, I'm Maggie Ivey. Um, my heart is really breaking for this community. I've lived here for about 24 years. It's a good-hearted, compassionate community. It's a difficult conversation. A speaker earlier urged you to vote for solutions, but I think it's really hard to vote for a solution when we don't agree on the problem or really even acknowledge the problem. It seems that we're conflating different issues. We have a housing issue, absolutely, no argument about that. But the Ross Camp is not a housing issue. The Ross Camp is a result, is a symptom of a pervasive and chronic drug problem in our community. And we've all watched it grow over the years. And it's a sad situation. It's a disease addiction, and like many of you in my family, we've experienced that. But in this community, I think there's a fine line between compassion and enabling, and we have to be really careful about how we move forward. We need our leaders, leaders to acknowledge what the problem is, and I wish so much tonight that instead of looking at adopting a revised shelter crisis declaration, we were talking about a drug crisis declaration. I, last night, spent my evening watching uh, Seattle is Dying, and I cried, because that's where our community is going. Perhaps we're already there. But if we can't agree on what the problem is, we cannot solve it with compassion. Thank you. Okay. Are you, okay. All right, so then the, the following four are our last speakers. Go ahead. Um, I, I'm not sure, I mean, I've heard this kind of circling around areas as a consideration, but I was wondering, about Poganip as a possible place uh, to have a camp. Um, and I guess I see that sort of from the camps uh, that I've seen, kind of the Benchlands and then, um, you know, Ross Camp right now. Uh, it's kind of hard in sort of those transient areas to actually establish a community, which might actually be a bit at the core of a lot of these issues. Um, I am, cannot call myself a drug addict, but I can only imagine if you don't feel you're part of a community uh, there's not really going to be a lot of uh, a takeoff point for that. Um, and Poganip is a beautiful place. And I think uh, the more people sort of participate beyond, I guess, like the, the, the church is bringing food and amenities and that sort of thing, uh, we could also make sure that there's efforts to uh, do as much cleanup as possible. Because uh, if I have hope in anything about Santa Cruz, it's 
the ability to get people to volunteer out of the spirit of keeping Santa Cruz green uh, definitely kind of seems like the, sp the spirit of the city. So um, that's, yeah, I don't know. I guess I have 45 seconds, but that's pretty much it. Hi, I'm Abby. I'm wondering how many people, I just got here, so I haven't heard a lot what was said, but I'm wondering how many people that are, that wish the Ross camp would go away have actually spent time at the camp. Um, I actually just came from the camp. I didn't realize this would still be going, otherwise I would have come here to make sure that none of the tents have been moved or taken down because I heard that there's been uh, signs put on some of the tents. Um, so I spent a lot of time there over this weekend. I was there Saturday and Sunday. I am willing to sleep there. I go there alone. I went there at night on Sunday night. I don't feel afraid. I think there's a whole fear, Margaret. I wish you could all go there and see it was so peaceful, so quiet on Saturday, Sunday. Yes, there's drug use. I doubt it if it's more than 50%. I think Dr. Left said it was less than 50%. I'm wondering, um, well, let me just put it this way. If I was out there for more than a week, I would definitely have heroin as my drug of choice. And the way the people treat the people that are in the camp, I would either go insane or probably take heroin. So the, the thing is, there is the, the compassion is bullshit. You wanna kick them out of the camp, but yet you don't want them anywhere. So you want them to disappear? That, that's, yes, that's exactly what, and you heard a yes there. So that's exactly, that's not gonna happen. That's really not gonna happen. So we, we need some solutions. We need low barrier and we need high barrier. We need all types of solutions. Oh, I can speak longer because Martina's in here. I can get in my whole sentence. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham, and uh, I believe you should adopt the revised shelter crisis declaration. Um, there's a lot of people out there that don't understand what you're doing with that and don't realize that the one that's already in place gives you the same powers they're afraid this new one's gonna give you. So uh, I don't see any reason why not adopt this because it clears up some of the language that the other one had kind of muddied. Um, if you look at the fourth whereas in that resolution, where it talks about the people that are affected by homelessness, the uh, children, adolescents, elderly, and disabled people, that's a national disgrace. It doesn't just happen here in Santa Cruz, it's happening nationwide. And it's a national disgrace that we have elderly people, we have handicapped people, we have children, we have adolescents that are homeless in this country. We're the most powerful, richest country in the world and we can't even take care of the people that are here. It's a disgrace. So. We need to do something, and if passing this resolution will be a first step, I think you need to do that. Secondly, I think that you need to look closely at programs in the past, do a cost-benefit analysis to see where money is best spent, where it actually gets to the people that, are, that need the help instead of being eaten up by administration cost, overhead cost, faculty, you know, facility cost, all that kind of stuff. Where, where the money really gets to the people and can be put to best use. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Norris, you'll be our last speaker. Go ahead. Anybody else want to speak? Okay. Um, okay, we've had a lot of organized nimbyism, drug war hysteria, needle mania, and then fantasies of uh, 
housing, what we really have is a permanent reality of homelessness. Now, what have we got here? We have uh, an alternate shelter pilot program in order for the Roths camp to close or be significantly reduced, because that's what this is really all about, get rid of that Ross camp. That's the answer, you see, that, that everyone is here for and that this council is playing with. And that is an important consideration. Uh, that is to say, the Ross camp really is an important place for people. It's an emergency survival shelter encampment that was encouraged by police, rangers, and social services. The staff's pilot program is far too small and limited. It doesn't deal with the people who are gonna be in the Ross camp, much less the broader homeless population. Even with the Laurel Street Shelter, the 7th Avenue Shelter, the 1220 Barbed Wire, Boneyard, River Street Shelter reopened, and the 50 person safe sleeping, or oh, no, let's not have a transitional campground, that would be too radical. <laughs> if it's actually available on April 17th, none of these all together will be effective for dealing with that. So what are we really talking about? It's a fantasy that these two city manager staff people are talking about. And this is gonna ignore whether folks will actually go to the location that punishes addicts, establishes curfews, and treats residents as prisoners or unruly children. Others will provide documentation that the staff's proposal, while tailored to please the fearful, simply doesn't pass the straight face test ignoring real numbers. The alternative on April 17th is now gonna to be to flood the neighborhoods and the green belts with individuals camping alone or in groups that lack community protection and support. The council must return to its wise decision February 26th to eliminate the Ross Camp closing date. You can't do it unless you have the shelter. You can't do it legally, you can't do it sensibly. And it's just, it's gonna antagonize the very people in this audience that you're concerned with. And please move that resolution, council. Okay, your time is up. Okay. So, okay. All right, we'll go ahead and bring it back for action and del deliberation. It was brought to my attention that um, we wanted to have a, re a response from our city staff in terms of some new information, so please. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, the Director of Planning and Community Development, and wanted to um, also add for your consideration some of the permitting processes associated with the three sites that have been recommended, as the, particularly the timing associated with those may help to inform the decisions that you make this evening. So um, there are multiple options by which we can approve uh, these, um, uh, safe sleeping sites, and um, the first um, would be through, if it's located on a public park, the parks director could revise the hours of the park and um, authorize uh, this use. That would be no hearing. And I, I should mention, you know, we're, we're exp we would explore any of these as the most expeditious way, so just the options to consider. Uh, the second would be a special event permit could be issued um, with various conditions that also would not have a hearing. The third would be there's a potential for an administrative or a special use permit. Um, and that, um, depending on whether it's an administrative or a special use permit, could start with the zoning administrator um, without a hearing, but then could be appealed to the planning commission and then that could be appealed to the council. In terms of the timing associated with that, that is that approach um, would benefit from the additional text that was added into the um, emergency shelter declaration crisis that said, bring these things directly to the council because that appeal process can take some time. And so to expedite that, if we were taking the route of an administrative or special use permit, the additional language in that emergency shelter crisis um, would be beneficial for our, from a timing perspective. And finally, the fourth thing that needs to be considered is the uh, coastal zone. There are two of the properties in the coastal zone and whether or not they would have to go through a coastal permit or an, uh, a coastal exclusion. So on the Jesse Street March, um, we could look at the parks director revising the hours. We could look at uh, a special event permit um, with various conditions. Um, and we could look at an administrative or special use. The, the thing that um, could create some additional time on the Jesse Street March uh, and the East Cliff Drive project as it's um, uh, identified here is that the Coastal Commission has direct permit authority on that site. So either we would have two options, we would go through the Coastal Commission for a um, coastal permit or the council could direct uh, us to, through that emergency shelter declaration 
crisis uh, uh, direct us to circumvent that process and proceed. So that would be the, the council's direction. Um, uh, and that site is doable. We, as Bonnie mentioned before, we were looking at the higher ground away from the marsh area, but there's still permitting uh, challenges associated with that, um, depending on the route that we take, particularly if we go through the Coastal Commission, it could take some, some longer, uh, a longer time period. Um, on lot 24, north of Depot Park, um, a special event permit could be issued, um, uh, no hearing for that. An administrative or special use permit could, um, could also be utilized. Um, and for this one, while it's in the coastal zone, we would likely qualify for an exclusion. And so that would not necessarily add to the time associated with the permitting for that. And then finally, uh, the San Lorenzo Park site, um, the parks director would have the option um, or a special event permit could be used. Um, we could also go the administrative or special use permit route. Um, and this is outside of the coastal zone, so no coastal permit would be needed. Um, it is, um, we would be looking at the San Lorenzo Park Urban River Management Plan to evaluate how it's best conforming to to that and making sure that we're protecting the and the uh, resources that we have, environmental resources in close proximity. And Bonnie mentioned many of these sites have various constraints. I just wanted to sort of highlight some of the permitting um, steps and the timing associated with those as that may help inform the deliberations. Thank you. Okay, we'll return it back for uh, council action. Vice Mayor Penrose. I'm prepared to make a motion on the um, declaration of a um, shelter crisis. Okay. Are you only prepared to make a motion on that portion of the yeah. agenda? Yes, just that portion. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and make that motion at sure. this time? Sure. Yeah. Um, given the fact that some of these, well, not the scenarios presented to us today, but in other circumstances, that there might be um, negative environmental impacts that should be assessed, and for those reasons, among others, that the proposal of some of these camps should go through planning process. I'm prepared to take no action on this item at this point in time with regards to declaring and updating the shelter crisis declaration. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a motion to um, not pursue the updated uh, shelter declaration crisis by Vice Mayor Cummings. Is there a second? I'll go ahead and second that. Um, I, I too uh, wanted to uh, also think about how I'll second it for the reasons that I think you already alluded to, and also how if we're moving forward in a, with the two by two, with um, and in concert with the county, how are we uh, taking the time to look at alignment in terms of strategies? So um, I would like to take that time personally. So that's sort of the direction I'm in. Councilmember Brown and then Council. For this, can I get some clarification? Um, the motion is to take no action. Is the motion to defer this to a future date or just? Drop it. To leave it as is, is what my understanding. So to leave it the, the it current is. shelter crisis as is, the current declaration that we have in place as is. Councilman uh, Matthews. I was actually prepared to uh, support the revised declaration with additional changes having to do with the required permitting process. Um, uh, making it clear that any exemptions would be only for uh, fully managed, staffed, and secure facilities, and um, uh, amending the declaration um, uh, expressly to involve the county, and also uh, that it would remain in effect um, only for one year unless renewed by a council. Um, I would like to know from staff um, what benefits they see from uh, or what the implications would be from uh, staying with the existing resolution declaration. Uh, as I understand it, that would make it hard to move forward with what we're planning. I, I think the predominant difference between the two is that language that <coughs> Director Butler referenced about expediting the process. Mm -hmm. So absent that, um, depending on what site Council selects, we will have to um, look at the normal trajectory of reviews and go through those normal processes. So that will delay, most likely, or could delay, um, could, thank you, could delay um, the ability to activate that site and open that up for a safe sleeping program and close down the gateway encampment. 
So that was the one piece we felt actually helped hasten the ability to get something before a public hearing at council and um, get it open as quickly as possible. Council uh, if, oh, if, if I could just follow up. I mean, we did vote um, just at our last meeting to um, uh, reaffirming our intention to close the uh, Ross encampment and I support that. I support our move to uh, um, close that camp and find alternative um, and safer uh, options for those who are currently there. Um, so I do support the idea of moving towards uh, a small pilot, limited, secure, <laughs> managed, uh, safe sleeping and storage option um, as the necessary uh, component for closing down the Ross camp. Um, so again, I'm gonna ask uh, if we did not move forward with an amendment to um, move any permitting process directly to city council that would uh, um, discard the target date that we had previously set for um, closing the Ross camp. Am I correct in that? So uh, it depends on the site that you um, kind of rises to the top in terms of council consideration. So as Director but Butler mentioned, each site has different constraints in terms of permitting and process and timeline. So one thing that the council may consider in your deliberations is to get a little further along as to that site selection process so we can think about the shelter declaration within the context of the requirements to move forward quickly with that site rather than um, kind of deliberating on that at this point. But yes, there is potential that we would it would move that April 17th date um, either somewhat or significantly, depending on the process. Can I, can I just, and then I'll, I'm sorry, I'll go ahead. And, I just wanted to get a quick clarification on that, because, but the, but the um, <coughs> assumption is, is that the uh, recommendations by the two by two with the additional bed space of uh, 60, in addition to the increased capacity, is not gonna be sufficient, but we don't quite know that, essentially, is that correct? And no. that's why the additional site is necessary? Or is that the assumption? So the assumption is that we need those additional 50 beds. So we need 100 beds. That is the current assumption. So we will be further evaluating the current census, the sleeping census at the encampment um, with the help of the, counts, the camp council. But the current assumption based on our best knowledge to date is that the 100 beds is what we should be striving for. Councilman. Thank you. Can I just get some clarification on the language here? Because the vice mayor alluded to the issue of the potential need for environmental review, but from your presentation and from the struck language here, it can you remind me as to the removal of the two paragraphs at the bottom of page three that specifically remove the specifications that CEQA could be taken out? Am, am I reading that wrong? Yeah, so those, those ones? Right here, yeah. Right. So I have it up on the screen and there are two companion um, whereas clauses earlier in the declaration. So here again, this was, the, there's a very different voice with the existing shelter crisis declaration in this one. The first one was based on uh, the city of Santa Rosa. This one was based on a legal document produced by the city of San Diego. And it had this stronger language. But our sense in that reviewing the situation, um, reviewing, hearing the feedback about what people thought that this might portend, that it actually wasn't necessary. That that we would, we would have regular channels where we could do evaluation or have exemptions, especially because these are temporary uses. So we thought, well, this probably isn't a tool that we would need to flex. And because it did give rise to concerns in the community, we thought it best to, to strike it out. So there would need to be environmental reviews because of the concern that it was causing within the community based off of this language? I just want to get a clarity on that. Uh, not necessarily. Again, this just depends on the site. And, um, you know, this is where we're working so quickly. I, I do offer our apologies to the council week over week. I mean, it, it's every day we're exploring new dimensions and it's not normally done this quickly. So we don't have everything fully um, explained. But as Director Butler outlined, we actually do have a few different permitting pathways as well. So I also want to kind of uh, append my, my answer of a moment ago about what would the existing shelter crisis be missing and marry it with your question. Um, we could have, we can modify hours and parks. 
by the Parks and Rec Director. We could issue a special event permit. And we do have a precedent for this. When there was the Occupy demonstration in San Lorenzo Park, a special event permit was issued for that. Um, I, I think what this really hinges on is the temporary use. So really, if we're just thinking 30 days, which is what um, was proposed here, I think we're in a very different, um, very different, um, class of review. It, it, it is a, a very much a temporary use, and I don't know if Director Butler wants to add anything else about um, environmental review, but I think that we we can operate, and I don't think there'd be a high level of review. Okay. I'm looking at the city attorney, too. Anything else? Otherwise, I have one more question. No, that's, that's right. Um, Statement, right. <clears throat> the language that was originally drafted was <laughs> intentionally very sweeping, and we realized after talking it over further and listening to comments from council members and from members of the public that there were there were paths by which we could establish temporary um, shelter programs and facilities um, that would entail uh, conducting some environmental review but would likely fall under um, different categorical exemptions and so would not uh, become a, a long drawn out process to evaluate in accordance with the requirements of CEQA. Thanks, and I know uh, the, the intention is not to have to use it, but the ability to potentially use it if we need to, to be able to move as quickly as possible and understanding the timeline that we're under and the severe situation that people are experiencing on the street, the impact that neighbors are having with regards to issues in their communities, uh, I'm going to then make a substitute motion to adopt the revised shelter declaration. Second. Okay, substitute motion um, by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crown. Okay, so then we'll go ahead and vote on the substitute motion at this time. Is that correct or further discussion? Whether to accept the substitute motion. Okay, we'll give a vote to whether to accept the substitute motion. Um, does that allow for amendments to the substitute motion once it's considered? Yeah, I, I believe so. Yes. Okay. Okay, all those in favor and support of the substitute motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. 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 Aye. Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Matthews in support. Councilmember Myers, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself against. So the substitute motion is on the floor to approve the resolution with the modifications that I believe will be suggested by Councilmember. I would Matthews. like to add um, some potential um, amendments to that. Uh, one would be, uh, let me find them. Um, that uh, shelters not be placed in parks, beaches, streets, and sidewalks without first requiring a public permit process. The next would be um, amending the declaration so it only allows public exemptions for fully managed, professionally staffed, and secure shelter facilities. The amendment, the declaration be amended so it expressly requests the county supervisors create shelter locations. Um, I, I would amend that, uh, create um, shelter or other um, homeless service locations outside the city and have the county bear its fair share of the um, responsibility for serving the homeless population. And finally, the, the declaration remain in effect for one year unless renewed by council. Are those amendments? Uh... So three, four, and five, I believe I can accept. I just need more clarity on one and two. If only you had. So maybe part four. four. Had, <laughs> okay, so did, so maybe part one. four had one, two parts. Where, where two. One is that. They're over there. Can we see them? Amending the declaration so that shelters cannot be placed in parks, beaches, streets, and sidewalks without first requiring a public permit process. Okay, so I'm just unclear as to what a public permit process entails. Could you, or Director Butler, clarify? I would say that would just have to be, um, uh, and, and I should say in that, uh, that that public review process could be handled directly by the city council rather than going through the lower um, planning processes. I can accept that. And the second one, I'm sorry. Amending the declaration so it only allows public exemptions um, of various requirements and standards uh, for fully managed, professionally staffed, and secure shelter facilities. 
So with that, uh, because transitional encampment models have the aspect of self-governance, but are overseen by a professional nonprofit and each of the volunteers goes through a specific uh, and certified kind of training program that allows them to volunteer for four hours a week, which creates that community. And what we heard from the uh, different members of the community with regards to the drug addiction issue, uh, if you ask the majority of drug addiction specialists, one of the main is solutions to drug addiction is the feeling of connection and community. So, uh, and working away from isolation and kind of uh, marginalization. So I think that having the ability for camp residents eventually to be able to participate in some kind of a functionary role at the camp is important and essential. So if that's taken out by only professional paid, whatever the staff description you had it, then that'll be, uh, I won't be able to accept that. But I wanna clarify so to make sure maybe we're on the same page. Okay. Apparently not. Okay, Councilmember Brown? So I will put another way, would self-governance of some sort and engagement be precluded assuming there is a managed, an operator that's managing the site? This is a question for Council Member Matthews. This language requires fully managed and professionally staffed. And I should also say that it will have gone through a permit process and there will be conditions of approval for a permit. I'm just trying to understand the distinction because I, I, I don't uh, see how those two is mutually exclusive. Well, I am not in favor of a self-managed facility. Okay. Okay, Councilor Butler. Yeah, I just want to clarify that it's not self-managed because it's managed by a nonprofit, but there is responsibilities given to the volunteers in order to be able to stay at the facility. So it requires buy-in and participation. So essentially, if I'm understanding everybody correctly, that there is an understanding of uh, a professional uh, staff managing the camp. Yes. Okay. Is that? But the inclusion of volunteer participation from with new participants for inclusion. Because then I can accept it. Anything in the world can have volunteers. I'm concerned about professional management. But that's a part. That's a concern. That's, that's part of it. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Does that work? Okay. Okay, I, ac so that, I can accept those. Do you accept those as well as the seconder of the motion, Council Member Brown? I, have, I had a question about, um, oh. Is there, is there language that we can put in there that does codify or make sure that there is gonna be an element of self-governance within the camp? I think that as it comes up before us for deliberation, we can decide on that within the permitting process of the camp and facility, and then the group can decide. I had a question for uh, Councilmember Matthews. When you said ha have county bear its fair share, what, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean we're just asking them or we're... Um, can't force them to do anything. Right. We are in a two by two process. Yeah. We're, we're not gonna not do something no. because they're not gonna do something, right? Okay. Okay. okay, so it appears that the friendly amendments proposed by Councilmember Matthews have been accepted by the uh, maker of the motion, the seconder of the motion. Okay, so we'll go ahead and vote on that and then move on to the additional items before us. And I've been trying to capture what I'm hearing. I don't know, is it down there on the TV in front of you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to, does this sound, I haven't gotten the third. So be it further resolved that no shelter may be placed in parks, beaches, streets, and sidewalks without first requiring public review. And permitting process. Public review. And permitting process. And permitting process, thank you. Um, um, <clears throat> be it further resolved that shelters must be fully managed and professionally staffed and secure. And I didn't catch the end of that dialogue. How was this? I, I, I think what they landed on is when it comes for the permitting process that um, elements around self-governance would be considered within those conditions. As a component of professionally yeah. run. Yeah. So services. let me just uh, amplify a bit. Uh, Without first requiring public review and permitting process with conditions of approval to be handled uh, directly at the city council level. And then um, the final was be further resolved that the County of Santa Cruz is requested. Um, was there a, a, a freight ways that you, a way that you phrase that? Um, amend the declarations uh, expressly requesting that the county board of the county of Santa Cruz 
um, uh, create or locate homeless serving facilities outside the city limits and bear its fair responsibility. services. Again, this is just a Dr. statement Hyatt, of city what we've already expressed. And, and uh, bear their fair share. And bear share. its fair um, responsibility of um, meeting the needs of the homeless population. Fair of the responsibility. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Fair share. It's within the apostrophe S. Yes. So of the homeless community? Okay, I want to see what typos do I have. Popul population is there what I said, but yeah, I think Councilmember Glover yeah. said that. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Myers, was there also a term? Yes. Yeah. Excuse oh, wow. me. You're right. Yeah. That the declaration remain in effect for one year unless renewed by council. That's a change to some oh, other one language. Year. There is language in the revised one that says it remains in force until terminated. Until terminated. Okay. This, this gives a sunset. <coughs> we won't need it. Yeah. No, no. Vice Mayor Cummings? An extension of and another um, friendly amendment to the declaration. Oh, is it somewhere else in there? Okay. Um, which would state that we had further resolved that the city initiate a process for collecting demographic information necessary to the process of developing a sustainable and outcome-based homeless policy, including such information as may relate to the work history, residence and life history, family, criminal history, eligibility for government or private support, disabilities, special needs, and other relevant data related to the individuals to be served in the described shelters and facilities. Said information, I can email this to you as well. Said information shall be confidential as to the subject individual to whom it relates, but shall be made aggregated and made available to the city council, city staff, and the public at large in a format that does not identify the individuals to whom it relates. So the idea being that we're able to capture information on the people who are coming in and out of the camps, um, understanding, um, different aspects of their history so that we can better provide them the best resources possible and also understand whether or not, um, given the fact that some people in the community are concerned with um, people who may be sex offenders at the camps or have some history, um, that that information be collected as well so that we know more about the people who are serving at the camps. Okay, we have a, a friendly amendment by Vice Mayor Cummings. It, it looks like a question by Council Member Brown. I have a question as well. I mean. okay. Hi, um, Vice Mayor Cummings, I understand where you're uh, coming from and potentially going with that um, that friendly amendment. I'm just wondering if a resolution is the place to direct this action because the resolution would be kind of a blanket um, statement, whereas this is this is requesting some information gathering that we and I think we can do that outside of the resolution itself. Um, so I just don't know. Maybe staff, you can suggest what you know, how, to, yeah. how best to address yeah, that. I, I believe we've been directed to do this already. Already, already. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. two yeah. meetings ago, this was part of, I believe the February 26th meeting. Uh, I believe it was at the last meeting. Thank you, March 4th. Um, and it really was around the the needs assessment, gap analysis, really understanding the, demo sorry, the demographic that we're serving, not to the level of specificity that Vice Mayor Cummings provided, but I think we could use that language in further defining Defining the process for which we'll get to um, what we're what we might be calling a shelter feasibility study or kind of a gap analysis in terms of who who we're serving and how best to serve them. So just to follow up, uh, what would the appropriate uh, action be for us to ensure that that language is included in the previous, you know, in further direct so some further direction about that? How how would we do that? No, if we do, we do you think we need a motion? Councilmember Matthews, and then. Yeah, that may be an idea yeah. on that. I think, yeah, um, as a directive for all of that, that's extremely specific and you have to figure out the capacity to collect that information. I think the general direction was given previously. Um, certainly, 
some sort of information gathering could be part of a permitting process. The conditions of approval could be for operations and um, gathering of information on well, individuals served. Yeah, so I think maybe we're talking about two distinct right. things. What I heard Vice Mayor Cummings talking about was more of looking generally at our at our population at large and understanding the current conditions for which um, if we have unsanctioned camp encampments, notwithstanding the gateway encampment, that we have a better understanding of who is that population and how best to serve them. That is definitely part of this, what we um, will be taking to the two by two in terms of a needs assessment and better understanding that. As it relates to indiv individual programs, certainly we can have that kind of more data-driven analysis of how best to serve the clients that we're trying to attract and have that discussion with the council as we um, consider permits. Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, does that? I'd just like to say for the, uh, just one more comment on this and the, um, the reason why this is being suggested is because of the fact that if this comes up again in the future, when we have to declare another shelter crisis, that this be incorporated in, so it is a part of the process when we begin to move forward. Um, but I'd be ha if the, if staff is already moving forward with this, I'd be happy to um, um, remove my friendly amendment at this point in time. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, have uh, the record reflect that the friendly amendment was withdrawn at this point. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Crown. <coughs> Just wondering, uh, how is that information collected? Uh, that sounds like a tall order. What um, Vice Mayor put out there, and who who is are we, are we um, contracting with somebody to come in and collect this information? So that that th those questions have not been resolved yet. So um, the process for which I would imagine this to take pl place is the county is has already entered into a contract with a consulting firm that's doing a systems analysis with regard to homelessness service in the county. We are engaging with the county on whether um, this analysis could be added to their current scope. If that is not the case, we would have to return to council with some direction as to hiring a, cons a consultant to, to do this work. Okay, so we um, have a motion on the floor uh, by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crone, with the incorporation of Councilmember Matthews' um, information. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 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 Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Crone, Glover um, in support, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Myers, and myself voting against. Okay. Councilmember Glover. I'd like to move on the staff recommendation to direct the city manager to implement a small scale safe sleeping and storage program as well as selecting a site. Okay. I'm gonna second that, but I wanted to ask what the difference was between the um, any, uh, a small scale safe sleeping and storage versus the encampment. What, what, what is a small scale safe sleeping and storage? Where does that happen? Wait, I'm sorry, where does that happen? Yeah, what, what is it? Uh, so um, maybe we could return to the slide that talks about the distinction between the two. So it, it it's um, virtually the same as a transitional encampment with regard to the population that we're trying to serve, the, um, the amount of capacity that we're talking about. So uh, we were provided direction last week to provide sites for up to 50 individuals. Um, in terms of rules of conduct and how those programs would be managed, we would expect, and especially based on today's conversation, to have them professionally managed by a nonprofit or quite frankly, the city um, would also have to be um, part of that conversation in terms of us again going into the business of operating a shelter. Um, so one of those two um, bodies would be moving forward with the oper operations. The distinction between safe sleeping and transitional encampments is really the time of day for which people would be expected to be on the facility. The um, safe sleeping is really a dust to dawn program, say 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. and then people would be expected to vacate the, the area um, and then come back later uh, the, that next evening. Um, in terms of the rules of conduct, they would be very similar between the two. The distinction um, also is that safe sleeping, although there are some programs that I've done, seen in my research where there is some level of self-governance, it would be a fully professionally managed program. Um, we would, um, based on actually council direction from several meetings ago, um, security would be required. Um, and in addition to that, it really is, um, you know, intended to be accessible by foot 
day, day to day for folks and then also be fully flexible in terms of who we are allowing in as long as they're um, adhering to those rules of conduct. Where would it be? That's up to you guys. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you saying that it's, in the, it's gonna be in the sites that have been um, identified by the Well, the, those are the sites that we would like for you to deliberate on this evening. So just for clarity, my understanding is that if we are pursuing a safe sleeping site, then the, the ask from staff is for the council tonight to choose one of the three sites as the interim sort of pilot location. Does that reflect me? Yeah, recommend a preferred site. Recommend a preferred site. Council Member Myers. And, I, Council Member and Myers. I've heard that this would be a site that would be for at this point for 30 days, is that correct? Is that your recommendation? So we're looking for the site and then the facility <laughs> would be a safe, safe sleeping and storage and right now the recommendation is 30 days, is that correct? Yeah, so uh, uh, Tina did allude to that. So at this time, I think it would be beneficial for the council to consider this as a 30-day renewable kind of month-by-month -month program um, based on several factors. Um, we are not getting to um, the results that council has been considering over the last couple meetings as with regards to a very deliberate six month say pilot. But I do believe um, if we have the ability to on a month by month basis really evaluate the effectiveness of the program, really think about um, how um, questions around compatibility um, are taken under consideration, um, really think about what those performance metrics should look like from the perspective not of only um, clients of the safe sleeping program, but also um, safety concerns in the neighborhood. I think it is beneficial for the council to consider a really short term program that we will re-engage with the council on a month by month basis to ensure that we can keep moving forward. Okay. Point of order, um, I just wanna let the folks who are here know what we're doing and what when this might end, because um, they came for something else that was supposed to start at seven o'clock. Right. Can we give them an idea of what possibly when we might be finished deliberating here. We could we could move we can move this right along if you'd like at this point. It's just a matter of us deciding which location, if a location is selected, and um and uh and, and moving forward with the interim site. So we could I mean we could essentially wrap it up in about five ten minutes, or we could go. Thanks. On. I just want to let yeah, them know. Sure. Thanks. One, Council Member Myers. I just have one additional question. Will the site? Will the however many sites based on the site? Will those be offered to? folks at the Ross camp as that is scheduled for closure. If I'm understanding correctly. That the priority for, for these Absolutely. sites? Yes. Thank you. And if I could, and then I'll, and the recommendation based on sort of the, all the different considerations was the San Lorenzo site. Is that clear from staff or am I? Uh, so I might have to yield to <laughs> Director Butler on this, but um, I don't think any of the sites is absolutely preferable. I think what we have determined over the last few hours as we've been um, sitting here in these discussions is that the Jesse Street Marsh um, site requires a coastal permit, it's kind of outside of our jurisdiction and so will require more time. From that perspective, I do believe that lowers it in terms of it's our ability to move swiftly on it. So we're down to lot 24 and the San Lorenzo Park benchlands. Neither of those sites um, is um, ideal, obviously, but I do believe both of them can be implemented in about the same amount of time. Okay, Council Member Matthews and then Council Member Glover. Um, we are talking about a 30-day renewable. And uh, in reference to, I think it was Donna's question, um, being uh, made available to those who are currently at the Ross site, if they agree to the conditions, this is a, this is a clearly managed, relatively high barrier. <laughs> yeah, as it relates to rules of conduct, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So if, if I so now we're down. If I'm hearing you correctly, in terms of the two that the council could prioritize are site two and site five, essentially. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Okay, Councilor Glover. Thanks. And to my understanding, neither of those sites will provide enough space in collaboration, even with the Salvation Army and the 1220 River Street, to accommodate all of the people at the at the site. Uh, speak specifically the Ross Camp. Is that a correct? Uh, Assertion? 
Uh, no, I, I don't believe that's a correct assertion. I think between River Street Camp, 50 sites at either lot, uh, lot 24 or the bench lands, in addition to mm -hmm. um, capacity that might be at our other sheltering options, that is the our kind of our target number that we expect to um, be trying to achieve to close the encampment. And and 50, so uh, just because we didn't have the tent layout like we did with lot 24, you would anticipate that there would be a total of 50 if we open up both the sites or 50 say at the San Lorenzo Benchlands? No, I think either site we can, um, we can likely, I mean, we have to get down to the granularity here, but um, the intention is to fit 50 individuals at either of the sites, not combined. And what is the feasibility of, since after I spoke with the fire chief about, uh, and also the people at the camp, the feasibility of exploring the Poganet? Um, at this time, I would not recommend moving forward with the Poganip. We put a ton of consideration into the Poganip for the a year and a, a year or so ago for the purposes of the River Street Camp. Um, that uh, requires. Um, it's, it has accessibility issues, especially for public safety personnel, AMR personnel. The road all the way up to the, the um, clubhouse is quite challenging. Um, in addition, just the level of accessibility, quite frankly, for folks who are mobility impaired, I think would be extremely challenging for folks. I mean, this really needs to be a site that people can access pretty easily. So that would not be my recommendation at this time. So given the information, does the council member want to move with a recommendation to pursue a safe sleeping site at either of the two locations? To entertain a motion to move this along. Yeah. Uh, I, Go ahead, council member Glover. Uh, my concerns with lot 24, just so you can add it to the slide, is the proximity to the gentleman's business that spoke, there he is, yeah, absolutely. So wanting to make sure uh, that there's enough kind of thought put into it so that whatever concerns he has are taken into consideration with that space. Uh, I think that if we can, I mean, the, the, my only concern there also is the proximity. I know that there's an issue with the density at the Ross camp, and so if we're trying to cram 50 people into a place where only 27 10 by 10 tent mock-ups could fit. <laughs> I'm just concerned about the density there. Um, other things, uh, I like that it's centrally located. I like that it's a pre-existing lot uh, that doesn't have as big of an environmental impact. So that's a, a positive aspect to it. And it's pretty close to transit since it's downtown. So that is a benefit also. The San Lorenzo Benchlands, uh, both sites lack privacy. I think that's a big issue for the people that are there. Luckily we'll put up the mesh netting, so that's a possibility. Um, San Lorenzo Park is the proximity to the playground. <coughs> as a problem that had been voiced by the community, but it has a bigger footprint, I think. So we'll be able to have less density and it's not directly located next to a business. Council Member Glover, one, uh, one point of clarification. So the slide that um, Bonnie um, showed with regard to lot 24 uh, really reflected what I would consider a transitional encampment configuration, not necessarily safe sleeping configuration. So for other dusted on programs, there is the potential of having a large pop-up structure that actually um, houses a number of people in a small space in addition to individual tents. So in terms of density, density and kind of how best to fit that within this context, I think there's more flexibility than we're currently demonstrating and envisioning. Um, and those dusted on programs typically typically do allow for a myriad of different sleeping situations and it's not all individual tents. And those tents that we would also allow could not be huge. I mean, we, they'd have to be pretty um, nominal in size. Okay, so um, um, were, you, were you finished? Yeah, um, taking into consideration 
uh, and the community and making sure that there's the inclusion of community conversation around it, it seems like lot 24. So I'd make a, a motion to establish a safe sleeping site at lot 24. Okay, there's a motion by Councilmember Glover to establish a safe sleeping site at lot 24. Is there a second? I'd like to hear other council members um, yeah. uh, weigh in. I mean, I personally don't want to see it in a park. I think that this would, if, if we're going in this direction, this would be the best place. It's a degraded, excuse me, it's an asphalt area. It's not in a park. Um, and and I, I think it would be a better way to go if, if other council members are, I don't know what you're going to um, propose, if, if anything, and we're going to leave it here like this and just move on. Is that to a, our next meeting. Is that a second? Uh, I'll second for it for discussion. Okay, so we have a, a motion by Councilmember Glover, a second by uh, Councilmember Crone. Um, for the discussion, Councilmember. Yeah, uh, another consideration is it is immediately across from the um, soccer field that's used during all daylight hours. Uh, I am, uh, and it is also uh, a heavily used lot, um, both for the um, parking permits, um, and the residential areas, the apartments nearby, and public parking uh, during the summertime. So there's a lot of demand there. Um, and on the other hand, the one by the uh, San Lorenzo Park, um, my concern about that is, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, the fallout during the daytime. I mean, the San Lorenzo Park has been so impacted by um, let's just say negative uses, chop shops and drug dealing and all sorts of stuff over time that's made it um, uh, really unusable for long periods of time. Um, it, it's clearly the, there's no, no good site. <laughs> uh, if there were, we would have found it. Um, so I guess I'm gravitating to 24 kind of against my best instincts, but... Um, I think we are looking at it as a 30-day a temporary renewable. Thank you. I just realized that we have uh, members in the audience that are providing their own solutions or suggestions, and we haven't even spoken about them yet. So uh, there's one here about the Locust Street gar Garage that someone brought up um, during public comment, and then I saw another suggestion out there about actually positioning the transitional space on the soccer field, uh, which is named after Scott Kennedy, uh, founder of the Resource Center for Nonviolence, and who I believe would uh, be open to closing his, his uh, his soccer field to allow for us to do some transitional or temporary sleep spaces. So um, with the staff, I would ask the question, um, what are your thoughts on the Locust Street Garage and uh, putting it on Depot Park uh, or Scott Kennedy Field? I am looking for a public works director <laughs> up to maybe weigh in, thank you, Mark, to weigh in the Locust Street Garage. I mean, I can say generally the, the lower level lo Locust Street Garage, that entire garage is used very, very heavily. I think it's maybe fully subscribed with parking permits or if not nearly subscribed. Um, so I, I think that it was taken out because of one of our initial criteria, we're looking at conflicting uses and we already have de facto contracts with people to park their vehicles, so, but. Before you do, if I may, uh, just in the interest of time and then in the interest of also many, many options to consider um, and considering the kind of the item before us, I'm wondering if we could potentially t have this conversation offline or revisit it at a future time, um, given that there's many, many sites to explore. Uh, then I would uh, change the motion to move the conversation of the establishment of a safe sleeping zone or a transitional encampment or safe parking program to the April 9th council meeting and um, make sure that we secure the language that the Ross camp will not be closed unless there is ample shelter space for those currently living in the camp at that period of time. Is that, a, is that a motion as part of the no, motion that's on the... No, withdraw my original motion and then put a new uh, one on there that says we move the decision making to April 9th on these issues. I Second. Okay. Uh, um, 
So um, I suspect had we given uh, Director Dettel an opportunity to, to discuss the Locust Street garage, I don't, I don't think we would, I think we'd have a strong suggestion not to consider that at this time. By, by all means. Um, and in addition to that, um, I think we would also have significant challenges with Depot Field. So it would be my strong preference for us to try to move forward. I think April 9th is too close to when we're trying to make a difference with regards to the encampment and then also with um, trying to open up the River Street program and this program at the same time. We are moving forward with a Salvation Army and we would essentially be postponing opening that program and serving our community and, and not moving forward quickly. So I, you know, I, I do think it would be beneficial for the council to try to do this tonight. Would that help if you heard from our uh, public works director? Yeah, so based off of that uh, staff recommendation, then I'll stick with my original motion to uh, instruct staff to look at the, the, or to implement a small scale safe sleeping and storage site for up to 50 people or 50, for 50 people, make that solid language, um, and to use lot 24 with a community input and uh, problem solving process to address the issue of the proximity to the business. Okay, so that's the original motion that was made by Councilmember Glover and seconded by Councilmember. Second, Glover. and I would call the question just in the interest of time here. Second that. So the question has been called at this time. Uh, no further. No further amendment. discussion. Okay, so we'll, okay, so if the question is called, then we will vote to uh, accept the motion as is at this time, correct? Vote to call the question. That's Vote right. to call the question. Right. And if we and don't call the question, we could entertain a clarifying. Uh, I believe if you vote to call the question, then you just have to take the vote after the vote is okay. made to call the question. Okay, so we'll take the vote to call the question. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. No? no. Okay, so that uh, fails with Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself voting. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, the question was called, uh, Councilmember Crone, Glover, and uh, Myers voted in favor. Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself voting against. So we can go ahead and revisit the conversation around the motion. At an interest of hearing whatever you wanted to address, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. I just want to affirm that this is for a 30-day period renewable in 30-day increments. Um, is that, that was understood in the discussion, but I'd like to have that included in the motion. Is that agreeable? Yeah, my only uh, concern with that is the lack of continuity. Like I understand 30 days is a comfortable monthly, just like a rent kind of structure, but I think there should be some kind of continuity to be able to get good data so it's not just a month of data and then if we decide to close it because it's a bad month for whatever reason, which I don't imagine it would be, but like why not do it for 90 days and then reassess or 60 days, but why, why 30 days? Because that's how it's been described to us up to this point. <coughs> so I think we can get to some of your questions when we go through the permitting process as to what those performance metrics would look like and how to best collect data for which you can make an informed decision. So I think for, you know, the intentionality around the 30 days was really just to have more touch points with the council and more touch points with the community, quite frankly, in terms of how the program is fitting into the neighborhood um, and, and consideration of not only the clients we're serving, but also those potential impacts, either real or perceived um, with the adjacent uses. Yeah, I can accept that, but I do just wanna make sure that, and maybe my seconder will approve of this, but I wanna make sure that there's uh, language in there that says that we will not close the Ross camp until we for sure have the shelter spaces available. Because yeah, for, some, for some people it was a little bit unclear in the last minutes or in the agenda report, so I just want to make sure that there's the 50 beds on top of the 60 from the 1220 and then the Salvation Army. Yeah, and I think that's in the previous direction from last week. Cool. Already just want to yeah. make sure that yeah. that's the language. Yes, so, All right. cool. and that so is the like language that was adopted last week. Okay, so it looks like we're there. So we'll go ahead and vote on the motion made by Councilmember Glover, so, seconded by Councilmember Crone, with the clarification asked by Councilmember Matthews. One 
clarifying point. <laughs> sure. We did hear a presentation earlier uh, in the evening on uh, the adoption of some standard operating procedures to uh, ensure that the camp is closed in a way that's consistent with Martin versus Boise and the, and the line of cases that have uh, started following it. So I was wondering if the maker would incorporate the implementation of a standard operating procedures uh, sure. uh, guide to bring back to the council for consideration of future meeting as well. That was, yeah. okay, so it looks, it sounds like that was implied, that's officially yeah, now being incorporated. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Okay. No, that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, Matthews in support, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, Myers, and myself voting against. Okay, so that will conclude the item. I think we got there. And we'll go ahead and take a brief uh, break and reconvene for uh, our uh, uh, delayed, and uh, apologize, uh, I apologize for the delay uh, for the evening, the remainder of our evening session. So we'll take a recess. Uh, we have maybe 15 minutes? Uh, I would say five minutes. Okay, 10 minutes, 10 minutes to eat. Okay, we'll get back, thank you. I'll be here. 
have it. I have it right here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All right. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and call um, our meeting back to order. Um, so the last item on today's agenda is a study session on uh, transportation demand management. As a reminder, the order will be a staff uh, and consultant uh, presentation, and that will be followed by uh, uh, questions from the council, and then we will take uh, public comment. But this is a study session in which there is no real direction or action asked of the council um, on this item. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to our uh, staff to kick us off. Good evening, council and the public, general public here. <laughs> Uh, Jim Burr and Claire Felisa are here from the Transportation Division, Public Works, and uh, we're, we have a brief staff presentation to kind of kick off the study session for Transportation Demand Management. We'll refer to it as TDM uh, over and over tonight. Um, most of the tools we'll be talking about tonight are targeted not broadly at TDM, but more about stretching our limited parking supply in the downtown district. Um, the parking district is uh, up on the screen, uh, surrounded by a, a blue border. It's a very unique area in town. It has a, a whole separate set of parking requirements, different from the entire rest of the city. The two main ways they are different in, is that in businesses and projects in the downtown district do not need to provide their parking on site, um, nor even within 300 feet, like that, which is a rule outside of the district. Um, also, the parking required for businesses uh, are greatly reduced uh, from like 25 to almost 90% of what's required outside the district. So it's um, easy not to see that line when you're thinking about the city, but it really is a very different area. And again, a completely different set of rules and regulations around parking. Um, the district was established in 1956, primarily to collect fees for consolidated parking. Um, this really is an aid to urban design. It's better land used. It's um, better for uh, pedestrian and shopping experience, and it's a more effective way to build and use parking. Uh, the parking fund is supported by parking fees and rents. Um, it has its own budget with no impact to the general fund. Uh, as far as I know, it's never had an impact to the general fund. Uh, for almost five decades, certainly over four, the district was primarily funded by businesses uh, through the deficiency fee. However, over the last dozen years or so, um, the, the more and more uh, projects have been brought from free parking to paid parking. The green lines on the uh, bar chart here, excuse me, on the line chart show some of the major um, times that we've either gone from free to paid parking or uh, increased the pricing. Um, the thick blue line across the top <coughs> is the occupancy during our peak time study, which is typically done at the busiest time of year, just before Christmas. And uh, you'll see that line is uh, fairly consistent across the years, doesn't really react to the small price increases that we've been careful to add over the years. Um, we do have most of our facilities as paid parking now. and. Um, that enabled us to bring the pricing strategy back to you in September and launch into that uh, next stage that we had adopted back then. Um, although the district has always been self-supporting, as I mentioned, by the end of 2022, it'll be fully user-funded. In other words, the businesses will be completely out of it. The, suns the deficiency fee has been sunsetted and uh, it steps down over a couple more years here until the end of 2022. Um, parkers uh, at that point will truly be covering the entire cost of parking. Of the uh, 3,000 spaces downtown, the 3,000 public spaces that we manage, uh, almost three quarters of them are in structures and lots. And again, that's the blue line up top. I separate that out just to show kind of the consistency over, over the decades. Uh, the orange line below it is private parking. We do not control that. 
And uh, it's hard to say exactly what's going on with that, but um, uh, if you've been to the Trader Joe's lot uh, anytime over the last few years, you'll know that you can't really park there and leave. You could be towed, and maybe there's other um, larger lots like that where that's happening. Uh, at any rate, the district doesn't control it, and, and therefore I separated it out. Um, so we see these high occupancies uh, in the peak time studies. More importantly, we collect data um, daily. It's real-time data, and we're converting to that. We'll probably stop doing the peak time studies. They're, they served a purpose at one time, in one point in history, uh, but, but not so much anymore. Our um, smarking data shows us that in 2018, our three main structures, the SoCal front was for 80, day, 80 days, it exceeded the 90% capacity. At the locust structure, 230 days, and at the cedar walnut structure, uh, almost 300 days, 296. Most of those are weekdays, uh, I can I could note. Um, so we're, you know, consistency, consistently seeing these high occupancies, and this really lends itself to our effort an increased effort in the area of TDM. Um, I have one more slide for you. Uh, this is when I started in 1994. These are city employees proudly wearing their cruising commuter t-shirts. Uh, and it just shows, you know, the city has been working on TDM for a long time. And Claire's gonna point out some of the, some of the um, landmarks and, and, and where that has gotten us, but uh, we're, we'll continue that commitment. So good evening, as Jim mentioned, I'm Claire Fleeser, I'm the transportation planner for the city. <clears throat> and to orient you to what we're gonna talk about for the rest of our presentation, we're gonna talk about what TDM is, uh, talk about where we are right now, where we're starting, what things we're about to embark on, and then give you a brief, brief overview of what some of the best practices are and how they relate to what we already do as a city. So transportation demand management, this slide probably looks familiar. I showed it to you about a month ago when we adopted the downtown TDM program. It's just a general term for strategies that result in the more efficient use of our transportation resources. These include using alternative modes such as transit, carpooling, biking, walking. They include shifting or consolidating work schedules, telecommuting, and many other things that result in fewer people parking, fewer people driving during peak hours, and more people using alternatives or choosing not to travel during those times that we know were really impacted. I'm sorry, I think this is not close enough. Um, again, just another way to show it, our whole goal is to meet people where they are in Santa Cruz and shift people from driving alone to considering and then using other modes of transportation or choosing to travel at different times, thereby overall reducing our single occupant vehicle trips, which has the resulting benefit in downtown of really conserving our parking resources, which we know are impacted. Uh, transportation and parking are so intrinsically linked, but tonight we're gonna be really talking about the transportation demand management side of that and how that relates to reducing our parking demand. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, quotes. As you guys have probably heard in public correspondence a couple of years ago, the Planning Commission and the Downtown Commission had a joint meeting and we invited some folks from some different transportation firms to come present, and this is a slide that I kept that I pulled from there. And it's a quote by Andres Duaney, who is a really prominent urbanist. He started the Congress for New Urbanism. And it says, of course there isn't enough parking. If you gave away free pizza, would you ever have enough pizza? And this reiterates back to really needing to actively manage the resources we have. We know we have limited roadway capacity. We know that we have limited parking capacity. And looking at that and seeing what are the carrots and sticks that we can use to influence behavior. Um, we've been really successful at that to date. I think we have a plan going forward that's gonna enable us to continue being successful and um, just bridging off the graph that Jim showed earlier, continuing to increase our parking pricing and bring more paid parking online has been a core element of our TDM program going back many years now. So overall, transportation and parking are not the point and that's something that I want you to remember as we talk about that. Why we're talking about transportation and parking is because people want to get to places. And we're talking about transportation and parking as it relates to our downtown because we have an amazing downtown. We have a downtown where people live and work and play and recreate and come to stroll and window shop and meet friends and have a sense of community. No one comes downtown because they want to go to our parking structure. They come downtown because they want to go to a restaurant or to their job or to another place that is important to them. Um, so, you know, we, we like to joke that we think we're doing a good job when you don't have to think about us, when you don't have to think about transportation and parking because the system's working. Right now we're talking a lot about transportation and parking because our downtown is thriving. 
our vacancy rate is low, employment is high, people are interested in coming and living downtown, and that's creating more and more of a pinch, and it creates a really good opportunity to talk about what are the transportation elements and the parking elements that we are going to implement moving forward to keep our downtown a really amazing place to be. It's also important to note that our downtown is not static, it's always changing. Uh, some of you may remember this slide from uh, this past June. Because our downtown is always changing, we know that we're not planning for today. Uh, the choices that we're making right now are gonna be what the next generation of people in Santa Cruz is going to see. Uh, just as you know, they weren't expecting cars to be the main mode of transportation in 1888, we're, we're not thinking that that's gonna be our, our long-term method of transportation for everyone as much as it is now, and that's why we're investing so heavily in alternatives. Uh, you'll see, you know, the final, the final piece from the earthquake is now being filled in and is under construction right now. So again, our downtown is always changing. And what we see on the street right now isn't the same that we're gonna see in 10 years. So really keeping that forward-looking lens and not just thinking about how to solve the problems that we see today, but thinking further than just today, tomorrow, next year, into the next 10 years, next 20 years, et cetera. So things to be proud of in our current mode split, which is how we refer to how people get around. A mode could be driving, biking, walking, transit, carpooling, et cetera. Uh, to orient you to this chart, the United States is blue, Santa Cruz is red. We're much lower than the United States as a whole in the percentage of people who drive alone. This data is from the American Community Survey one-year data. It's the most recent data that's been reported. Um, as you can see here, our drive alone rate is currently citywide at 61.1%. You may note that these numbers are slightly different than what we presented last month because that was just a survey of downtown workers. These are citywide numbers. Hugely important here is that you may notice our walking number is drastically higher at the United States as a whole. We're at 9.9%, which is phenomenal. But even more phenomenal is that 13.2% of people who state that they commute by bike to work. That is the second highest bike mode split in the United States of America. That's something that has continued to increase year over year as we've continued to invest in transportation alternatives, namely in biking. And you can look around our community and you can point those um, facility improvements out left and right. You can see the cycle track in front of the boardwalk. You can see the green lanes that we've put in. You can see the recently completed Brands Florida Creek Bike and Pedestrian Bridge. And you can see that corresponding to those investments that you have made the decision to make, we have seen our bike ridership rate increase drastically. And this is something that I hope you'll tell all your friends and make sure everyone knows about because it's something that we should be really, really, really proud of and uh, we should continue to increase. So, we'll go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pause. Mm -hmm. We'll go ahead and uh, let you know that this is the time for our staff to present without interruption from the community. We will open it up for public comment, um, but if you could please uh, uh, not make any comments while we have our presentation. Okay, go ahead. So, uh, just to follow up on that slide, you saw our drive alone rate is significantly lower than the nation as a whole. And biking and walking, where we really wanna be doing well, we are excelling. And this comes from decades of effort. This is not something that happened overnight. This is not something that last year we decided that we wanted to excel at. It's because we've been making hard choices on what to invest in for decades on decades and decades, long you know, before I was born and moving forward, hopefully after I die, we'll still be making the same great choices. And it's resulted in real changes. So leading into uh, just a brief overview of best practices on TDM, and my goal for this is to orient you to what some of the tools in the toolbox are and directly relate that to the things that we're already doing and what we have upcoming. So you can relate the upcoming presentations to knowing what we have going on right now and what we have forthcoming. So an overview of the best practices, and I'll, I'll go into these in more detail, and there are many more of these, but this is just a, a brief selection. Pricing, having the user pay for parking drastically increases how people choose to get around. Making alternative options available also makes it more feasible for people to choose not to drive and use an alternative mode. Density and diversity, having a downtown district like we have means that you can make many trips, many uh, destinations from one single trip, making it easier. Uh, having a land use mix, there's been a lot of research that shows that having um, different types of land uses together rather than just offices in one area and just single family homes in another area influences transportation choice. And information also providing great wayfinding on how to get around and making people feel more comfortable in that way. 
So uh, parking pricing, the first thing here, when people question that they have to pay to park, it makes them directly link that financial decision to maybe thinking another mode might work for them. Our parking pricing just increased to $8 a day. And I know for me, even when it's raining, I think, could I, could I put up with the rain and ride my bike just a little ways and save $8? Some days I choose yes, some days I choose no. It depends. But it does make me have that thought there, and that's what the research shows for other people as well. Um, the best practice is to have the person paying for parking and using that parking resource pay that full cost of parking. And at your September 11th meeting, when you um, approved our updated parking rate strategy, that's exactly what you approved. We are sunsetting our parking deficiency fee over a five-year period. What that fee has amounted to is businesses subsidizing the operation of parking. And in sunsetting that, we're shifting the full cost of parking to the user in line with the best practices of TDM. At the same time, right now with our downtown commission, we are working with an ad hoc subcommittee on updating our in lieu fees, offering an alternative for developers to providing their parking on site to instead pay into our overall parking district, resulting in less parking overall and a more efficient use of parking. Rather than uh, provide parking in every single development and not use that valuable land area for housing units or other productive uses, we could use our shared parking system in that way and really make our um, transportation, transportation demand management program stronger. Alternative options, first off, um, we're really, really proud that we will be rolling out our downtown TDM program expansion with your vote last month. We are currently working on developing our EcoPass program. We are working with JUMP on a contract amendment to get bike share passes to downtown employees. Just today, I received our bike locker cards that we can start giving out to people. And we're really gonna be able to expand the options available to help people choose alternative means rather than single occupant vehicle to just get downtown. As I mentioned, also investing in complete streets and bike and pedestrian improvements that make people feel safe choosing other modes and make it feel like it's achievable to them and closing gaps in the network really influences mode choice. Uh, bike share is something that I'm really proud of and I hope you all are as well that we've rolled out that increases transportation options for our community and then not forgetting transit, shared mobility options and carpooling. Further, our downtown, we have a park once and walk strategy. So even if you are driving downtown, you might be hitting six different businesses during that time. Maybe you're going to work and then you're grabbing a cup of coffee, you're going to lunch, you're going to your eye doctor, you're stopping at the grocery store, you're going back to work and you're going home. That's one trip instead of six. And so having these mixed land uses is something that really supports our TDM strategy. So just to highlight, I couldn't forget bike share. Small snippet, we're still seeing over five trips per bike per day. So far we've had over 200,000 rides. It'll be our one year anniversary in May. May is bike month. And I'm hoping that we crack that quarter million in the first year. Um, another best practice approach is to use a district approach to TDM and really look at how you use parking revenues to really improve uh, the downtown environment that makes choosing alternative modes work better. Um, we use our parking funding to improve project feasibility, allowing that opt out of providing parking on site and then uh, investing those in lieu fees or deficiency fees or revenues in other district improvements. Uh, parking revenues right now fund streetscape improvements, our street scrubber as well as multimodal improvements. We use parking revenues right now to sponsor bike to work day as well as our bike lockers and some other transportation demand management elements. I'll also get more into shared parking facilities and how that supports uh, TDM. And uh, as Jim mentioned, in our downtown, we do have reduced parking um, requirements. So within downtown, our parking requirements are 25 to 75% lower than outside of downtown. So one of the strategies is to have lower parking requirements. That's something we're doing. Um, shared parking, you may have heard me use the term pancakes, pint, uh, pancakes, pottery, pints, and pillows. Uh, our downtown is entirely based on a shared parking approach. So we have all these different land uses. So one parking space turns over two to four times a day on, a, on average two to three. And you may have someone coming downtown in the morning to go to breakfast at Walnut Avenue Cafe. And they park, they have some pancakes, they leave. A family comes downtown mid-morning to go to Petroglyph. They paint some pottery. They park once, then they leave after their trip. Someone else comes down and parks in that same space to meet their friends at 99 bottles for a pint after work. They have a pint. 
they leave, they drive away. Then someone who lives downtown comes home, they park in that same space for the fourth time that day, a different trip, and they then go home and they sleep on their pillows. So pancakes, pottery, pints, and pillows, if it helps you remember. Anywhere else outside of our downtown, these businesses would provide four different parking spaces. At an average of 300 square feet per parking place, that's taking up a lot of land area. In the downtown, because we have a mix of businesses that operate at different times for different uses, our parking is used much more efficiently than anywhere else downtown, leading to an overall smaller footprint of land area dedicated to parking. Um, the proximity of these uses and the availability of consolidation of facilities also makes our downtown much more walkable in that these, um, these uses are located much closer together much different than if you would go to the Capitola Mall and we're having to walk from one place to another, a big box store that's further away. Um, and then finally, uh, for TDM, providing wayfinding and information and making it easier for people to know how to get to where they're going, how far it is, and how long it will likely take them. Um, as you know, right now we have a wayfinding project underway. The construction documents are almost ready right now and we're looking forward to rolling that out. That's gonna be integrated with walking wayfinding, parking wayfinding, um, bike wayfinding, and the RTC is also implementing a bike route signage, pro signage program at the same time. So we're really gonna be increasing the awareness and information available to people, helping them choose how they're going to get around and influence their transportation behavior. Finally, uh, this slide you've seen as well, in our downtown specifically, as we presented in February, we've done multiple downtown employee commute surveys with hundreds of downtown employees participating in those. Our current mode split for the downtown specifically is on the top, and we are um, committed with the goal to reducing our single occupant vehicle trip to below 50%. We think this is achievable with the investments that we're going to make, and it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but tomorrow's not what we're planning for. We're planning for the years to come, and knowing that these incremental changes that we're making are going to get us moving in the right direction. Um, in closing for our presentation, we know that TDM is a critical component to our overall downtown. We're committed to continuing the work that we've been doing on our TDM program, and we're excited for all the programs that are gonna come. And uh, with that said, Jim and I's presentation is complete and will be available at the end for questions. Thank you so much for your presentation and for your hard work for our city. Um, are there any questions at this time from council members for our staff? Council three, three quick questions. Um, my first question is, if you don't mind, how many um, commissioners are with us tonight? from various commissions, I see a couple, yeah. Thank you so much for coming, really appreciate it. Glad you're here and feel free to weigh in on stuff too. Um, just wondering, uh, three questions. One was, uh, Jim, you said going to sh stop doing peak time data. Why is that? Maybe I missed the reason, I'm sorry. With, <clears throat> with modern technology, we have the ability now to collect daily uh, real time data and uh, with the addition of the meters on Pacific Avenue now, we have 100 credit card meters. So they have a full back-end software package that we'll be able to analyze much, much better. And just checking this one busiest day of the year, anything could happen. We could have a snowstorm. We could have a rainstorm. We could have a, you know, a, a snapshot will change. You know, it's not uncommon to see a 10% differential in traffic volumes from day to day. Uh, and so um, I don't know what the exact number is for parking, but there's probably a fair amount of variability in there. And um, when you said 9.9% .9 walk, 13.2% bike, how many were the percentage of busing? Looks like 4.3. 4.3. And my last question is, um, when do the eco passes become a reality? So we can get it up to 13.2. Yeah, so we're estimating right now in working with Metro, we've had our kickoff meeting there and we're estimating a September launch of that program for a couple reasons. Uh, the first is that we'll be after the summer peak season where there's lots of um, transiency in employment. And so getting the word out to a core set of employees who are likely here for a longer term will make the rollout of that program be a lot more effective. Also, it's probably going to take that long to get all the back end and ordering and everything up to speed and also launch a marketing campaign in advance of that. And we want it to be subsequent to when UC students are back in school so that they've already received their bus passes from campus um, and have those in their hand already. So to 
increase the likelihood of program success. September is the short answer. Thank, thank you. And uh, October is kind of when they, the school starts late, late September, so they have to be, I guess, rolling out in October. Thank you, Mayor. All right. And if there's no additional questions, we'll go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilman Lucas. Okay. Um, we can come back if there are some questions. Thank you for your presentation. At this time, I will um, I, I, I turn it over to Vice Mayor Cummings, who will introduce some of our guests. Thank you. So, um, members of the community approached, had approached me with regards to wanting this session to take place and to bring in a couple other people who have been working in um, transportation and urban planning, one of whom is Patrick Seaman. Patrick Seaman has <clears throat> more than 20 years of experience as a transportation planner with an emphasis on minimizing the impacts of growth. Trained as an economist, he has specialized expertise in cost-benefit analysis and financial feasibility studies. He's led the transportation component of more than 70 citywide neighborhood, district, corridor, and campus plans in communities across North America, including Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, Hayward, Palo Alto, Napa, Ventura, Pasadena, and Watsonville. His projects have won awards from the Congress of the New Urbanism, the American Institute of Architects, and the American Planning Association, and the Society for College and University Planning. He plans for downtown Berkeley and Oakland. His plans for downtown Berkeley and Oakland led to the successful implementation of comprehensive policy reforms, including removing minimum parking regulations, traffic reduction requirements for new development, and performance-based park pricing, parking pricing. So welcome to Patrick Siegman. In addition to Patrick Siegman, we also have Professor Adam Miller Ball. Adam Miller Ball is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at UCSC. His research bridges urban planning and environmental economics and addresses some of the key challenges in transportation, energy, and climate change policy. His current work examines global patterns of urban sprawl and car ownership, the effectiveness of local climate planning efforts, and the design of carbon trading programs. His broad interest in transportation planning and policy, particularly parking management programs to reduce vehicle traffic and emissions. So welcome Adam Miller Ball as well. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me to come tonight. So I'm Patrick Sigmund. Um, see if I can bring up my slides here. So it's it's really fun to be to be back once again in in Santa Cruz. Um, I I guess I've been visiting since the '60s. Um, I grew up in Palo Alto. Um, visited here many times uh, with, with family, um, in part because my big sister went to UC Santa Cruz. And so the, um, the other experience I had recently was I, I led um, the Economics of Downtown Parking Study uh, from about October 2016 to probably April of 2018 um, when I was working for my old consulting firm, Nelson Nygaard. And uh, since, um, since then, um, my other colleagues at Nelson and I have, have carried on with that study. Um, but I learned a lot during that, during that project. And some of the uh, mapping and existing conditions work, work that we used on, on that study, or that we prepared for that study, I've included in my presentation tonight. Um, so I want to walk you through both, though, some strategies which are, I think can be um, good potential ones for Santa Cruz. Um, not only for downtown, but more broadly for um, reducing traffic um, and improving transportation, transportation choices throughout the community. So let me see if I can bring these. There we go, that should do it, and maybe... Sure thing. Ah, okay, we can do that too. <laughs> no presentation is complete without at least one technical glitch. Or 
it is. That's the one power point on there. I guess if it's on this computer, then I should sit here? No, you can stand there. Okay. So this, this presentation goes through some of the connections between parking and transportation policies and broader issues like housing and housing affordability, uh, like economic development, and also the connections to traffic, vehicle trips, and, and pollution. And some of the, ah, there we go. Let's see, I can see it now since I can see that screen. But Is it? We don't see it. We can see it way back there. All right, yeah. well, it looks like we've got a couple screens up. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. So I, I gave this an ambitious title, um, Strategies for Increasing Prosperity and Housing Affordability and Social Equity While Reducing Traffic and Pollution, um, which is perhaps more than we can you know, tackle in, in one study session, but I thought I'd try. <laughs> and I, I think it's worth thinking about all these things together because they are so linked. Um, but you know, it's also worth considering that we have done remarkable things in the past. Um, so that happens to be my hometown of Palo Alto in, in the picture. And when my mom and dad came to Palo Alto, they bought their first house. Uh, my dad was a grad student, she was an elementary school teacher. Um, they paid about $16,000 for that house and at the time it cost 25 cents an hour to park on University Avenue in downtown. And now today, that same house would cost me over $2 million, and it's free to park on University Avenue in downtown. Actually, it's free to park pretty much everywhere in Palo Alto, and Americans park free on 99% of all trips. So basically, we've completely solved our affordable housing problem for our cars. <laughs> and the, 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 that's both striking uh, given the housing problems we have. But it's, but it's also worth thinking that, well, what if we started working on reversing that? Or at least making it so that housing was reasonably priced and, and parking was priced, but not necessarily free. And so I thought I'd take you through a little bit about introduction, uh, existing conditions, including um, what I've seen about downtown parking inventory and occupancy, how emerging technologies are affecting demand for transportation, the transportation choices we have, and, and parking. Um, and then a toolkit of strategies, some of which Santa Cruz is already doing in part, but which could perhaps be expanded. And so again, it's a toolkit to consider. And of course, parking and transportation aren't an end in themselves, but they're for your larger goals. A lot of the goals that we heard about in working on the downtown parking study that you know, businesses really need to be able to meet payroll. They need to be profitable this year. Um, a lot of people perceive a parking shortage right now in downtown, especially at the peak hours. On the other hand, we've got to make progress on reducing motor vehicle use, including trips, um, if we really want to make progress on, on climate change because it's such a big share. And of course, people in Santa Cruz really want better transportation options. And social equity matters, and especially when you start talking about changing the status quo, especially something like parking that's often been free, um, you have to be thinking about social equity. But the good news is there are a lot of cities out there that have done a lot. Certainly Santa Cruz is a place where I can go to other places in the United States and say, hey, here's how you could follow in Santa Cruz's footsteps, do these things for bicycling, and get to Santa Cruz's level of, of, of bicycling. Um, but there's also a lot of strategies from around the country and around the world that I think are not in use yet, at least not in full use in Santa Cruz, and could be adopted. So this is 
a chart, it'll be too small to read on the screen, I'm afraid, but it's a chart of 10 cities that we studied for a project called the Pasadena Traffic Reduction Strategy Study. And we looked at what did a lot of these cities have in common, because they were all places that had managed to become really um, economically vibrant and prosperous, and at the same time reduce traffic. And one thing we found is that parking policy reforms compared to status quo American policies were really key in all of them. Um, for example, nine out of 10 had eliminated minimum parking requirements entirely in e either some or all areas of the city. Um, a lot of them had um, priced parking. Many of them, eight out of 10, had maximum parking requirements. Um, so I won't try to run th through this whole chart, but just to say that there are lots of strategies and you don't have to pioneer, and nothing I'll show you tonight is completely pioneering. It's all been done successfully elsewhere before. And when we think about social equity, just take the example of housing. You know, a basic question to ask is, well, should, should you subsidize housing for cars or for people? And housing, of course, everybody needs it. It's a basic human need. Parking subsidies, on the other hand, they're a matching grant program effectively, right? You have to be able to afford to purchase and own and, and maintain a car. And if you can't, for example, half of the people who make less than $10,000 a year don't have a car in their household. Um, then they can't qualify for that parking subsidy, right? Because they don't have the car to be able to use it. Um, I always remember when I was a uh, student first studying parking, um, I had a $500 rattle trap car. Um, Stanford was kind enough to build a $50,000 parking space in today's dollars that I got to park in for free. Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, my friend Sebastian, who was on scholarships and, and working and had no car, he got nothing. And so it's not necessarily the, the best choice. Um, and there's a lot of ways we can change that. But basically, on equity, what we see is that wealthy people benefit a lot more than poor people on average from parking subsidies. They just own a lot more cars, they drive a lot more. So on existing conditions, it's worth looking at parking existing conditions, partly to ask, can we get better use out of what we have already? Um, so if you think of a parking system, one key <coughs> aspect is the number of spaces, the quantity, and the other is management, right? Policies, regulations, prices. And you can ask, well, you know, do we have a uh, downtown parking supply problem right now or a, a management problem? Sometimes it can be both. Um, so one thing is that it's important to, to collect good data. Um, Santa Cruz does a much better job than many cities um, in, in collecting data. Um, things can, uh, can, can still get better, um, and there are some gaps, but we were able to get a lot. Here, this, we prepared this with uh, um, what was at the time the most recent occupancy data we had for, for the garages. And the main point I have in showing you this is just to say the peak parking demand in downtown Santa Cruz occurs on weekdays from 1 to 3 p.m. You know, early in the morning, late in the evening, it's much lower. So if you want to simultaneously reduce traffic and pollution and also reduce the need to build costly additional parking, focusing on reducing weekday parking demand from 1 to 3 p.m. or thereabouts is a really good thing to focus on, right? Um, and similarly, if, if somebody is um, parking during that period, they drive the need for more parking potentially. But if you add one more car in the evening, that doesn't add need for more parking. So what does things look like? Well, we, we took the uh, peak time parking data, which is useful in part because it covers all the parking, public, private, on street and off, and we mapped it. And this is the peak hour, um, December 2015. What you can see here is lots that are less than 50% full, we put in green. Lots in red are 85% or more full. Um, and one thing you see here is this was basically busiest hour of the day, week before Christmas on a weekday. So it's a one of the very bu busiest times of the year. It's the busiest month. Um, 
You still had on an overall basis for the whole downtown, supply exceeded demand, but there's spot shortages on some blocks, right? So like the Locust Garage, it was 91% full. The, the uh, Cedar Cathcart, oh, I'm sorry, the um, <coughs> just to the south, um, Cedar Church, is it? The, the, um, that one as well was, was effectively full, like over 90%. But on the other hand, there's, amp there's still ample parking, for example, the Civic Center, the Civic Auditorium parking meters, those were 76% empty. The Riverfront Garage still had spaces available um, and, and spaces to spare. What tends to happen, of course, is that the least convenient parking in, in e the least convenient and the most expensive parking tends to empty out. And so a lot of the times the challenge is to shift some employees from the high demand locations out to the lower demand locations using pricing and management. Right now the Locust Garage, more than half of the spaces at peak hour are filled up with employees. So can you relocate them? This is the uh, peak parking time data showing just the uh, public off-street garages for the peak time parking survey last year. Um, and what you see there is at that time, the Cedar Walnut Garage was full effectively, just 10% you know, vacancy rate, um, which people start to think they're really hunting for the last spaces. Um, but on the other hand, you had 110 vacant spaces at the same time in the river slash front garage. Um, and that Civic Auditorium lot was still empty. So what can we do to redistribute demand, especially employee demand, out to the less convenient spaces? And what does that look like on the ground? Well, first impressions, right? Curb parking on the busy blocks is mostly full, pretty much everywhere. And then you go to the garage and it looks like that at the same time of day. Right, and so that drives a perceived parking shortage by people who don't know the system really, really well. Um, and you can't solve that perceived shortage just by building more spaces, because you can't build more spaces on the street in front of the shops. Now, overall, um, the peak time parking survey, it gives you a consistent measure of demand for the whole system, including those areas for which you don't have any automated data, so those those uh, meter lots, uh, the riverfront garage, the, the counter wasn't working there accurately when we looked at it. Um, and so just mapping the peak time parking survey data for the last 15 years, or rather charting it here, what we can see is you hit a high of a, about 4,300 cars parked in 2008. And then the recession hit. Actually, the recession had just started before that. Um, Retail vacancy spiked by 2010. Things were down by about a quarter. Retail vacancies were much higher then. Um, now we get, we get up to 2018. There, there's never been a year where demand recovered back to that 2008 peak. And you're down about 10% from then. Just a point of information, I, is it, I thought we said 3,000 public spaces, so this is public and private together, the numbers? It's public and private together. So this is total number of vehicles parked in the, in the downtown. And it's covering the same area every year. Um, and so by this data, the number of spaces that you have sitting vacant at the peak hour has increased by more than 700 since 2008. Now, it is important to note, this is both the public and the private, on street and off. And it is a snapshot. So it's, a, it's really good to calibrate this with other data. Um, it's also good to use these manual counts as a reality check. Um, what we saw, for example, when I checked, I believe it was the 2015 data. Um, at that time, the automated count data for the riverfront garage was showing regularly over 100% occupancy, sometimes like 125% occupancy, which would imply that you have hundreds of cars inside the garage circling because every space is full. Um, what that usually tells us is that the calibration for the garage needs to be redone. You know, but even in a well-managed system, counters are, are off sometimes. So it's useful to have both those data sources. But looking at this, though, you still have this perceived parking shortage. And of course, there's more um, uh, development plan downtown. So 
it's important to still have tools um, to manage parking and, and to redistribute demand and to provide people with better choices. Um, but so what could explain the, the drop in demand um, and also what's a really effective tool for changing behavior? Well, all else being equal, when the price of parking goes up, demand goes down. Now that's real price changes, meaning inflation adjusted, <coughs> right? If your price increases only just keep up with inflation, that has no effect on behavior. Um, parking price elasticities, sorry to get a little bit technical, but basically for commuting trips, about a 1% increase in demand, a 1% increase in demand will get you about a 0.4 to 0.6% decrease in parking occupancy, in, in parking demand. Um, it's less for non-commuting trips. And basically it's, it's higher for commute trips because people are going <laughs> to the same destination every day. They're often traveling at, at hours when there's more transit available. Um, but we see this over and over again. Um, so, given that you've had um, apparently demand dropping despite 10 years of economic growth and despite things like adding the Warriors Arena, um, probably reaction to parking prices has something to do with this. So that's what it looks like when you, when you chart it out. And when we were doing our projections, our forecasts of the future of parking in, in uh, downtown, um, the model we built assumes an elasticity of uh, 0.3, meaning a 1% parking price increase reduces demand by about 0.3%. Um, so it's more conservative than many of the uh, commute studies we've seen. But another thing that makes people really feel like there's a, a parking shortage downtown is that there's a wait list for monthly parking permits, and it's, and it's long. <laughs> I, I, um, I forget the exact figures about how many months, but for many garages, I believe it was in the range of nine months to wait for a permit. Well, here is the data um, from the waitlist survey that staff conducted in 2007. And what we found is that the vast majority of the people who are on the waitlist already drive to work alone and they park downtown every day. So, or at least every day that they work. 66% um, of those are already parking in some city parking facilities, and another 12 are in private lots or garages. Uh, and so what's going on? Well, basically half of those people already have a permit for a city lot, but they'd like a different lot or garage. And the remainder, they're not waiting for a place to park, they're waiting for a better price. If you look at it, the daily rate is $8, which works out to $176 a month if you work full time. The monthly permit's only 45. So it's effectively a 75% discount from the regular parking prices. And so if you were to let everybody on the wait list buy a permit right now, you, you actually wouldn't get significant new demand in downtown overall but what you would get is a loss of a lot of revenue because you would take a lot of people who are currently paying $8 a day and you would be giving them that same, that same commodity for $45 a month. Um, so one of the options I, I would suggest is to look at, well, how can we change these incentives? Um, we can see the, the sources of requests Looker and Amazon account for about 20% of all the permits requested. Um, so you have a lot of, of people who are often well-paid, six-figure income uh, software programmers um, who are waiting for a $45 a month permit. Um, not sure who actually um, in those cases pays for the parking, whether it's the employee or, or the employer. Um, but so just some key takeaways. I think that right now, looking at the data, you really have a parking management problem rather than a supply problem. It's a matter of the least convenient spaces are underused, um, the most convenient spaces are overused, and you need to shift some employees and residents out to the underused ones. And 
won't, I won't reiterate those. But I do want to turn next to really thinking about how emerging technologies are starting to change parking and transportation around the United States. And let's start with ride hailing. So Lyft and Uber, um, they are gaining in popularity really rapidly, especially among young people. So this is the Pew Research surveys. Three years ago, uh, getting to four years ago now, 15% of adults had ever used Uber or Lyft, and now we're up to 36%. And in most people under 30, <coughs> most adults, that is, under 30, have used Uber and Lyft or their competitors. And especially in places where you can save money by using less parking or save on parking hassles by using, uh, using uh, less parking, um, people are using it a lot. Um, what it's actually doing in San Francisco is it's adding traffic congestion to the streets in downtown especially, um, but it's reducing parking demand. It's now up to 15% of all the vehicle trips that go from one point to another within San Francisco. And so what's happening to parking in San Francisco is that demand is dropping. Um, this is the city's um, parking tax revenues, which is imposed both on the public parking garages and on all private parking transactions. Um, they had expected and projected that revenues would rise substantially because we've added so many jobs and because prices were going up. And instead, it's been dropping for the last four years at about 1% a year or more. So instead of getting what they expected, we have a um, you know, double or, or so digit increase in revenues by now, it's dropping. And we're seeing this all around the United States. Um, San Francisco says ride hailing is the primary reason. It's true elsewhere. So ACE parking, which does a lot of valet parking operations and, and just regular parking uh, management operations for companies all over, um, they've seen declines, really substantial ones. Um, especially in um, hotels, restaurants, nightclubs, places where people go out to have a few drinks and have some fun, um, especially because they, people can avoid drunk driving. Um, so what it means is that a lot of the revenue you thought you, you might get may be eaten away, especially as parking prices go up. And the other thing is that Self-driving shuttles and taxis are, are actually now a reality in certain places. And it, it, I think it was William Gibson who said, the future is already here, it just isn't widely distributed yet. <laughs> and so for example, this is the uh, Navia self-driving shuttles uh, in Sion, Switzerland. They've been running for about three years now with um, out of the incident or accident. They started out just in the pedestrian precinct, now they run out to the nearby train station as well. Um, their first shuttle in the United States went into, or their first on public streets in the United States went into service a couple years ago in Las Vegas. So this is 12 passengers, there's no uh, brake pedal, accelerator pedal, or steering wheel. Um, wow. There is a stop button and there is an operator who basically is there to reassure people, press the stop button and, and if needed. Um, and actually, he also has a, for emergency operations, um, he, there's a joystick that he can take out from basically a hidden away box in order to drive the thing around. The thing is that um, self-driving shuttles are much easier because they don't have to master the whole world. All they have to do is master one route. They run that same route over and over again hundreds of times. And so um, that's why these have been able to go into operation. There's about 100 of these in operation worldwide, that is this particular company's. Um, Easy Mile is another competitor, so they've been shuttling for a couple years now to and from Dallas Cowboys games and Texas Rangers games. And they've got about 200 shuttles in about 20 countries. So. This is really coming, and now they're reaching the point where they're running without operators in some of their, their shuttles, so it's truly self-driving. And we'll, then the next step is into self-driving taxis. The, the technology is still expensive enough so that, so that most people can't afford the car and the companies want to be able to maintain it. Um, but so Waymo has started operating in, in Chandler, Arizona. 
They began commercial operation in a limited area, and then they expect to expand out. They just got permission to run on, on public streets with no driver at the wheel um, here in Silicon Valley as well. And so this technology is, is advancing pretty rapidly, and you can expect it to be arriving. Um, usually not as fast as the, the people um, making claims will say, you know, the people hyping it. But nonetheless, it's clearly coming. And especially the self-driving shuttles are really ready to go. Like Sacramento State just got theirs. Davis just got their grant for a, a self-driving shuttle. And why does this matter so much? Well, with transit, about 80% of the cost is the driver. So self-driving vehicles mean that the cost of transit and taxis is going to plummet and we don't have any comparable breakthrough on the horizon for reducing parking costs. So in the past, it might be that we could run a bus, we could afford to run the bus every 30 minutes. With self-driving technology, we can run the same bus every six minutes for the same price. And that's pretty transformative. The effect on parking demand, lots of people are doing studies and, and speculating. Basically, though, all of the estimates are for very substantial decreases in parking demand. And um, some are saying, well, if half the fleet is shared, you're going to get a 90% reduction in parking demand. Others vary. Nobody knows yet, but things are clearly heading that direction and pretty fast. So then that leads us to potential strategies. And it's useful to start out by thinking, well, all right, what does it cost to add one more space? For example, what does it cost to add one more space to downtown Santa Cruz by building a new parking structure? Because it's the cost of adding one more that really lets you look at the potential for savings. So the proposed Cedar Cathcart garage, um, using the low end, um, using the, the low end of the cost range for a cost estimate that was made a couple years ago, uh, works out to $66,000 per space gained. That's conservative, I think, because um, not only are we, are we using the low end, but also construction costs have gone up pretty substantially since 2016. Um, nationally, I think by 13%. But so how much revenue do you need to generate to break even on the cost of building and operating and maintaining a $66,000 parking space? So it's about $420 a month for each space for the lifetime of the parking structure. So how much money does the city lose if it builds a new parking space just to accommodate a full-time daytime employee who buys a monthly permit? Maybe one of those Amazon employees on the wait list. Well, $420 a month cost minus a $45 monthly permit fee is $375 a month. Um, the only way this, this works with the finances of the downtown parking district is that in order to build that new garage, you have to raise a, a lot of rates. Um, and what ends up happening is there's a lot of cross-subsidy going on where the people paying short-term and, and hourly and daily rates are subsidizing the, the very low-cost monthly permits. Um, and then also... The garage doesn't pay for itself on its own. You have to take the revenues from the cars parked on the public streets um, and devote that toward the new garage. So what this tells us is that anything you can do to reduce parking demand for less than $375 a month, that is anything you can do to get, for example, a daytime employee to, to take transit or bike or walk, is a bargain. Right? Then you can free up that space and use it for a customer who's going to um, pay a much higher hourly rate. So there are lots of strategies. I won't try to take you through all these tonight, uh, but they fall into basically four categories. You know, managing the curb parking, managing city-owned and operated garages and lots, regulating private developments, and then generally improving choices. And the curb parking is really important both because it dictates what you can do off-street without causing problems, um, and also because it, if you can solve the on-street parking shortages in the busy areas, 
it gets rid of a lot of the perception of, of a parking shortage. Um, and one thing, of course, that you're already working on, it's already approved, and, and the, the meters that take credit cards and <laughs> have wireless uh, connections are being put in on Pacific, maybe are already in on Pacific, um, Pacific Avenue, that is, downtown, um, is installing smart meters and then being able to do what we call performance-based parking pricing. So basically, you're trying to charge the right price for curb parking, and the right price is the lowest price that lets you get one or two vacant spaces on each block most of the time. Um, so that price can vary by block, by time of day. Um, and the usual strategy is you pick a target range. In this graphic, it's 65 to 85 percent occupied as this is the sweet spot. And you check every month or so. If you're uh, above 85 percent occupied on that block, then you, you raise the rate. If you're within the target range, you keep it the same. If you're below 65 percent, you lower it. Um, and so this is a potential strategy um, that, of course, you're, you're working on implementing on Pacific Avenue in the core, but that I think could be a really good one to extend to the rest of downtown. And if people like it, extend it to all the meters on the streets and everywhere in the city, everywhere you have uh, shortages. And then, of course, returning that revenue to the district where it's generated to pay for public services is a good way to make that popular and it's perceived as, as fair. Um, and, of course, parking revenues in downtown already stay downtown. Um, but I just want to highlight the experience that, that we had in, in San Francisco with the SF Park program, which I advised on. Um, San Francisco did it for 6,000 curb spaces, as well as more than 10,000 spaces in garages, um, with this same general policy, changing by block and by time of day. The city had some great federal funding to study the effects of this very carefully and, and with academic researchers doing it. Indeed, Adam Miller Ball worked on quite a bit of it. Um, the technology you need to do it is definitely the smart meters on the curb that are wirelessly connected, take credit cards, because that's what gets you your, your occupancy data and your revenue data. The occupancy is an estimate, um, but you can, once you get enough data where you check the real occupancy on the street compared to the meter payments, you can estimate how many cars actually parked. Because um, of course there are always some people parked who, have, who don't pay. Um, but, um, so in order to do this in the rest of downtown, you would really need to roll out that kind of, of uh, wireless smart meter. Um, one of the strategies that San Francisco used is time of day pricing. And I think that could be really valuable for Santa Cruz as well. Basically, you charge a low price during the hours of low demand at a high price during the hours of high demand. So on this particular block in San Francisco, their highest price was noon to 3 p.m when they're charging $3.50 an hour. By contrast, demand drops off after 3 p.m., so they drop the rate to $2 an hour. Um, that's something that, that is really effective at um, reducing peak hour demand, especially getting employees out of, out of a metered space at, at peak hour. Um, and on the other hand, it doesn't chase away customers at times when you don't need to chase them away. Um, so if somebody wants to come for lunch and stick around to shop, if demand is dropping off anyway, there's no, no reason to, <coughs> to have a high price pushing them away. And one of the things is that you really don't realize often what the right price for a block is until you've experimented. This is the Marina District. I'm sorry, this is Fisherman's Wharf area in, in San Francisco. And what we wound up finding, to our surprise, is that the right price um, on one block of Bay Street was 25 cents an hour. Right around the corner, the right price was $4 an hour. And it turned out that was because the $4 an hour was the, the hottest restaurants in town, and the 25 cents faces a blank wall, on a and it's on a busy street, and nobody wants to park there. So actually, employees use the 25 cents an hour parking, and a lot of, but, but you know, you really d won't know until you experiment. And a lot of what might happen is that um, if you had this citywide or, or downtown wide, the lots at the fringes 
and the metered spaces at the fringes on the street would go way down in price. Um, the results, parking search time went down by about half. People looked for spaces. There were fewer tickets and citations because it was easier to pay and easier to find a space. And sales tax revenue went way up in the pilot areas where the, this was implemented compared to the rest of the, the pilot, uh, the control areas. So you had 35% increase in sales tax revenue in the pilot areas where this was in place versus less than 20% in the controls. So it's not just about, you know, managing trips. It's also about getting better economic vitality. And then in residential areas, like this, this is, might apply especially to projects outside of downtown. It's really important to protect residents from spillover parking. So you can, in some areas, one option is you charge non-residents the right prices for curb parking if there's any excess after residents' demand is met. Use the revenue to benefit that neighborhood. You now in Laguna Beach, near the, near the beach, if you're a non-resident, you might be paying $3 an hour while the resident pays $40 a year. <clears throat> One really important thing, though, is don't issue more resident permits than there are available spaces. And this is especially important if you're adding apartments to an area that currently is only small houses. Um, the the uh, city of Tucson, what they do is they say, if you have two legal parking spaces in front of your property, then you can only have two parking permits for the street for that property, no matter how many new uh, units you build on your property. So um, that's one way to do it. But but don't do what Boston did. In Beacon Hill, they gave out 5,000 resident permits for an area, and then years later, they went and counted and discovered they had less than 1,000 uh, on-street parking spaces, right? So it's really important to, to limit it this way. Um, so that's managing curb parking. City-operated lots and garages. Well, the first I want to say the, the projections that, that I've done using the model that I, I built, um, and I've built many of these over the years for different downtowns and campuses. Um, the forecasting the planned development as, as proposed by the city, um, including the, the loss of parking spaces due to various projects. Um, and then taking into account the effect of the planned parking price increases that have already been approved by city council last summer, um, what we see is that those price increases will reduce demand enough so that even with new development and the loss of some existing uh, parking spaces um, within downtown, you'll still have a surplus. So the this is something that you should certainly look at my calculations, review them, check them. Um, but it's really important to remember that when the prices go up at a rate higher than inflation, demand goes down, all else being equal. That's a significant effect. Um, and we've seen in many communities before that they raised prices to build a new garage and discovered that demand fell so much that the new garage was no longer needed. Um, and I think that is likely to happen here. But still, it's important to keep working on all the things you can do to solve current needs and, and future needs. Um, so focus on reducing demand in, in the peak hours. This kind of time of day pricing that SF Park did um, on the street, they also did off street. So the garage is there, the performing arts garage, their peak hour, like Santa Cruz, is noon to three. So they charge $4 an hour. <clears throat> but right after that, demand drops right, way off, and so they drop the price down to a dollar an hour. I think a strategy like that could work really well for, for downtown. <coughs> um, another thing is to consider switching from charging discounted rates for monthly permits to charging for employee pikering just by the day. Um, administratively, it can be more difficult, but especially with the modern technology that, that you have in a lot of the garages and the technologies that are available to do this in lots and, and even on street, 
It can be a really good way. Because basically the problem with a monthly permit is that once you bought it, it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? You drive every day and it doesn't cost you anything more. Um, when you switch to charging by the day, you can see results like the Gates Foundation had. They went and they switched and they started charging $12 a day, capped at 120 a month. Well, when they put that in, people could basically save money every, every day they didn't drive. And their drive alone rate went from 42% driving alone to 34, right? That's like a 20, 25% drop in the total number of vehicles parked. The um, two things that come up with that though is of course, some of the people who uh, purchase monthly permits are maybe low income, right? They're, they're, and then some are very high income. Some of them are programmers with six figure incomes. So one option, right, is, is to, um, get rid of the monthly permits, which would end those subsidies for the people who can't afford to pay, and then provide transportation help to low-income people. Just like PG&E has lifeline rates for electricity service. A second um, that, that may be uh, politically more feasible is that you phase out your below-cost parking rates uh, over time, where you could just let all the existing permit holders who have those $45 a month permits renew at existing rates, but then you charge full cost prices to the new buyers. Um, and so what that would do is be, it'd be kind of similar to the, the pension system, which has lower benefits for, for new hires. And with that way, through attrition, you, you gradually phase out the below cost rates. So that's city lots and garages. Regulating private developments. Right. Minimum parking requirements are really a critical topic and one where I think uh, Santa Cruz could make a lot of progress. Um, at least progress toward goals like making housing more affordable. And really, these, these requirements, they're government regulations, right, that tell every land use uh, developer and every owner of a property how many parking spaces they have to build at a minimum. So this is Dana Point, California. This is what four parking spaces per thousand square feet of built space looks like. Um, it's a lot of asphalt. The, the, the requirement for downtown for all commercial uses is uh, here in Santa Cruz, I believe is 2.5 spaces per thousand square feet. So downtown is better, but even, even so, it's a lot of square footage for every square foot of, of uh, land. It's basically four spaces per thousand works out to 1.3 square feet of asphalt for every one square foot of actual building space. Now restaurants are often 10 or 20 parking spaces per thousand square feet required. So what's their purpose? Right, we, 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 we rarely have anything required by a, a zoning code. Zoning codes are mostly about limiting things, right? limiting height. Um, so my hometown, it, the purpose of these parking requirements is to alleviate traffic congestion. Elpidus, similarly. Napa, similarly. San Diego, to reduce traffic congestion and improve air quality. So they had higher ambitions for theirs. Well, generally what these requirements really are good for in a practical sense is to avoid spillover problems, right? So that if the parking in front of somebody else's business fills up, they don't fill up all the parking in front of your house on, on the street where you live. But why did they think that minimum parking requirements were good for reducing traffic congestion? I mean, after all, we've had these things for about half a century in most of California, um, and clearly congestion is worse. So really it was an economically illiterate theory the regulations were set to ensure that virtually all spaces, all destinations had excess spaces, even when parking was given away for free. Downtown Santa Cruz, of course, is an exception, but I think the rest of the city, this is how the requirements were set. They prohibited or they discouraged parking fees. And actually, it's really hard to charge anybody for parking when everybody is required to build more than is needed when it's free because there's no, nobody else who wants to buy your parking because they've got too much of their own. But then, it made it really easy for traffic engineers to prohibit parking on street. 
right? So like this happens to be Las Vegas. Parking's prohibited. And that way they could add more traffic lanes. Um, so when you're on the sidewalk, you can have an 18-wheeler at your elbow as you walk down the street. Um, and they got more traffic lanes, which they hoped would solve the congestion. But there were a lot of unintended consequences, right? Like one of the things is that in this environment, if you try to cross the street to shop, you'll die. Um, <laughs> and you got a landscape that looks kind of like this. This happens to be Milpitas. Typical minimum parking requirements. I don't think Santa Cruz's are all that different outside of downtown. Well, the unintended consequences. Cost of parking got hidden in the cost of all the other goods and services we buy. So that results in higher parking demand, more driving, more congestion, more pollution. And we all end up having to pay more because we have to build more parking and bigger roads, right? And we wound up getting higher rents, higher taxes. Basically, we're paying for parking in all of our roles except our role as a motorist. And how did this affect housing affordability? Well, Oakland, two economists studied what happened when they put in their first regulation in 1961. Only one space per unit required for apartments. So construction cost went up 18%. <coughs> Units per, per acre went down by 30%. Land value went down by a third. Imagine if you were an economic development director and you came to your council and said, I got a regulation that's gonna do these three things. It probably wouldn't have passed. Um, but those higher costs get passed along to tenants in the form of higher rents. So Seattle, they found that um, the parking subsidies increased monthly rents by about $250 per month for every apartment. And parking is vastly oversupplied. Um, and it's very, very clear from the research now, these costs get passed through and result in higher, higher costs. Uh, here in San Francisco, where I live now, uh, two UC Berkeley professors studied it. It increased home sale prices. Homes with parking sell for a lot more than homes without. 24% more households could afford housing if they didn't include parking. And 20% 20 20 more could qualify for loans on condominiums. So allowing people the choice of whether or not to buy parking when they, when they rent or buy a place is a really good way to increase affordability. That's not to say that you shouldn't allow people to buy one, but it, if it's optional rather than mandated, then a lot of people can either have an apartment instead of being homeless or they can buy their first place. And one of the things we see now is San Francisco has completely eliminated all minimum parking regulations throughout the city. And so we're seeing things like this apartment just down the street from me, um, that construction you see is the conversion of the bottom floor garages um, into two new apartments. Um, and they are uh, simultaneously seismically reinforcing the building. A lot of communities around the country now have removed minimum parking regulations either in some neighborhoods like downtowns and near transit or citywide. So Sacramento, San Diego, San Francisco, Fremont, Hayward, Buffalo has gotten rid of them citywide. Um, so especially as housing costs rise, people are really focusing on this. And um, you do have to manage the curb parking though, right? Otherwise you'll have spillover parking problems and a lot of complaints. So to give you an example, the Gaia building in Berkeley, uh, this is a, a, a new, new project. Berkeley now by ordinance um, requires the separation of the cost of parking from the cost of actually renting an apartment. So this building has a fee of 150 a month. They also require that car share spaces be provided to car share providers at no cost in any new apartment building downtown or condo. Um, uh, they also require uh, free transit passes, like the, di the discount transit pass program you just created for downtown um, for new residents. And so the Gaia building, 91 apartments, 42 parking spaces built, they wound up with 237 adult residents with 20 cars. And this is um, mostly a market rate building. It's a mix of students and downtown workers. 
Bellevue requires the unbundling of parking costs from uh, office spaces, from all commercial space. Um, so you can do it there too. And that helped them reduce their drive alone rate from 81% to 57% as they built a lot of new offices in what used to be a bedroom suburb. Another thing you could do is to require a parking cash out benefit for employees, which means that if an employer subsidizes parking for their employees, then they're required to also provide that cash to any employee who doesn't drive. So for example, if somebody wants to live downtown, walk to work, then they have to be given the cash value of their parking space. Now one option is to do what Santa Monica does and simply enforce the existing California state parking cash out law. Um, in Santa Monica, when you renew your business license, you have to certify you're complying with the state law. And the state law basically says if you have more than 50 employees and you pay for any part of your employees parking, then you have to offer that subsidy, that parking subsidy in the form of cash to anybody um, at your, your firm who doesn't drive. Um, another way you could do it is to require that whenever um, a company pays for uh, a city parking permit, that they have to certify that they are complying with state parking cash out law. So I don't know, I don't know which businesses, 41% of the people on the wait list said that their employer paid for their parking. Um, so there may be some of those companies should be complying with this law, which is not well known about and rarely enforced. And then another thing you could do is actually go beyond state law. For example, you could say anybody who subsidizes parking for their employees and buys a city parking permit has to offer the cash value to the ones who don't drive. And it has a really strong impact. So for example, if the employees are offered $165 a month in cash, there's about a 30% decrease in uh, parking demand and, and driving. Um, that's from an academic study by Professor Donald Shoup at UCLA. We put that into effect with Genentech in South San Francisco. They're out in the office park east of 101. And over six years, combined with some other measures, we got their, their um, drive alone rate down from 77% to 55%. So there's strategies for regulating private developments. And that's close to the end. Of course, you're already working on providing the deep discount transit pass for all downtown employees, which I think is a really powerful way to do it. Um, actually providing the, the, the free transit passes to every employee in a group um, it, that kind of universal access has proven in several studies to be the most cost-effective way to go, so I think you, you made a good decision there. Um, and then review and expand your local transit networks as you can either contribute funding or add your own shuttles. Um, consider a self-driving shuttle pilot program, right? Like here's one that Ann Arbor has just started up. Of course, you can keep improving your, your um, bicycle programs. You've obviously done a lot. Um, and especially these kind of protected bike lanes have a much greater effect than the, con the older um, unprotected bike lanes that are seen around town. And I know you're working on that. And of course, in, in the short term, it may just be paint. But in the long term, you can build really beautiful streets like this one in, in the Netherlands where you're really comfortably separated and you're, you're closer to sidewalk level. So just to, to sum it up, I think the challenge that, that we have is to manage parking and transportation for the next few years. <clears throat> and then as self-driving shuttles and taxis really take off, that effect on parking demand will be profound. And so the challenge is to manage the next few years and get through that. Um, and then with time, a lot of the garages will empty out. One thing, of course, is that um, parking lots and garages always tend, in a system, always tend out to empty out from the least convenient spaces to the most. So it's important to keep an eye on what's going on with your least convenient spaces and, and um, the, the 
make sure that you're making good use of those. So pricing, like the curb parking pricing I talked about, is an important way to get to that. So there's a, a long list of strategies. I'll, of course, leave these, these slides with you. And with that, thank you for your time. Thank you. So now is the time for either questions or we can move right along to our second uh, part of the uh, presentation. My question, okay. yeah, my questions are going to be relevant for both. both? Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and move along and um, we'll ask our second presenter to uh, please come forward. All right, okay, I, I can start while it's coming up. So um, thank you, Mayor, thank you, Council Members. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to, to have this invitation to speak before you the, this evening. Um, as the Vice Mayor mentioned, um, I'm an Associate Professor at UC Santa Cruz. I teach about environmental ec economics and urban planning. And I want to keep this, this really short, and I'll be happy to go into more detail in the questions. And a lot of what I'll, I'll do is just to, to reinforce some of the ideas we've, um, um, we've, we've heard earlier. Um, so, so, so there's, there's two, there's three things that I'd like to, to, to focus on um, this evening. The first is to give a little, um, um, as a reinforcement in the economics of parking, and both on how prices can be a tool to, to, to manage demand. Uh, parking is really the number one, it's by far the most effective tool in this transportation to management um, um, toolkit. And then secondly, talk about how the, the economics of supply and then really, really quickly on um, some of the, the, the future which reinforces the previous presentation. Okay. So prices, costs, and uh, the future. So let's start with, with, with prices. Now, parking, we might think that parking is kind of special, but it's really like any other good. Like, we don't run out of orange juice, like when you go to Trader Joe's. We don't run out of strawberries, even in the, in, even in the winter. Rather, that the price is a tool that keeps that supply, um, that, that demand in line with supply. There's never, a, there's never a shortage. People don't come and say, like, I went down to Santa Cruz and I could never find any, any orange juice. But this is a tool that we typically use for other goods. Um, even with, like, the, my, um, uh, where I grew up in, in Britain, we're facing this political crisis of Brexit. Well, some of those impacts are going to be ameliorated by prices, like the prices are going to rise. As a, uh, maybe there's a crisis um, will affect the, company, the country, but there will be fewer things that, go, um, um, that, that, that are in short supply. This so my point here is that parking is not something special. Parking is not immune from these like principles of economics. Um, and we see this pretty much everywhere that where they look, whether in, in large cities like Seattle, um, Portland, um, smaller towns like Aspen. Um, these, there's a typical range for a 10% increase in parking charges, um, reduces demand um, by one and three and three percent. And that's really on the, the conservative end. And so Santa Cruz, I think uh, this um, really dr dramatic increase in prices has just gone into effect. So I think it'll be really um, um, interesting to look a year out and two years out how this does actually um, tra translate into a reduction in demand. So th um, this is, uh, very much of this was mentioned by Patrick Siegman. Um, there's, a, there's a range in elasticities. Um, these studies, these comprehensive studies that have tried to take examples from lots of different cities, they come up with a broad range, but minus 0.3. So a 10% increase in price reduces demand by 3% is the most common value. But there's also ways that a city can, the policies that a city can take to try and make demand more responsive. So try and make people um, look to alternative, look to jump bikes, look to transit, look to walking um, instead of driving. What is that? So certainly better, better substitutes. So the programs that the city is already doing, so the, the jump bikes, it's an amazing success. The eco passes will, will help that as, as well. Um, enforcing the state cash out law, but also removing these deep discounts for the monthly permits that we just heard about. If you don't 
if it doesn't cost you any less to drive one less day a week, why would you do that? Um, so these, this monthly um, um, permits and also the deep discounts that are given to these monthly permits are one of the factors that is probably will be um, constraining the, the price response. And we, we heard about this SF Park um, e experiment. Uh, I want to highlight some of the research that I did on this um, with, with colleagues. And we found that even one quarter changes, increasing prices by a quarter, had an impact on demand. But it took a while. Like people need time to kind of figure out where the, the, the parking costs are, where the alternatives. And so it's really these cumulative changes um, over a couple of years um, that made the program um, the, the, have a successful impact that, that we heard about. So now I want to say a few words about costs of parking. So what are the, the, what's the supply side in terms of the cost to build a, a parking space? So we heard um, from Patrick Seidman some of these, um, the, these estimates of what this actually means and um, for, for, say, a new garage on the, the farmer's market lot. But I want to walk you through some of the, the, the reasoning, how we get to this really dramatic um, figure. So capital cost, this is in the mid-range of the, the, the staff estimates. It may have gone up since then, but $35 million, 640 spaces. But you don't actually get to keep, not all of those are new. There's more than a, a, a 100 spaces right there in the lot. So we're actually only getting 514 net new sp um, spaces. And so if you divide this 35 million um, by 514, you get a capital cost per space of um, 68,000. Those are pretty generous assumptions on financing. And I think the, the bond um, forecasts um, that the, the, the staff prepared were, 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 would have been uh, much higher than this. So what does this mean? If we're amortizing this over 30 years um, at 4%, that's, um, that, that's, three, that's nearly $4,000 a year per new space, $15 a day. You add in uh, some money to actually operate these, these spaces, so you get about $18. Um, so this is kind of independent of Patrick Siegmund's assumptions, but this is um, really much in the same ballpark. But even after that five-year rate increase that you, that you approved, taking a monthly permit up to $75, it's only $3.40, so there's this daily subsidy at the margin, and that's really the important thing. For each new space you're building, that's a subsidy of $14.60. So where does this extra money come from? Well, of course, it's for meter revenue, it's for, um, from on-street parking, which is essentially free to provide, the streets are paid for. But that is revenue which is incredibly flexible. This is something that the city can use, for pretty, the, the council can decide for any other budget priority they use, whether it's um, investing more in the TDM programs, which the city is already doing. This could be money that goes to affordable housing. It could go to any other budget priority. It could go straight to the general fund. It could go to policing. It could go to anything. And so the principle here is, if you want more parking, that's great. But you should subsidize what you want more of. So if you want more housing, then use that money to subsidize housing. And so these, these four approaches, which is um, the cities typically use from requiring on-site parking through minimum parking requirements. Now what the downtown approach right now is, well, to require parking, but allow the developers to build off-site, but then subsidize it through public um, parking garages. The third approach is to, well, just tell the developers, build how much parking makes sense for you if this is not the public policy priority, the pub public policy priority could be to get more housing and so use that subsidy directly for the housing in in instead or to increase, in increase um, inclusionary housing re requirements. Or then the, the, the most um, kind of like, um, I mean, from a traffic reduction pers perspective, then just cap the parking, have a maximum, and then subsidize the housing. And as you go down from these four, we're going for t towards uh, downtown with less parking, but also with cheaper housing, because the construction costs are less, and also because the rents are going to, to, to be less. It's important to remember that even though I own a car, a lot of people we speak to own cars, there's a large minority in, in Santa Cruz that do not own cars, like 14% of renters, a smaller percentage of owners. This is city-wide. In downtown, this is a much greater percentage. These maps are prepared by um, so, so some, some students of a project last year. This is census data. The yellow area is downtown. And this is areas where up to a third of, rent, of, of people, sorry, not, not just renters, do not have a car right now. Um, and the, the students also did some surveys that these are outside of downtown, but a lot of the parking that is being built right now is going to waste. They went and did overnight counts of these, these developments like Cypress Point, uh, Pacific Shores, Chestnut Townhomes. And they found that 
in most of these cases, just over half, maybe up to two thirds of the parking is occupied on the weeknights that they did their, that they, they, they did their counts. And so this is uh, an, another indication that uh, a lot of the parking that we're spending a lot of money building or forcing developers to build when they could be providing more inclusionary housing is going to waste. So really quickly, the, the, the future, um, the autonomous vehicles, it's a subject close to my heart. I do a lot of research in this area. There's this hype cycle, like autonomous vehicles have been in the news, right? They've been like, autonomous vehicles are gonna take over now, the last year, maybe they're not gonna take over. And this is what we see for a lot of products, like um, um, they kind of go up in this um, wave and um, deep learning is now at the top. Um, um, but autonomous vehicles are kind of on the, on, the, on the way down in this hype, but in, so this is not necessarily two years away, but it's certainly like in the longer term, this is going to become a reality in, in, in cities. And this is a big problem for cities. This is a governing magazine detailed um, um, study that looked at the impact to cities, general fund and parking budgets from the, um, um, f from the reduction in parking demand. And we're seeing this today with Uber and Lyft, and in the future we may see it even more with autonomous vehicles. So some, uh, the quote I like, like, if you have money to invest and you should short parking garages, it's time for a big short in um, parking. Airports are seeing this, many cities are seeing this already, but the parking revenue is on its way, is on its way down. I did want to highlight the, 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 the data needs. Um, certainly I think we have much less data on the overnight parking occupancy, how much spare capacity there is in the, the, the system. This kind of one or two year impact of the price increases that you just approved or you approved in, in September. It'd be useful to study these. But also what is the real estate economics? Like if you require less parking, how much more inclusionary housing can you require? Um, what's the, there's a trade off be, between these, these two. And I wanted to finally leave you the, the message that um, um, it, uh, I'm glad to see there's some, some commissioners in the room. Um, my, my students um, presented some great designs for protected bike lanes last night to the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Um, we've been working closely with the chair of that commission. And I, I'm certainly at, at your disposal, but there's also some really interesting student projects. I know that staff are, are, are stretched very thin and we'd be happy to, um, to help in any way on this type of analysis. Um, so thank you very much um, for your attention and um, I'd be happy to take any questions either now um, or in the future. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your presentation. So that concludes the uh, staff and guest presenters portion of the agenda. Is there any um, questions from council members at this time? Go ahead. Okay, Councilmember Brown. I guess I, so thank you for the presentations and um, really appreciate your flexibility on starting late. Um, and I, sorry that had to wait for, for our previous agenda item to finish. Um, so I guess one of the, I'm, I'm really interested in the, this, so two things that are kind of themes, one around um, kind of perception of parking shortage, and then the potential for use of parking subsidies for other purposes. And um, so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more, either of you, about, um, because right now, the, you know, the way it's framed for us is that, you know, we, we have these parking requirements, the parking fund is self-supporting, and we don't really hear a lot about what other, you know, how we might re-envision our parking subsidy, you know, what our parking fund as a source of revenue for alternatives. So if you could just, and so housing was on the list, but I mean, if, if just examples from the, the studies that you've looked at, other communities where that's happened, how it's been effective if at all, um, would be interesting to hear a little more about. Let me give it a try and maybe Adam can add. Um, it's really a policy choice to decide how to use public streets, right? They're, they're finite spaces. Um, one of the first questions is how much of a particular street do you wanna use for storing private automobiles? And then there's the question of, well, what should you charge and, and um, where should that money go? Um, it's worth noting that um, in most cities, and I don't think Santa Cruz is an exception, 
streets are often paid for, local streets that is, are often paid for in large part by sources like general funds. Um, some street projects are also paid for by things like um, impact fees on, on new developments. Um, and so uh, different cities will say very different things about how to use curb parking revenues. Um, San Francisco dedicates all of their um, parking revenue by law to the transit agency to support muni service. Um, and that means that the city's uh, parking fund, the, the, the lots and the garages, have to pay for themselves just using the fees from the people who park in those lots and garages. Um, there's, there's no use of curb parking revenue to support the, and subsidize monthly permits, for example. Um, Berkeley uses um, parking revenues in part to make streets cleaner and, and safer, as do many other cities, Pasadena, Ventura, um, but also they use it to help fund homeless services. Um, so there's lots of choices there. Um, the, um, and another thing on, on getting, you know, just getting rid of the perception of parking, it's really important to just look at all the parking you've got that's underused, including a lot of the parking that you kind of lose track of because it doesn't have automatic counting on it, um, and see, all right, how can we get better use out of that? One thing that um, cities like Sacramento and San Clemente and Dana Point do is they have worked really hard to, to offer strong incentives to private parking lot owners to open up their lots to, um, public parking, at sometimes just during the day. Um, but they, they offer incentives like agreeing to take over liability insurance, enforcement, and maintenance, um, and um, to allow the private owner to still keep the fees. And that can be a great way to find underused parking that's private and put it into use. Um, and the other thing, of course, is in any city that gets rid of minimum parking regulations, a really healthy private market, market for parking springs up. So in San Francisco, if you had one third of your apartment spaces, parking spaces empty at night, you'd be renting them out like crazy, right? So that could happen here in Santa Cruz. Yes, I had a question for Professor Millard Ball. Um, you, it seemed like the revenue from a parking fund can be used virtually anything is what you suggested. Is that, how, how, why, how is that? Um, so, so certainly the, 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 the meter revenue is, at least to, to my knowledge, um, that there are no legal constraints on how that meter revenue can, can be used. Many cities, they put it in the general fund. Um, some cities um, use public benefits, so, but I'd, I'd be corrected by, 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 by staff if there's specific legislation that applies to, to, to Santa Cruz. Um, but, but it's actually a very, um, but there's, there's cities that use it for street cleaning, there's other cities that use it for, for, for policing, um, there's cities that use it for, um, for other yeah, for, to go to the general fund or to senior services, and, um, and maybe, maybe there's a spe some, something specific applies to, to Santa Cruz, but I'm not aware of it. Thank you. I would like this maybe the city attorney to weigh in on that and, and find out, is, are there restrictions on our parking fund for what we can and can't use it for? My understanding is the parking fund was created as a uh, as part of a parking district that initially, uh, at least, was used to. Uh, establish some of the parking structures that have um, been constructed in the downtown area and also to pay debt service toward uh, repayment of those funds. Actually, I was I was on my way um, out the door in the back of the room and part of the conversation caught my ear on, this, on the monitor back there and that's why I came back in the meeting for this very purpose. Um, but it's not to have a discussion about um, alternative uses of the revenue to the extent that a parking district generates revenue in excess of what's required in order to provide and maintain um, parking uh, facilities that are in existence and to the extent the city council makes a policy determination um, that those revenues are not needed to improve or increase uh, parking facilities uh, with the use of the revenues then um, under the parking district law of the state of California, you are able to um, place those funds into the general fund. So so that's an option to the extent the, the council makes a determination that there's excess revenue um, for that purpose. So 
Beyond that, however, it seems to me that um, the universe of potential uses for your general fund is really not um, within the scope of a discussion on transportation demand management. I certainly think it's worth um, pointing out that there may be excess revenue and that it may be available for other uses, but I don't think this is an appropriate forum for the council to discuss um, what you might uh, appropriate that general fund revenue for. Okay, Council Member um, Matthews and then Vice yeah, Chair. Um, as I understood the presentations, um, they were based on historic measurements downtown. Um, I, I think there's actually two parts to my question. Um, and I think probably both of you are well aware that we anticipate losing in the relatively short term 225 plus or minus parking lots mm -hmm. that are privately owned, leased by the city, will disappear to private development, um, both losing spaces and creating, we hope, uh, a good deal more um, density which will have some parking need associated with it. Um, it's impressive how the um, parking demand has been relatively stable as uses have increased, but also, as I think you probably both know, um, we have relatively recently updated our downtown plan to, to allow for, in the um, predictable future, 500 or so new housing units. And um, Obviously not everyone has a car, et cetera, and a lot of that reduced demand has been built in, but um, I wonder how you would um, see the future of that kind of shrinking of existing supply and I think a pretty increased density um, downtown. Um, so that's one question. I'll pile on all my questions. <laughs> um, the other um, I really am interested in urban design, and it seems to me a great big surface lot in the middle of downtown is by no one's imagination the best use of that land, and that um, the uh, idea of some kind of um, mixed use, activated streetscape, shared use in a parking district uh, is more forward looking. So I would just like your comments on that. But, but that's really an um, interesting question. I'm, I'm glad to have a, the chance to expand on it. And I think that the key point is that the economics of like how much it costs to add a new space and how much of that is covered by parking revenue doesn't change whether you take out three quarters of your parking supply or you like don't change your parking supply at all. That replacement parking um, or additional parking um, um, or both is still costing $68,000 a space, and that is not funded by, by parking revenue. And so there's a, and, and so there's a, a choice there, like, so um, do, you, do, do you want to continue to subsidize parking, or do you just want to say, hey, we want a mixed use development on this parking lot, or do you want to um, tr improve the urban design and do it without the subsidizing the, the, the parking? Um, so, so that was uh, the first way, that, that would be the first um, way I'd respond. And the second way is that that's what prices can also be very useful for. The, the price mechanism is a way to make sure that something doesn't run out. And so that increasing the, the, the pricing is kind of a signal that the something is becoming scarce. So maybe when it gets to that point, but say private actors or the city can actually start making money off, um, of, of parking and not subsidizing it, then that would be a, a great time to say, yes, this is the, the, the time for, to, to increase the supply. And whether that's as part of um, new developments or but hopefully as part of a, a, a shared supply. Um, in, in, in downtown. So the price tool can be very powerful um, p powerful here. D does that answer the question? Oh, kind the of, question? Um, and maybe I'll ask our um, public works director too. My, my understanding of the way your presentation <coughs> was that the um, price per space would, would be figured for amortization on the revenue generated on that facility, but in a parking district, you're, you're saying no? <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll ask this. Actually, actually um, yeah, if you had to have that one garage pay yeah. for the price of that that space, it would be very expensive. But because we have several garages and several facilities, we spread that increase over mm -hmm. all of those. So actually, the turnover in all the spaces with that price increase actually pays that down fairly quickly. So it's not $63,000 that you or $68,000 that you need 
for that one garage. It's spread over all of our parking That's facilities true. because yeah. we just yeah. raised, we didn't just raise it at that one garage, we've raised it over all of them. The other thing about price sensitivity, I would just say um, supply and demand, that obviously works, but if there's a very constricted supply, increasing that price, you won't see a change in demand until you get to a, a tipping point. And um, we saw that at the, at the Center Street garage, the two-story garage, that was free. And we used to have three-hour parking and it was full all the time. A lot of employees would use it and, and move their cars every three hours. We went to paid parking and it's full. It's still full. And we raised the prices on that to, from 50 cents an hour to a dollar an hour, it's still full. So there's just a shortage. That's a very central garage. It's very active. And so your theory says that should have dropped off by you raise it 10%, you should have seen a drop in, in usage. But in this time, until we reach a threshold where there's extra supply, that sens price sensitivity, we haven't reached that yet, I would say. And then the other risk we have is if we get our prices too high, then our, our customers will go somewhere else. I mean, there's Capitola where, or, or, or those are the things that we have to keep in mind. We, we don't wanna chase all our customers away and then not have demand either. So for the, for the restaurants and the businesses downtown. All right, we still will have a little of uh, some public comment. And, but before we do, I saw a hand here, Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Crum. Great, thanks. I um, just wanted to get some clarity on the um, statement by Director Dettel uh, and kind of cross-reference that with what we heard with regards to the presentations. So I know that we just heard about the Center Street Garage and how it was free and then it went to 50 cents and then went to a dollar, but there was no change. But I think if I understood the presentations from our guests correctly, there needed to be kind of a, a dual action of encouraging or putting employees or people that live downtown into the less used lots as the data suggested and then leaving those other spaces filled for people that are coming downtown for business or pleasure or whatever that might be is do you, would you say that the non-change in the uh, use of that center street garage was because of the uh, non-moving of the other usages or do you think it's because as director Dettel suggested it's because of the lack of supply i think what we've seen in in the data is that as in many areas it's it's the least convenient parking in a system that tends to empty out first right when when there are excess spaces the the spaces you find going empty are either in a less convenient location or else they're, they're higher priced. So for example, um, in the data I've seen, the riverfront garage, that tends to be um, underused, whereas the, the locust garage right in the heart of things is super full, right? And the, the, the monthly prices for both of those garages are the same um, in terms of you know, the $45 monthly rate. So there's no incentive to choose the less used garage compared to the more used. Um, and I think as well with um, metered parking, when I, when I look at the peak time parking surveys, it's always the kind of hidden away uh, meters at the, at the edge of downtown. So for example, down by the Warriors Arena, behind Civic Auditorium, that go underutilized. And it's just what we'd expect to see that it's, it's those, those less convenient spots, harder to find, that empty out first. And so I think, if you ask, well, where did those 400 cars go, the 400 fewer since 2008? A lot of that's happening around the fringes and the edges. Um, and that, we've had that experience elsewhere. So I think that the strategy of um, charging the lowest rate that gets you one or two spaces available on each block is a really good way to balance those things out. You'll wind up with much higher prices on Pacific Avenue in the core, right? And maybe 25 cents an hour at the fringes. Um, it's the same thing with the garages. Um, and especially with those garages in the heart of downtown where more than half the spaces are being occupied by employees with $45 monthly permits, getting some of those employees out of there so that customers can park. And you don't need to, you don't need to raise the, those daily customer rates 
um, to let a lot more customers park happily and raise more money for the system. Um, you could say that the next time a luxury condominium project is built, we're not gonna let the owners of those condominiums buy $45 a month permits to put their cars in city garages. You could say they're gonna pay the real marginal cost. So there are a lot of ways um, to both better manage what you have um, and also get more revenue to fund any, any needed garages without putting any more cost on customers. Thank you, and then just one uh, thing, I saw some head shaking over here, so I wanna give you a chance if you disagree, <laughs> whether, whether it be uh, Director Dettel or Claire, I, I don't know. If I would just say it's, it's, we have a pretty unique parking system because, and, and I typically agree that the further away, typically you would have a lower cost parking option. You see that in San Francisco, but uh, the riverfront garage is a classic example. It's, it's further away. It used to be free two, <clears throat> free two hours on the bottom, and we used to sell $16, believe it or not, $16 a month permits, and we couldn't sell them in the riverfront garage. And they were 35 in all the other garages. And when we went to a higher rate, we made all the garage pricing the same, um, just because we had businesses come down, we had more demand. And we're sold out on, on permits in the riverfront garage. In fact, we have a waiting list there, as well as the other areas. Now, can we do a better job on, on night you know, and overnight for residential? I think, yeah, I think there's an opportunity there. Um, our demand curve drops off about six or seven o'clock at night and we have capacity. So there is a way to tap some of that excess capacity in the evening. But during the peak Monday through Friday between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., we're pretty solid. It's pretty busy downtown. It's hard to find, sometimes it's hard to find a place to park. So. Um, we're, we're putting in new equipment in the garage in Riverfront, and we're gonna be putting that throughout the system. We'll have a lot more flexibility, looking at different types of permitting options. Uh, do we get a per, uh, per use type option? We'll look at that. Um, we did uh, take our permit rates. We know they're low. We took them to the downtown commission several years ago, and. and they wanted, didn't want us to raise them so much. So there's this a little tension there and trying to say what's the right price. But I think uh, I think we're moving in the right direction is what I would say. Thank you. Councilman Burkham. Um, do you foresee a day when we will have flexible pricing like by the Warriors Arena, that whole, I think it's lot 17 or by the Civic where people can park for 25 cents or 50 cents or whatever an hour when they're not, you know, in, to, in order to get the cars out from the pre, you know, the spaces on Pacific Avenue that people sure, want. Sure, sure. You know, it's, it's interesting because we used to price all of our parking differently. Our on-street parking was even different. We had different color poles. I don't know if you remember, we used to have the blue poles, which were the longer periods, which were 25 cents an hour. And then we had the orange poles that were 50 cents. And, and then the council used to get a lot of concerns because people would, visitors would come down, they didn't know how much the parking was. And so we were directed to look at more standardizing our parking rates. So we, we've kind of gone back to make it more convenient. Um, and what we have is, is the first two hours, try to get turnover, we do it by rates as opposed to um, tickets. So we try to, we have one price and then it in, goes up after the second, after the, First two hours are the same price, and then this, the, after that, it's it's double. So it turns over, encourages turnover on street. But you can look at variety of parking methods and pricing. And when you have an event, it's much more expensive. You just have to sign it really well, so people aren't confused and they know what they're paying. That's we're trying to keep. You know, we want a pleasurable experience for our customers that they they know what they're going to pay for parking. Does, the, does all it's the fines go into the um, parking fund? No, the, all the tickets go to the general fund. All of the, all of the um, parking revenue in the district go to the parking fund, but all of the citations throughout the city go to the general fund. Do you have a ballpark estimate of how much uh, revenue comes from tickets and how much comes from uh, parking? You know, I can get paying? that for you. I don't have that. I don't have that in my on my hand right now. So if there any, aren't any more questions. One more. One more yeah. question. Um, there were just um, stats about our usage and stuff. So I'm just gonna ask Jim and Claire if you have anything to add or not. Kind of updates because it, it was interesting. 
that apparently our occupancy is fuller now than it was even just a few years ago. I guess that's where I'm going with this question. Right. Um, I did see when I separated out the private for private use, um, I did see a slight trend upwards. Our downtown has intensified, um, say, the old Sentinel um, newspaper building, uh, next space. Um, you know, our f each square foot downtown is getting more intensive. And it could be that um, people are becoming more reliant on the public supply. Um, 1010 Pacific didn't build quite enough parking, and so we have that residential piece. Uh, and so even with the price increases over the years, we haven't seen any any elasticity anywhere near the 0.3 that's a, a national average. So we didn't use that in our calculations when we brought you the rate strategy um, back in September. We used a slightly lower, lower number. We had uh, all of those calculations um, run by a third party uh, economics parking firm, and um, we feel pretty good about those. Um, and just to follow up on uh, Mr. Dettel's uh, observation on the lot three, we don't sell any permits there. So that's a, entirely a customer reaction where we saw z basically zero elasticity um, with the price raising. Does that help? Yeah, just a, kind of a, a quick question, view. Jim. Well, go ahead. I'm going to actually go ahead and ask uh, Councilmember Myers, and then I'll go back to you. Okay. So I think I think I had a similar question, although my brain is fading. Um, so what I've noticed in our downtown is, I mean, there's a big shift in the amount, I believe, of employees that we now have downtown. So we now are attracting companies that people often would actually drive over the hill to access for employment. So, um, so is that, I mean, so we're, our parking is, there is a, a, a consistent demand and will, and, and it will continue to grow uh, as we add more housing and as we add probably more employment opportunities and office space. Is that not correct in my very primitive <laughs> understanding of how we, we move about the world? <laughs> Those are the estimates we use. We, we, we didn't look at any growth for residential because often residential will build, build, their, own parking. build their own parking. But we looked at the pipeline projects. Um, again, I didn't come prepared to talk entirely about the model right. and mostly TDM tonight, but um, we did look at the pipeline projects for um, anticipated sort of solid projects we think might happen over the next uh, five to seven years. And, um, and we did estimate um, based on existing uses. Now, if self-driving cars take over tomorrow, those numbers will be wrong. Uh, we don't have a crystal ball, so we, we, we used what we had. Uh, and so we estimated based on the actual use of the public facilities from what's from the built environment today and, and use those same ratios as we move forward. So that's how we estimated our future. So you're now. really working towards our future. Exactly. We so you know, today yeah. has been planned already. Uh, right. So ago. I mean, we're what we're living with today was planned, you know, whatever, 20 years ago. And that's why we have what we have. And economic goals were that hopefully less people start stop driving the hill and and we have a, an economic sector here that actually can attract that type of business here and so that is the kind of downtown that we've built um, at least over the last 20 years in the recovery absolutely and and we did uh, as we talked in February we did talk about those those office workers also being our best opportunity group and we will we're hoping to make some inroads uh, with the with the carrot side as well as the stick Okay, so um, city manager. I just wanted to add uh, one comment with respect to the, it was, it was pointed out that, uh, you know, parking is, is used and parking funds are used for sort of broader uh, uh, policies to support the downtown, to support the city. And the city has historically done that as well and, and has been the goal. Uh, like for example, uh, with respect to uh, some of the maintenance that we do around downtown, the bathrooms, facilities that are provided, the street cleaning, the trash collection, um, all those are supported by the, the parking district. Uh, and in addition, it's been a long-term goal of the city to maximize our facilities to provide for mixed-use development, uh, to have higher and better uses at our facilities, uh, and to have fewer facilities and so to consolidate parking so that we don't have as many surface lots as we have now in order to put those properties to higher and better uses. And then when we do 
uh, we develop those facilities to maximize the use for those facilities like uh, housing. And of course, the library is the, the obvious one too, where uh, the goal there was to try to, to build a modern state of that library and, and to maximize a partnership in order to be able to accomplish that at a site that worked. Um, and then we have some additional further goals with respect to um, the uh, affordable housing project over at Pacific Station uh, and trying to meet uh, the needs for uh, building and maximizing the, the amount of affordable housing there with respect to, to the parking as well. Okay, Councilmember Cronin, then we'll go ahead and open it up to the public. The downtown streets team, do they, are they out of the parking fund at all? I think, yeah, I think we pay f some from the, yes, yeah, a portion of it, yes. And that's 325,000, is that, or? I believe that's the correct number. I don't have it with me tonight. And another question I think I have. that's a total, but I think we split it amongst several several funds, uh, refuse, parking. And Jim, I have another question for you. Um, how do we explain that, if, if this is correct, this is, uh, I think Mr. Longinati uh, gave us this, downtown parking occupancy fell from 84% in 2008 to 71% in uh, 2018. What, what, I'm uh, missing something, what, what accounts for that? What, I'm not sure what you're looking at. I'm looking at the thing, parking demand, that he um, handed out as part of our packet tonight. Um, is that the long term, the, is that the peak time study? Overall parking data? surplus now exists with some hot spots of high demand in many underutilized lots and garages. Downtown parking occupancy fell from 84% in 2008 to 71% in 2018. Um, you know, I would need to look at the data that that, that, that statement is built on. Um, and I can't respond to it without see, having that in front of me. Okay, thanks. It, it doesn't um, actually sound accurate. No, I'll, I'll ask him when he comes back up. Um, Mr. Sigmund, I was wondering about perception of, of, of no parking. You know, I've lived here since 1983. I've never had a problem parking downtown, never. And, and I just think it's a mind, I don't know. I just have never had a problem park, finding a parking space in our downtown. Um, can you talk a little bit about people's perception and how can we change that? Yeah, yeah, well, I think it, you know, often if you know the system, if you if you know where you're going and you know where where you can often find spots, then then oftentimes you know you you can do it well. And also, if you're if you're just a patient person, that that helps too. Um, but if you are, for example, um, on a waiting list to to get a monthly permit, and you'll say there's a shortage of parking because you can't get that $45 permit right now, even though you may be parking every day, right? Or you may be saying, well, I really wanted to park right in front of my favorite store or very close, and, and so that person drives around looking on the street. A lot of times people prefer to park on the street. It's, it's easier to get to, it's more visible, it's perceived as safer. Um, and so oftentimes, um, Garages can be perceived as as you know lonely and and especially late at night, right? Um, and so those two things, the wait lists and just wanting to park close, can lead to that perception of a shortage. And also, it's it's really important that when you look at the system, you look system wide, not just at the spaces that you can count with with automatic garage counters, but at your whole system, including the edges. Because oftentimes, um, when demand for the overall downtown shrinks, which is what your peak time parking surveys show, that, that shrinkage in demand, it's happening at the fringes, right? And, and um, I think it is also happening in the riverfront garage. Um, when, you, when you have um, really good data collection for all your parking, um, then, then you can really see the, the patterns even better. One, one thing to really consider is to get uh, license plate recognition technology on your parking enforcement vehicles that comes with the option of automatic data collection included. And that can be used um, to automatically collect data for streets and lots and so on as part of the routine um, parking rounds. Berkeley and Davis are both working on that. Um, and that'll really give you the information. And another thing is to look at, well, do we have situations where people are buying a monthly permit in the public lots and garages because it's just cheaper than the, the parking they can get privately? Um, you know, what's, for example, there's a lot of people from St. George's residences on the wait list. 
I don't know what the fee is in their own garage. Um, but I do know there's one, there's one apartment project in Lower Pacific that I believe has $200 a month parking fee. Um, there may be some of those people would rather pay 45 to be in the city lot. Um, so, you know, one of the ways that we often get much better use out of those underutilized private lots, right, is, is to <coughs> um, stop being the best deal in town at the city lots and the city garages. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment now to um, allow for the public comment. We're not taking any action tonight, um, but if there's any members of the community that are interested in speaking to the, uh, to the council on this item, I'll um, ask if those who are interested in briefly addressing the council, uh, please step forward first and you'll uh, give, be given one minute and then we will um, allow for the uh, requested additional time from um, a organization to go and then return to other community members who are interested in speaking for longer than one minute. So is there any uh, member of the community who wants to address the council on this topic at this time? And you'll be given one minute. And if you could please line up to my left. Could I get a point of clarification? If, if you wait, you, you can get two minutes, but if you don't, if you go now, you get one minute? Yes. Okay. I would just encourage the council to look at um, the data um, that the presenters have gone to the trouble to present to us. I really think that what we're looking at is, and what's been, even though there's a lot I don't understand, it's abundantly clear that this is about managing and creating what we wanna see. And I really think that there's no question with climate change coming on that we need to shift. Um, and what we need to do is get people into those outlying fringe areas um, and so forth. I just also wanna say my friend has two cars and I walk everywhere and take the bus. So I never get in his cars, but he is forever moving his cars and he has absolutely no problem ever getting a space and I could tell you where, but I kind of want to keep him a little under the radar. I'm a little paranoid, but it's in the downtown area. He, we never have a problem. Thank you. Matt Farrell, I um, just wanted to say that uh, I appreciate the presentations this evening. I think that a lot of these policies these gentlemen present are uh, well-founded on research. I think the examples presented though tended to be larger metropolitan cities, Berkeley, Ann Arbor, and that I think what we need to be really careful about is we need to test these theories in our own communities. Because I really, I know for instance in the city of Redwood City, I think they had a peak parking pricing strategy for on street and the city abandoned it or stabilized on street parking prices because of customers' reaction to that volatility in the parking rate. So not saying that we can't look at these things, but we need to be careful about our expectations because I'm not sure they all have the same impact everywhere. Thank you. My name's Kurt Simmons. I, uh, I have a business downtown. I've paid for parking for all my employees for over 20 years and it's it's been dirt cheap. It has been a, a benefit I can offer my employees, but we're part of the problem. We allow our employees to come downtown and park and take up the parking spaces for the customers. And that's what I wanna try to change is allow parking for our customers and have incentives. And I, I love the presentation tonight. It was very informative about options and the city is already doing a lot to improve the demand management and I just want to encourage that. Hi, I'm Susan Cavalieri. Um, I found the presentations to be really very interesting, especially about the future of Santa Cruz. Um, I just want to point out that the city passed at a climate emergency resolution that last Friday, over 2,000 students protested in 125 countries. That's 1.4 million young people. 
It was the biggest day of climate action, according to 350.org. Yesterday, the CO2 level was 414.79 parts per million. We are in trouble and cars are not our future. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other additional members of the public who would like to address the council for one minute? We'll go ahead and ask now to have um, Mr. Longinati come forward and you'll be given four minutes for your requested additional time. Not a problem. Um, hello, council members. I'll, I'll keep it brief. It won't be four minutes because you're weary. Um, I, just a couple points. Uh, the excess parking revenue uh, that could go into the general fund, that was an exciting point for me to hear that tonight. Um, I often see you folks struggle to just find $30,000 to add to some worthy, worthy program. Well, the revenue that's gonna come in on account of the price increases that, that this council passed last year would pay for, uh, according to the city staff, would pay for 2.9 million per year just in debt service on the garage. So if you don't build a garage, there's some money that could be used for housing, for homeless programs, for what have you. Um, I wanna say too that I, I think that, uh, I don't think it'll be controversial to propose that developers need to offer their tenants the option of paying for parking spaces separately from their apartment or condo. Isn't that just basic American choice? Um, Adopting the practice of unbundling parking from the, from the cost of the unit, I think that's the hidden uh, affordability benefit that, that we really need to pay attention to and it will also lower vehicle ownership. And you know, I, I, as, far as, I, I'm, as far as the presentations tonight, I'm, they were wonderful. I was, I'm kind of a nerd and so I loved it, but it really comes down to this. Do we build new parking spaces that cost us over $400 a month in debt service and then sell those spaces for what, 45 a month or 70 a month? I mean, no business person, and I'm kind of socialistically inclined, I would say, but a business person would never do that. Why would you build more capacity that you know you're gonna lose money on? It, it's, it, it seems absurd to me. I think it comes down to that. So we need to find these other options and we know that they're there. And that, that's what we had, we learned about tonight. So I hope we can agree on that. I hope to see uh, this, this council agendize in, in the future and end to this idea of building a garage. I hope you will ask the staff to negotiate with the Calvary Church who really wants to build affordable housing on their lot, but doesn't know how to find a way. But I hope you will ask staff to explore uh, conversation with the church to partner to build uh, parking on the ground level and affordable housing above that on their lot. And uh, uh, I think that we're at a point, you know, it's 2019 and we have climate change. Why are we subsidizing auto trips? Can we make that just a principle? We're not gonna subsidize auto trips anymore. Thank you. Question for yeah. Mr. Longinati. Could you, uh, the question I had for um, the parking people, downtown parking occupancy fell 84% to, to 71%. How do we account for that? Where, where did you get that stat from? Um, so that was, uh, that's the way I read the, uh, the data from 2008 to 2018 from the, the census, the Christmas time census. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll reopen the um, uh, public comment to any member of the public who uh, didn't address the council and would like to take uh, two minutes to address the council. Please, if you can, line to my left. Oh, okay. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think you should look very seriously at doing something other than building a parking garage. Um, given the numbers that these guys uh, presented and the fact that car usage is going down. The, uh, there's all sorts of empirical information that younger people are not buying cars. They're either using ride share cars when they go on long trips or they're using Uber and Lyft and things like that, bicycles, uh, public transportation. So why would we wanna spend a bunch of money that would have to be paid off over 30 years 
on a, some, a project that 10 years from now will be just a giant uh, albatross. I mean, it doesn't make sense to do something like that. And if you can t take that kind of money and put it into something meaningful, like housing, we have a housing crisis here. We don't have a parking crisis at the moment, but we definitely have a housing crisis. So it would be the best use of any money that you have, instead of it going towards a parking garage, you'd be going towards housing and going towards programs to get people out of their cars. You know, I mean, that, that's money well spent getting the bus service back to what it used to be in the 70s. We had an incredible bus service here in this county, and now it's just a shadow of itself. So I'd like to see that come back also. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Brett Garrett, and I really appreciate the two presentations. Um, one of the things they've told us is how to do free TDM. Um, a, park, a cost for parking is, we've been told, the, the most effect, effective version of transportation demand management. So if we are, if we're paying for TDM and we're also paying to build more parking lots, that's kind of working at, at cross purposes. So it would be more consistent just to focus on TDM and as we raise parking rates that it's TDM that makes money actually, it's, it's great. Um, I love the concept of having better monitoring so that we can have an app for Santa Cruz like I think they have had at some point in San Francisco where people can look on their app and they say, here's where the spaces are available oh, here it's $2 an hour and here it's 75 cents an hour. I'm gonna go park where it's 75 cents and there's a spot right there and I know it's there because my app says so. I, I love the idea of having more monitoring where people can see what's available and what the prices are. Um, I wanna say if we're observing zero elasticity, I believe that just means the price is too low. Raise the price higher and you'll start seeing the elasticity. Um, I don't buy the argument that 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 the higher price means everyone goes to Capitola instead, because if if you're parking, if you're par charging five dollars an hour and the garage is still full, that means empirically that people are still coming to Santa Cruz, and those are people that are willing to pay money for parking. They're probably willing to pay money in the stores too. Businesses will love it. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. I'm thrilled to see that downtown employees are now able to get their hands on deeply discounted bus passes, but the fun shouldn't stop there. Commuter benefits mandated for large employers should be the ultimate goal, incentivize all transit use. Today we've been talking about transportation demand management, but it sounds more like parking demand management to me. Like where's the transit? Where, where's, where's talks about getting people moving? In terms of TDM, we as a county have closed down Soquel Park and Ride Highway 17 direct bus service, and we wonder why we have an Aptos Strangler in our county, you know, the part where in mid-county traffic gets to be the worst. Our one and only local express bus, 91X, tries to have it both ways. 91X, by being a local and express, by skipping straight to Cabrillo when leaving Santa Cruz, but then stuck moseying at Dominican uh, on Soquel and throughout Morrissey and on 41st, it's an express bus, it can't be both. Um, one time I got frustrated with Metro and their bunched up scheduling at Cabrillo, how basically three buses come within a time span of 15 minutes and then there's nothing else after that, that I decided to uh, patronize MST with their express bus it, and gave 350 when my free Cabrillo pass could have been used. I gotta say, that was a nice experience. They've got Wi-Fi, USB ports for your, um, for your um, experience while you're aboard their commuter bus, and it's just, it's a pleasant experience. Now, basically what I'm trying to get at is you can't market uh, transportation if it's not appealing, so it needs to be worked on. Lastly, 
Jump is great, but it is starting to get middled with by Uber. For example, if you go outside a service area, it cuts its speed in half. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Morgan. I'll probably take less than two minutes tonight. Um, thank you very much for allowing us, allowing this presentation. It was a breath of fresh air. It was creative. It was dynamic. I enjoyed it. Um, it's very different from what I've heard before in this council when we've talked about parking, um, and I think it's needed. So thank you for allowing these two wonderful presentations. I also want to thank you for um, initiating the EcoPass concept. I think that's a terrific concept. I think it's the future, and I want to say congratulations for making that decision. I have a son who's going to be 18 years old. He goes to Santa Cruz High. He's never talked about owning a car, nor have I mentioned anything about a car. I take him to school every morning. He takes a bus home every day. He sometimes takes a bus to soccer practice on the weekends and comes back on the weekends. When he does soccer practice with a, a club, we're at Depot Park, where I sometimes get him. Depot Park parking lot, 24 in the one south of Depot Park, is rarely full. That's one of the fringe parking areas that's being referred to. I park there often. Don't tell folks, I often don't pay. It's $5 a day. I park there sometimes and have a nice, pleasant two-block walk into the city. My other son, who's gonna be at Santa Cruz High next year, has talked about an electric bike. We live in Live Oak, so we, we do need to commute downtown. He's talked about an electric bike. He's also learning how to take the bus with his brother. He is at um, a theater production company, a private production company called All About Theater on Washington. I park on Washington Street also, just south of, of Laurel. I've never had a problem parking. I don't have a problem parking downtown either, Mr. Crone, you, you mentioned that. So I don't think there's a par parking issue downtown. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next speaker. Hi, Debbie Bolger. Um, I would like to see the city stop subsidizing parking. I'm very concerned about climate change and I think the price of things affects behavior. Uh, I was also quite excited to see the autonomous vehicle uh, shuttles uh, tonight and I'd like to see one go up and down Mission Street and come downtown and maybe it could learn that route um, nicely and um, whenever I'm not able to walk downtown anymore, perhaps I can take that shuttle. So, thank you. So seeing um, no other members of the public interested in speaking to us, we'll go ahead and return it to council if there's any further questions. And I'll just thank those who were able to stay and um, in recognition that we uh, started a lot later than anticipated. So I appreciate your patience with that. Um, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilman Brown. I just want to add, or thank all the um, presenters for coming tonight and for your time. Um, I had one question for staff, which was, um, I thought I'd heard you mention in the beginning of your presentation that you're now tracking or have the ability to track in real time the movement of cars and um, the parking that's occurring. And I'm just curious where that um, technology is now in place. So <clears throat> we, um, we uh, did a purchase order with a company called Smarking and they, uh, it's a third party uh, vendor and they collect and then um, they collect from multiple, like we have the loop machines in the surface lots, we have different equipment, we have GMG, and we have different equipment all over the place. Um, and they are able to collect the data from that and then um, we have access to it through a, uh, through a portal. So it's, um, and it's, it's real time, it's, it's every day and it'll, it'll help us make much better decisions here in the future. Uh, the second piece of that is we do have the meters on Pacific Avenue. They were installed um, uh, in early January. And so we're just exploring what the what sort of the back end of that information looks like. So this, both of those technologies just came online this year? Or is yeah, it just the- Smarking we've had in for a couple of years. We're still working the bugs out of it. Um, uh, and the data is not, it, it's, it's not that friendly yet, but um, definitely we can get it 
download it, convert it, and and mess with it in that point. But we're, uh, we've had it for a couple of years at least. Yeah. Thanks. Councilman Brown. Well, it's a question that I don't think can be answered here tonight, but I, I do just want to acknowledge that what I'm hearing is uh, some, um, I don't know that I'd say disagreement, but we're hearing different statistics about that, that lead us to different conclusions about the need for more parking, the, the need to replace parking uh, spaces, um, the goal, I mean, some of that's about goals for the future, but I'm just having a hard time, like, like how do I decide whether or not we actually have, uh, you know, need for more parking, right? <laughs> because some of, this, some of the numbers I'm hearing say, yes, we do, and some suggest maybe not. And absent any clear data, I'm gonna go with the, the N of one, my, own, my small survey sample of me, I, my experience most resonates with the idea that no, in fact, we don't. If we look at the periphery and we look at least less convenient, um, or maybe out of the way s s sites. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out how we, where, where we can get our hands around or minds around data to help us make a decision uh, that is going to have an impact, uh, cost and otherwise. Um, so Claire, maybe you can. You yeah, can that's, a, that's a multiplied answer in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> one, if you want in-depth data on parking and parking supply and parking occupancy, that's a great question to ask. Tonight, what we presented to you was on transportation demand management, and that's what we came prepared for. So if that's the question, that's a great question to ask, and we're happy to do that. It'll take a while, because there's a lot of spaces, a lot of data, and we want to pull it together in a way that's understandable so that you can make those decisions. Um, that's part one. Part two, parking is a huge policy choice. Uh, similar to on Pacific Avenue, where we installed the new meters and we set policy guidance for occupancy standards, that we were going to look at parking pricing as it related to falling within a established 65 to 85% occupancy goal. If you would like to set an occupancy goal for downtown and accept the corresponding parking pricing changes that go along with that, that's a direction that you could take. Um, likewise, you could take many different directions on that, but parking, supply, demand, pricing, occupancy, those are all policy goals that you have the ability to direct on. Uh, what we have been operating under right now and the guidance that we've had in the past is be sensitive with parking pricing to the many, many, many small businesses that we have downtown that are incredibly sensitive to parking pricing changes. And you've probably heard from many of them when we do propose parking price changes. We have also heard loud and clear from this council and previous councils to be sensitive to low income workers and the balance between having the users pay the true cost of parking and also recognizing that 50% of our downtown workforce works in retail and restaurant. And that's a very price sensitive employment group. Um, the idea of subsidizing parking for one group and saying that driving for that group is good, but for uh, you know tech jobs that are now not driving over the hill, parking is bad. That I think that sends a mixed message on where we stand on our approach to transportation and parking policy. Although it is a policy choice that you can make, um, it's a really long way of saying that there are a bunch of different parking policy choices that you can make and probably the easiest way would be to start by directing us to bring you information specific to parking if that is the question that you're seeking to ask. Thank you. And Councillor Rebecca? I'm going to go back to your comment early on. I think it was you, Claire. I don't know. Maybe it was someone else that no one comes downtown to visit our great parking garages. They come down for all the uses and um, it may be you know, go to Ma on a weekend afternoon and hang out and have a great time. It may be you're living downtown, maybe you've got a nine to five job. I mean, all these, um, maybe you're visiting from Merced, I don't know, all sorts of things. Um, what I would really like to see, and I think it stems from my experience of being on Vision Santa Cruz after the earthquake, earthquake and thinking, what do we really want long term? for our downtown to be. It's not that it's a parking lot here, a, you know, second story offices here, trees along the sidewalk, et cetera. So personally, I would be much more interested in, and I actually had written this out, um, looking for uh, some mechanism 
for the council with our staff and maybe some consultants to step back and um, look at the kind of future we, we think about um, parking um, and other infrastructure um, with a series of study sessions and really engaging um, all the stakeholders because I don't think we're hearing from our downtown businesses here and retail is changing. Uh, it is sensitive as we know the, the office needs. Um, the uh, property owners work hard to fill those second story offices. And um, uh, so I would personally like to see uh, some mechanism to look at um, what are the trends for downtowns generally and our downtown particularly. We know we're gonna be adding hundreds of units of housing. And to my mind, that's just an enormous opportunity. I think there's a big demand for that. We hope we keep our ground floor commercial vibrant. We know they're struggling um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, we wanna keep some of the great civic spaces uh, vibrant, um, I count the museum in that, but I count the farmer's market and the library and the civic auditorium and the river. I mean, all of these are um, parts of our downtown. Looking back in time with planning, there are a million documents <laughs> and policy statements that say we need to connect our downtown to the river. We need to connect our downtown to the beach area um, because it's not a big area really. Um, and I would like to look at um, what's the um, economic um, situation, what's the revenue we get from downtown in our taxes, what are the jobs that exist downtown, what do we need to do to preserve those, um, what, uh, what is the potential for housing, what's sensitive. We, uh, I, I think we probably all agree we want to maximize the affordable housing. Um, how do our policies related to parking fit into that? Uh, I, I think probably most of us would agree we're looking at, a, at some kind of a mix of market rate and affordable subsidized housing. Um, we have so many different activities even in the commercial sector going on, um, not to go into them in great detail, but um, everything about um, our commercial sectors and our transportation and our housing needs has just gone through so much flux and I, I think we can't deny we're gonna see a lot more uh, evolution quickly uh, in the future. So my, my personal interest, rather than looking at TDM or parking, is looking at the big picture. What do we want it to be? Uh, we are not Boulder or San Francisco or Santa Fe or pick, pick a city. You know, we have some certain givens here and um, let's really envision for the future. And I think some of these transportation needs will, um, the answers will become more clear when we, when we think about what's the, the city, the downtown core that we want and connecting it broader out to the community. So that's just my view of where I'd like to uh, step back and, and take a bigger look. And I'll just um, say that we'll be having a series of study sessions and we can take your input and you're welcome to send that to myself or city staff when considering, there we go, our hands <laughs> over <laughs> at this time. Done. And um, there is a, a ongoing conversation around constant um, uh, study sessions, learning um, and visioning as we move forward. And so we'll take this input into consideration. Council Member Crum. Uh, maybe Claire or Jim. Um, Mr. Longinati said excess parking revenue that can go into the general fund, $2.9 million in debt service in the garage. Does that sound uh, realistic, that statistic? That we pay $2.9 million on, on debt service for a new garage? We do not pay uh, $2.9 million. We, we, we pay currently about f just over between four and 500000 on debt service mm -hmm. on the SoCal front structure uh, that will be paid off in 2027. Uh, the two point nine is the... Um, was the in the parking rate strategy for the next parking structure. Okay, thank you. And um, Patrick, you said $200, somebody's paying 200, charging $200 for a parking space downtown at, at Pacific Avenue, Who, who's that? Is that, a new, is that a new structure? I would have to, no, that is a um, existing apartment building. It's that, it's the, um, south end of Pacific Avenue. Um, the, the, my source of information for that was an uh, email message from Martin Bernal. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, 
Let's see, is it 10? It's not. Mm -hmm. five, you're talking about 555 specific? He said no, this, was built. this was built, I think, 2003. 10. It, oh, 10, it, 10. Uh, I think it's south, consider a, a couple blocks south of Laurel. Um, the, the um, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just have to look okay, it up. No worries, no the, worries. The, um, the, the, the point he made, which was a good one about that, was that on that project, what happened is the um, residents were allowed to purchase residential parking permits, and by whatever your standard policy is, um, in, in order to park on, on the street. And so they said, well, why would I want to pay $200 a month to park in my own garage, which is close to the, the real cost, when I can park on the street for a couple dollars a month? Um, and that created the spillover parking problem. So it's really important that if you do the separation of parking costs from housing costs, um, that you don't allow those residents to then have unlimited permits in the residential district or to buy $45 a month permits in a city garage. Thank you. Uh, last question, um, Adam Miller Ball. Uh, I know you, you, you studied the Uber Lyft thing and uh, you just had an article that went viral on the um, self-driving cars and how it's gonna create a problem in the future. Do we have an Uber Lyft problem right now in Santa Cruz? That's a great question. I think it really depends on what you mean by a problem. Certainly it's providing a mobility service for some people who find it hard to, to get around. Um, and to people who don't have a car, people who might be unable to drive for, for, for any reason. Um, is it also like increasing um, traffic? I mean, we haven't had the detailed studies that San Francisco has done, but I'd be surprised if it hadn't increased traffic. Is, is that a problem? Well. And that, that's, that's hard to answer because it's all giving people a, a great benefit. But it's also having the great benefit of reducing parking demand. One of your students did the Uber Lyft on, on campus, just going across campus. Do you remember what those statistics were by any chance? I can't remember off the top of my head. Something like but, several thousand yeah. cars were being called just to go from like Oaks over to Stevenson or something. Yeah. I, I can't remember the numbers, but certainly, yes, a student did an analysis of Uber yeah. Lyft demand. And, and UCLA, we can see this in extreme, there's 11,000 trips a week by Uber and Lyft from one part of campus to, to, to another. And that's partly um, reflecting the very the, the high cost of parking that people find alternatives. It's cheaper to, um, to, to, to get an Uber or Lyft than, or a scooter for that matter, um, or hopefully people can take a jump bike um, than, to, than to pay for parking, and so people adapt. Thank you very much. I, um, I know we're not making motions, but I'd like to calendarize something for the uh, April 23rd meeting. Um, I'd like to revisit the September 11th, 2018 library garage decision of the Santa Cruz City Council. Number two, I'd like to bring back for discussion the monthly parking permit program to avoid subsidizing driving. And number three, I'd like to explore pioneering with, uh, excuse me, partnering with um, Calvary Church on the construction of a ground level parking with affordable housing above at the Calvary lot for um, April 23rd. I don't have, okay, well we have a motion by Council Member Crum. I would, in light of the um, content from tonight and the opportunities that it's presented, I would uh, second that motion. Okay, I don't have, um, the uh, calendar ahead and I would um, not prefer to agendize things this way um, and go a different direction. So I personally won't be supporting the motion. Council Member uh, Brown and then Council Member Matthews. I would like to see all of those items discussed on uh, an upcoming agenda. I understand that it may be difficult to get them all uh, agendized for April 23rd. That is a pretty quick turnaround time. But I, I do, I'm not, so I, I do wanna support the intent of the motion and ensure that these are not um, items that get lost. Um, although I understand that April 23rd might not be realistic to put them all together as a package in light of other things we're doing and the information that might be needed. So I'm just trying to figure out how to support this um, in concept and um, say emphatically that I would like to see those discussions and deliberations move forward to the council soon. What about um, just revisiting the September 11th, I'm gonna go ahead and pause, uh, 2018 library? I'm gonna library. go ahead and, and pause you and interrupt you because I had a, already acknowledged Councilmember Matthews. Go ahead. I thought she was asking me a question, I'm sorry. I'm um, very much opposed to this. I think this is another example of trying to make a um, 
a, a rapid uh, drive on a, a, a narrow agenda without engaging all the stakeholders, without um, bringing in the deep body of knowledge and, and studies that have been put in. I mean, we're talking about the library now, and I think it's really a disservice to the um, work that's gone into that project. We have not talked about how the um, how housing might be integrated into a mixed-use project uh, at that site, <laughs> particularly um, the other issues that you brought up. I think again, it's just a rush to judgment on on narrow issues without uh, giving adequate time for our staff to pre prepare uh, good information and present it in a holistic manner. I. I I think that's just the wrong way to approach this. I just want to acknowledge did the city attorney really quickly. Did you have anything to add to this conversation before we continue? Um, I was going to suggest if it's not direction by council to place an item on a specific agenda, then it could be based on the, com the preparation of and submittal of a staff report and uh, discussed in the context of our normal agenda review process as an alternative to council direction. Um, unless the council direction also specifies, um, you know, who is going to be responsible for preparing the staff report, what the entire scope of the discussion will be, and that sort of thing. And the, the council can also work on that with the staff or as a That's right. Individual. I mean, council members submit, can present uh, on their uh, agenda materials and ask that they be added to a, a future agenda right. as well. Okay, council member, and then oh. council member Myers. Uh, council member Brown, would you accept uh, 60 days? To, to bring those back? Well, I guess my preference would be that we I work on these with, um, with staff to ensure that they come back at a time when we can, they, we actually get the information that we need to make those kinds of decisions. So putting a 60-day 60, 60 timeline on it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get what we want in order to be able to make those decisions. What is it that we want? Date. So <laughs> I guess I'm just, if like, we can, you know, can, can, if I, can I, through can me, I, that, I would, let, before we do, if you could go through me, that would be, I, I would prefer that as protocol. Thank you. Cons I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to really answer the question because this is the first time I've heard of the, what you're recommending. I, I don't really have a good eye sense of how long it'll take. I mean, it, it would be really nice to be able to, uh, have some time to understand what you're proposing, what it means and what it's going to take, and then we can come back and, and, and give you a sense of that. But at this point, like I said, this is the first I've heard of it. And so I, I have no idea and we have no idea what it would take, you know, and how long it would take to, to, to gather that information and bring it back to you. So I would appreciate having an opportunity to look at it and understand it and, and then to come back to you. Okay. Okay, Councilmember Member Math, Council, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor coming, Math then Math next. next. Okay, she's, she's, she's been waiting, yeah, sorry. Is there a second? Is there a motion? Is there a motion? There was, a, okay, well then I'm gonna propose a substitute motion, which is this. I move we direct the mayor to appoint a time-limited task force of council members to work with staff in proposing a program of study sessions and public outreach for a holistic review of the issues and trends affecting our downtown to inform the community and council about actions affecting the future of downtown. This discussion should include current information, trends, and major opportunities. It may include, but not be limited, to subjects such as housing, both market rate and affordable, commercial activity such as retail, office, tech, food and beverage, entertainment and services, revenue and jobs directly related to the downtown core, connection of downtown to the San Lorenzo River and Main Beach area, civic and community functions, including farmer's market, library, civic auditorium, museum, and transportation, allow time for outreach to stakeholders and community groups to identify key issues and opportunities for city action to strengthen our downtown over the long timeline. So that's my motion. Okay, so we have a motion by Council Member second. Uh, second by Council Member um, Myers. So we'll go ahead and vote to accept the substitute motion at this time. All, all for clarification, in order to vote on this one, I, I would like to understand, I understand the intent and I am fully supportive of the idea. Um, and the concept, I'm wondering about what we mean by a short, by short term task force when might we see, when When are you envisioning these study sessions being rolled out? Um, are we talking about 
the next, you know, the four budget hearings for the fall. I mean, it would just be helpful for me to know before I vote either way. Okay, you know, Councilmember Matthews. May I answer? Yeah. Um, and then Vice Mayor, come here. This is a huge deal. And I think we haven't really taken a big view of our downtown in a long, long time. Um, you know, when the Great Recession hit, it was everything that we could do to just scrabble together and recover from that. And, um, you know, that's largely been achieved, uh, we can say. Um, but we, we face so much change. So I see this uh, mayor appointing a um, task force of three to work with staff. You know, they are they are putting so much effort now into the housing and homeless issues. I think we have to be realistic about the demands, but I'd like to get some good thought from planning and- I'm gonna go ahead and pause for yeah. just a second, looking at the city attorney. Um, I was just gonna say that for for the sake of consistency, yeah. um, I, I previously advised that the council can't take action tonight, mm -hmm. um, but it can agendize a topic for a future discussion. I think council member Matthews um, motion could be framed uh, to bring back an agenda yes. item yeah. uh, at, a, at an upcoming meeting to establish a subcommittee for, um, okay. along the lines that was proposed. Okay. 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 So we'll go ahead. I'll make that my substitute motion. And just in answer to your question, it's a big issue. It will take some time, but I can see a task force meeting with staff um, coming up with a program mm. for study sessions and outreach. And I see this as something that would occupy the better part of the year, frankly. But my God, it's the future of downtown. It's like we took a year for the housing project. You, you don't do this in a couple of quick meetings and get good results out. So that's okay. what I would see. It's a major effort for the bulk of the year. And there's and there's a lot um, for us to do. Right. And so I um, will now acknowledge Vice Mayor. I just want to make a comment on both items that have been proposed. And I, I share the similar sen sentiments of Council Member Brown that I'm interested in both of these issues. Um, I have been hearing um, oftentimes at these meetings that there are a lot of things on our agenda that we need to we need to put forward and prioritize and that there's a calendar at which we need to um, start we need to set forward and, and prioritize what we want to do over the next course of the year and I think that num a number of us on the council have been waiting for that opportunity to occur so that we can actually begin to see where these different items falling out so we can plan for those. And as a result of not seeing that calendar, um, these types of actions have been taking, have been occurring where we've been um, having numerous long meetings on particular items and not really seeing the scope of, you know, what are all the issues that we need to deal with and what priority do they need to come in. And so my preference would be to not support either of these two motions that have been made and instead, um, would like to hopefully see us have this planning session um, because it's now almost the end of March. And if we want to be able to put these plans in play before the summer hits, I think that um, it'd be good to have a session where we could prioritize um, what we want to get done. So. Okay, well, there's, um just in response to that, I'll just briefly say is that it's been um, uh, my job to do the best I can to manage the agendas given the uh, turnaround and council direction. And what we found is very um, frequent requests for immediate turnaround, which makes it difficult to allow that time. And so given that we've had the 13 hour meetings, we really haven't had that opportunity to um, have that strategic planning. And I'm very interested in doing that. I think this really is encompassing that this conversation is. And so I too, would be supportive of moving in that direction. I think um, there will be a series of study sessions coming up and there'll be a series of presentations coming up um, in an effort to uh, better understand the complexities of the issues impacting our city as well as to help us re uh, come together as a council to look for a movement going forward. So I think we can at that time have a process that's gonna allow for um, the council to weigh in and direction and, and then in timeline expectations. So I am um, supportive of um, the concept and I would also like to prefer that we move forward in a more holistic approach in, um, at this time. Council I know that uh, you oh. were intending a while back to have a longer strategy what retreat workshop whatever is that on our it's on the radar we have a meeting set to, to plan that a date or not a date for everybody but a meeting for us to plan that at this time to establish a date and move forward with okay. the sooner rather than later sooner very much sooner than rather than later yeah. 
Um, I just want to make a couple of comments too. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is, um, I guess I'm starting to find myself to be a little bit frustrated. Um, number one, at the late hour that we have these substantive comments and discussions. Um, I'm seeing a sort of pretty obvious playbook of sort of rollbacks and um, I, uh, so I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, and um, we talk a lot about building housing for people. I keep hearing the word housing. Every time I'm in this room, I hear housing. And I think this is the most important place, this downtown and this vision that we can build. And to say we can, you know, work with a, an entity, which is a private entity that we don't know what their plans are, um, and call that done as our housing for downtown is just a missed opportunity because frankly, there, there is many opportunities downtown, but if we are laser focused on trying to avoid something in one site to do something in another, I think we're missing an opportunity and we're not gonna end up with the housing we need to provide for a lot of the people with that were here this evening earlier talking to us about various issues. So um, I have uh, a great interest in looking at what council member Matthews outlined. Um, this, th the downtown decisions we make in the next two to three years are gonna be what impacts this community for the next 10 to 20 years. And uh, it's, I understand we need to be, have our priorities set as a council, but we also have to stop rolling back. We have to stop rolling back everything that's been done um, in the last year, year. And I'm feeling like that's kind of what underlies a lot of this uh, pressure is that, you know, there's a certain list and that list has got to get done before we talk about anything else. And I'm just gonna put that out there and I hope that we can come together and try to, to uh, facilitate a conversation with our community, bring in experts, and actually have um, a process around discussing our downtown and the future uh, for it. Thanks. Okay. So before we go too off, we'll go ahead and, and check in. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I just see you over there and I'm slightly concerned. Uh, I'm, I think it's getting a little bit late for me too. Okay. Um, my understanding is that there is a substitute motion and a second. Right. The council will have to vote on whether to accept the substitute, substitute motion, motion, after which if it is accepted, then you can vote on the substitute motion. If not, you go back to the main motion. Okay, Council Member Glover, and then we'll go ahead and move up on the motion. Yeah, it was just on some of the things that Council Member Myers just said. Um, uh, I'm confused because the timeline, the, the reason why I was supporting this motion that was originally put forward by Council Member Crone is because it sets a time specific thing where we can begin talking about them. I don't know if there's any action that pertained to any of them. I think it was to discuss the issues. So there's no action associated with it. It could be another opportunity for us to talk about them. Uh, secondly, the motions in, in themselves include conversations about affordable housing. So I'm a little confused as uh, there being a seeming a complaint that we're not talking about affordable housing, but one of the motions is to look at partnering to, for the development of affordable housing in the downtown area. And I'm also concerned by the statement or the assertion that there is some conspiracy to roll back all of the things that were done previously, because these are we're getting new information from new sources that weren't presented before, and it makes it so that we can have a conversation about the things. And as Count, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings mentioned, we have not seen any form of any kind of schedule regarding anything that we can expect to see on any upcoming agendas. It's a total blank canvas that we have to guess on every week when it comes out on a Friday. So if we want to transition into a place of co-working, into a place of a feeling of mutual trust and belief that the things that we put forward will actually get onto an agenda, then I think that we need to A, prioritize that meeting, which is good to know that you're having a meeting to schedule when that meeting will happen. But I, I feel that, that even that process has been very, um, a very muddy transparency to be under understand what's going on. Um, and 
uh, I think that we should move as expeditiously as possible in figuring out ways that we can reallocate money that is proposed for something. If we can turn that into affordable housing and transition it away from parking, then we should be moving on that conversation as quickly as possible, just as we're moving quickly on addressing the issue of homelessness, because they're all connected. Anyway, thank you. I'll go ahead and just add that you, I would welcome, uh, as mayor who sets the agenda, any conversation with the council members or a review of the process in terms of agenda setting at a future time, because um, there is a, a process that we have in our handbook in terms of how that flows. So at this point, we'll go ahead and uh, vote on the substitute motion and, um, and then return to the original motion if, if folks are still in favor of that. Okay, so all those in favor of the substitute motion, please say aye. Nay. Aye. Oops. Okay. Aye. 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 All those that, uh, in favor of the substitute motion, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, and those opposed, say no. No. Aye. No. So that fails with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Crone and Councilmember Glover uh, and myself voting against, and Councilmember uh, Councilmember um, Myers and Councilmember Matthews voting in favor. Okay, and so we'll now return to the original motion, uh, Councilmember uh, Crump. Yeah, um, the hour is late, it's true, and I don't feel like I'm totally on my game, but um, I don't think, uh, Martin Bernal, there has been a month that has gone by when I did not discuss a library, the separation, or the, the, that we, the fact that we don't need a garage and we wanted to separate the library from the garage, and you and I have gone back and forth, back and forth, for over the last two years and five months. So, and I would um, ask other council members, what exact information do we need to have something on the agenda that has to do with the library garage, and do we want to revisit the um, September 11th, 2018 motion that was made by a previous council and we know that the past election was about this issue. How can we, what information do we need to go, okay, let's separate those two and have discussions about each one separately? I'm, I'm assuming that this is not the time to have that discussion. I assume that Council Member Crone was framing the motion that he had made previously. I believe this is in response to my comment about needing more information, but. but. What information, just so we know, so it's out there. I don't know that I, that's something that we probably can't discuss. Is that correct? I don't know. I, I mean, I can, I can start making a list. You can't have a have substantive discussion, discussion about, about an item this evening. So then it doesn't seem so, to feel So you could, you could, however, direct <laughs> that it be agendized for a, a, a subsequent meeting. I, understanding of council member brown's comment was that um she didn't believe setting a hard date on the on the hearing that there was enough information to to support that aspect of the motion so was looking for more flexibility with regard to the scheduling uh, that was my understanding of the tenor of council member brown's comment okay so there's a motion um by council member crone um, a second by Councilmember Glover to return at a specific date. Would would 90 days be acceptable on bringing the, these back within the next 90 days? Honestly, my preference would be that we have this conversation in the context of our goal setting mm -hmm. meeting that we have yet to have. That, and I'm not sure why that is the case. But I'm not a, I'm not asking that question. I'm, I'm just not sure why. Just put it out there. Um, don't no need for explanation about it. But I'd really like to have that conversation in the context of our priority setting, and I wish that could happen like yesterday, but here we are. So that would be my, okay, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you please stop. Can we get an idea of when the goal, I'm sorry. And I'll just, I'll just say that the, the say re that you can you're leave. playing politics with our lives. You can go ahead and leave now. I am leaving. Okay. This is have a good night. They are just trying to do the city's business, Martine. Okay. And Cynthia. Stop we can go ahead. We can have somebody escort. I don't know where our, our sergeant of arms is, but. This is an outrage. Okay, you you can go ahead and leave now, and I'll, I, I'm, I'm not sure where our sergeant Let of arms is. Let us have an agenda. Let we'll us go ahead have and pause the business done. Okay, we'll go ahead and pause the meeting. Until you are lying, you people up there. Cynthia, Okay, we're going to go ahead and pause the meeting then.
And we don't have our sergeant of arms here, I guess, to escort this person out. Okay. So, so at this point, um, I, I'll just briefly say one of the things that um, um, has been uh, difficult for me as mayor is having the uh, time to actually plan that out. And because I, I can speak, I think, from what I've heard from our staff, that majority of the time has been spent bringing us to this place in terms of the work we've been doing on homelessness. So the capacity just really hasn't been there. Um, and um, not for lack of interest, I'd say. So um, given that, um, that would be my, my preference, uh, clearly, to move forward in this direction of um, a thoughtful planning process where I think we as a council can hopefully um, find our highest common denominator um, as we decide to move forward with a, a number of different issues. But that's not the uh, motion on the floor. The motion on the floor is, is something else. Um, I, I think I'll withdraw it, but can we get any indication of when our goal setting session might be, but what, what month? So as soon, soon, as soon as we can get that scheduled right. and with so, the con a so typically, consultant. So typically, whenever we have, uh, well, we have a work plan that uh, we do every two years and actually it expires. So we're actually due for, and we review it every year, we're due for a review of strategic planning and a new work plan and priority setting. And typically with the new council too, we, we do in the team building sessions and do we do strategic planning sessions. Um, and this time around, as the mayor stated, we just have not had the opportunity to do it because it's all been other issues that we've been consumed. It's typically people in my office who do the work. We started some of that work. We had some initial discussions with the mayor and vice mayor uh, with uh, some uh, options on how to do it. Look, we reviewed some consultants, some various approaches. We've had some discussions, but have had to essentially abandon that because we, we've had other priorities. And, I, and I've heard that from council members. We, you know, we've done a lot of preliminary work with respect to the schedule, with respect to items, um, but we need to sit down, uh, and, and typically it's with the mayor and vice mayor to plan out those sessions. Um, so we've been talking about scheduling the time to do that. So I think the, the process would be to schedule a meeting with the mayor and vice mayor who could then work to plan out a process that can then be brought forward to the council, uh, and the council can then you know, bless the approach uh, and then move forward from that. Um, so I, I think we're trying to schedule a meeting here soon and we can try to bring something back in terms of process, certainly in the next few meetings. Uh, right, and we've, yeah, okay. Okay, so is it with, the motion has been withdrawn? Yes. Okay, all right, we'll then go ahead and adjourn the meeting at this time. <laughs> Good job, everyone.